It was raining. The raindrops were falling on the man lying in blood. The guy was on his knees holding his sword, and there were a bunch of dead people lying around him. He was on his knees, leaning on his sword. His clothes were torn, a little bloody, and he looked exhausted. There were a lot of people lying on the floor, covered in blood and with swords stuck in their bellies. There were a lot of them. That guy on his knees was paying attention to something. He stood in his torn clothes and looked at all those dead people and thought about how many people were dead. Abruptly the guy was disturbed by something, he thought he had been too careless. Then he turned around. Someone said, who would have thought that such a strong man would be found here? The guy told him he was a bastard and asked how he wasn't dead yet. The guy was standing on some big white man with wings and horns. It was the giant Agaet. Twenty days ago he suddenly appeared in the empire. He looked like some kind of god. Agaeth had started wreaking havoc for unknown reasons. He was the last of three such giants. The guy stepped his foot harder. He put his sword to the giant's face. The giant's face was so big that his sword was the size of his face. The guy leaned closer to Agaeth and said that because of the giant half of the empire turned into a graveyard and aggressively asked why the hell he was still alive. The giant told the guy that he didn't have to worry because he didn't have long to live and would be back on his side soon. The guy said that's good because his dead buddies are probably waiting for him. The giant asked about his friends. The guy said he meant the ones that came with him. One of those friends was roasted to a crisp by a fiery, fiery, red dragon and the other was sealed for eternity by an old man named Lorhan. The guy asked the giant if he realized he was a bastard. The giant told him not to try to hide the truth behind superficial words, strong man, for the children of the stars share their feelings. Agaet also said that they knew that they took their enemies with them to the other world, but the giant's words didn't make this guy very happy. And the giant also added that it meant that there were no strong people like this guy left. This made the guy a little angry. He told Agaeth that he was still alive and told him not to talk nonsense. The giant had a sword on his face. The giant said the guy can stop pretending and he knows he doesn't have much left. The guy's foot continued to be on the giant's nose. Agaet said that he was very glad that he didn't have much left, because if he had realized his strength earlier, he would have started honing it. In that case he would have been able to become a huge obstacle in the way of their cherished wish. The guy got even angrier after his words. The guy then decided to call it a day and said that he didn't give a shit and he knew he had ruined his life without him, so he told the giant that he'd better just cower and die. The guy then took his foot off the giant's face and took his sword in his hand. Agaeth said this guy is a great man so he has a right to be proud. He clutched his weapon in his hand as the giant spoke. Agaeth said that his world had changed after all. He ended his speech by saying that soon he would be swallowed up by the starlight and he would dissolve into it. While Agaeth was saying all this, a guy jumped up and came at the giant. Then Agaeth's head was chopped off by this guy and the giant's head rolled somewhere. The guy stood with his back to the giant's head. The guy felt relieved. Rain dripped on the puddle of blood and he wondered how he should do what had already been done. Then he stepped into that puddle. He began to cough. Then he looked into the distance. And the guy started to remember something. He was sitting on a rock and there was a bunch of some men around him. This guy's face wasn't particularly happy. He looked at one of them. This guy with a scar near his eye looked at him too. Then they all started laughing from something. The guy with the scar was lying there covered in blood. He asked if everyone was here. The one who killed the giant Agaeth stood in front of the scarred guy who was lying, covered in blood in a pile of corpses with a sword in his stomach and said he was a fool. The guy got down on one knee and asked him if it was because of his pride that he fought literally to the death and added a question about whether the guy thought he was strong just because he was strong. The guy wiped his face from the water in tears and said that he should have assessed the situation correctly and just run away. His eyes were already closing and he said that they were fools and remained so until the end. Sitting next to the already dead scarred guy, he wondered why giants who could reflect the sword aura of the strongest swordsman in the empire could only be struck by his sword. He said that if it wasn't for that, the ordinary soldiers wouldn't have had to stand on the front lines and they all wouldn't have died in the beginning. After saying that, he looked at the floor. Then he sat down completely on the floor, put his hands and head down, and thought about it. He heard some voice, and asked if there was anyone here. The boy paid attention to it. The voice said that because of his wounds he couldn't move. The guy wondered about this voice. The guy was very surprised. The voice called out for someone to help. The guy leaned on his sword and stood up. He was very happy that the man was still alive. He was walking towards him through all the pain. The boy walked without giving up. Near the stone stood some girl to whom he had come. The guy looked at him with surprise, but pleasant surprise, and was glad that he was able to survive.
It turned out to be their commander-in-chief. But she didn't have an arm. Her name was Adeshan. The guy turned to her and said that for a commander-in-chief she didn't look very good. The girl turned to the guy. His name was Ronan. She asked if he was a corporal and said that he didn't look very good himself. But then in a sterner voice she said that the more important thing for them now is the giant Agayant. Adeshan asked if he was dead. Ronan replied that he had killed him and his body was lying nearby. She was a bit surprised by this news. You could see it in her expression. Adeshan looked at him and replied saying that it was clear to her. The girl thought for a while and repeated the phrase that Agayat was dead. Looking away she thanked Ronan for that. He just stared at her in silence. Ronan remembered something and said that since she was thanking him, would she like to hear his request and Adeshan interjected? Ronan sitting beside her said that he was concerned about the affairs of the fallen soldiers. He said that usually they are abandoned on the battlefield or burned but Ronan said that he would like to ask for normal treatment of the soldiers. Adeshan looked at him and said that he looked much more alive than her and so she asked why doesn't he take care of it. Ronan started coughing and says he can't. The guy showed his bloody palm and said it's not clear yet which one is more alive. And looking at his hand said that he can die any minute. While Adeshan was silent the guy told that most of his life he was just suffering. Bullshit so he didn't have much time to do and so it doesn't seem fair to him to die like this. The girl asked about what he would want to do if he survived. Ronan smiled and told her that he was willing to do a lot of things. He looked up at the sky and said that there was only one thing on his mind right now. He then looked at her and said that he would like to know what it was like to go to the academy. Adeshan interjected about the academy. Ronan remembered standing on Agayatha's head and their conversation. He said he was hurt by the stupid giant's words. Ronan thought about the girl. Ronan said that actually his sister always wanted to send him to study in the academy. Also Ronan said that he will be reunited with his family soon. Adeshan abruptly said that the search party will arrive as soon as the rain ends. Ronan started to press pity and said that he is already a dead man and asked why she continues. Looking down at the floor, he added that why did she keep talking about useless things? The rain didn't stop. A raindrop fell down. It fell to the floor. Ronan was surprised. And so was Adeshan. The rain and the whole storm suddenly stopped. They both looked around in surprise. Ronan put his hand on the floor. But he immediately took it away as both he and the commander-in-chief were very much scared. Ronan looked to the side. He looked in surprise at what had appeared. The creature was not like a human. It was like some kind of demon with many wings. It flew towards them with outstretched arms and it seemed to be called eight wings. But it seems he wasn't alone. There were so many of them that they filled the entire sky. Adeshan sat on the floor and Ronan stood beside her. He couldn't understand who they were or where they had come from. Adeshan couldn't believe that those three giants were not the end. The frustrated commander-in-chief said that she couldn't save the world in the end. For the third time, Adeshan only had one shot left, but she didn't know what to do. She was so immersed in her thoughts that she almost didn't hear her name being called. It wasn't until Ronan had already shouted loudly to the commander-in-chief that she heard. He was angry enough. He started asking Adeshan to telekinesis her to them since he couldn't get them from here. The girl was scared and surprised. Ronan asked if she was going to fight them. After all, he doesn't want to just sit idly by. He started pulling out his sword and said that even if he dies. He punched the air and said loudly that he would take a couple of those freaks with him. The commander-in-chief was very surprised that he wouldn't give up even in this position. As she watched the battle-minded one she thought about how he really was, because he was the only reason they were able to get this far. Ronan stood in front of Adeshan protecting her. Drops of water were dripping off her. She called out to Corporal Ronan. He asked what was wrong. She said there was no time so they better stop talking. And after saying that, she just took him and kissed him. Ronan looked at her with bulging eyes and didn't understand why that was so. Then through her mouth she handed him some kind of blue balloon. He immediately pulled away and asked what she put in his mouth. Adeshan moved closer to his ear and whispered something. The girl's words alerted Ronan so he asked again and she repeated what she said once more. The girl leaning on Ronan barely stood. The guy started yelling at her and asking her how she could even talk such nonsense in such a situation. She said his name again. Already with a small smile, she started to say that if they ever met again, he would have to tell her. She asked him to tell her then, not to do anything stupid and just be a dressmaker. Ronan still had those flying giants behind his back. The guy looked at Adeshan with surprise but he listened to her intently. Adeshan said she had done a lot of things. But this was the first time she had done something like this. Ronan then turned his attention to something. In the hand of one of the giants some sort of ball began to form. 
and from behind Ronan there was some sort of explosion. A huge blue ball began to explode, and then falling from the sky. Ronan didn't realize what was happening. It was a nice sunny day. The sun was shining brightly. Everything was perfect green. But at one point someone started calling for the commander-in-chief. The guy sitting on the ground kept yelling. And it happened many, many times. On this perfectly clean grass was some town or village. Someone wondered what it was and called it impossible. There were children playing near the river and riding on a raft. This someone said it was impossible. He rested his hand on the grass. The boy sighed. It turned out to be Ronan. He was sitting on the grass in his normal clothes and said it's not really. True he was in his hometown of Nebutan and he had really gone back in time. It was his first day of regression. He sat near a tree with his hands on his head. He had no idea that the commander-in-chief's words were true. Ronan remembered their kiss. Then he remembered her passing the orb over his mouth. When he asked her why she did it, Adeshan said it was an orb of going back in time. Looking at Ronan, she said that because of this orb, she went from being a simple dressmaker to the position of commander-in-chief. Introducing Adeshan as the commander-in-chief and the dressmaker, she said that the orb only allowed her to go back four times and the commander-in-chief had already used three of them, so Ronan had only one attempt. Adeshan said she was leaving it up to him. She also added that the guy has the power to kill giants, so she believes Ronan is the key to saving the world. Adeshan moved closer to his ear and said that the guy needed to hone his ability and she was very happy that he wanted to do it himself. Ronan at that moment was babbling about nothing and how he wanted to go to the academy and there it was. Adeshan told him that if you want to study then he should go to Phil Leon Academy. Ronan looked at her with great surprise but listened to her carefully. She wanted to add something more. Adeshan said that if they ever meet again, she better tell her not to do anything stupid and just become a dressmaker. Ronan still had those giants behind her back. Adeshan said she had done a lot of things but this was her first time. Ronan grabbed his head and tensed up. He started banging his head against the wall hoping it was a dream and saying he needed to wake up faster. There were some two men watching this marvelous scene. Everything was peaceful and quiet in the town. Ronan said that even if it wasn't a dream and he really had gone back in time, he didn't know what he was supposed to do here alone. Holding on to a tree, he wondered if it was the past. He took something in his hand stood against the tree, then stepped with his foot and thought that if this was the past, then he might know what would happen in the future. Taking the stick in his hand he ran somewhere and said that then he could meet his elder sister. With this stick in his hand he ran into town, the town was full of people Ronan tried to run through. The guy kept running and thinking that since he was back in the past, he should go a little further. But then something distracted him and he looked that way. Ronan was looking at some kids standing near a tree and he thought it was the scum. They weren't just standing there. There was a boy hanging upside down from the tree. The kid was screaming and trying to get out and those guys were enjoying themselves. Ronan couldn't understand why the hell they had hung that kid from the tree. Ronan looked at them and thought about how they were just as ugly as he remembered them to be. Then Ronan noticed how they hung him, because they didn't hang him with rope. It was magic. Magic because this child's leg wasn't tied to anything and the boy just seemed to float in the air. Ronan knew that mages were very valuable on the battlefield, but they were very rare to find, but he didn't know there were any in this backwater. But if he thought so, it was around this time. That little, red-haired boy was here. You could see in that boy's eyes that he was a little scared because he was worried about that kid. He was thinking about when those guys were going to stop bullying that kid and if this continued, something bad was going to happen to him. The boy was still just as cheerful, he was begging those guys for mercy. He tried to convince them that he really didn't have any money, but they were silent. One of those guys touched his face. The boy said in a shaky voice that his mother's medicine had gotten more expensive this month, but those guys didn't care at all according to them. One of them said he was just ripping him off and asked why he should even care about his mom's health. Then he swung around and said that if he wanted to be a decent son, then he should earn money. And he hit him hard on the cheek. The friends of the guy who hit him were watching this with some clubs in their hands. The guy added that he should earn more money. Then he turned to the guy with magic who was using his powers at that moment. He told him that this bastard and pointed to that kid hanging on the tree wasn't coming around, so he asked him to raise him even higher. The kid replied that he couldn't because if he lifted him higher he might accidentally drop him. The kid replied to him that he was a girl to be so goggle-eyed and added that he wasn't the one hanging. So this guy asked Assel to shut his mouth and raise it higher. This he said in a more convincing tone. Assel was still looking at them with the same frightened face. The guy added that if he didn't do it, they would hang him next to him themselves. He was very worried. 
Hassel couldn't understand how it had come to this at all and started to think about the fact that learning magic was a bad choice. Hassel just wanted to show that he could do something good. He showed his magic in the city in front of the public. He thought about turning him down but something was stopping him. Hassel was very scared. He was so scared he let out a tear. Biting his lip he told himself no. He saw fit to overcome this fear. Standing behind the subject of the guys he began to speak. He swung around and asked them to stop. But suddenly Ronan came up and knocked him on the head telling him that he would kill him. Azil was distracted for a second. And that boy hanging from the tree fell. The main one of those guys got mad. He asked him what he was even doing. He started yelling at him and yelling at him. He started asking if he decided to stop just because some guy told him to. Azil started making excuses and saying he didn't do it on purpose and all that. Ronan called Asil over and told him to knock it off. Putting his stick on his shoulder Ronan said he better talk to him. Asil turned around and was very surprised to see Ronan here. He said he had something to talk to him about. And somewhere in the background that guy was calling him a bastard and calling him over. Ronan asked the kid where he'd learned telekinesis. Asil said he'd learned it from a grimoire he'd bought from some merchant. Amidst all the continued indignation from the guy, Ronan wondered how he was able to learn so much from some simple Deshayan grimoire. This was all very surprising to Ronan so he wanted to see what else he could do. Ronan remembered those giants. Someone started pulling out a sword. Ronan paid attention to that sound. That formidable guy drew his sword and stood up in a stance. He was very angry because the one dared to ignore him. He said that the one had only started lashing out because the one had succumbed to him a couple days ago. He swung and started running at Ronan with his sword. He said loudly that he would put him in his place today. When the sword was already very close to Ronan, he looked at it and thought about where the freak got it. Ronan decided to analyze the bastard a bit. His stance was poor to say the least, but he knew that he could make up for his ineptitude with his strength and that would be enough. The guy threw a punch, but Ronan immediately dodged it and thought about the fact that he would only be able to use it not against him. The guy marveled at how he was able to dodge so easily. Ronan thought about the fact that he might have a younger body, but it wasn't carved from his time in the penal corps. He was good with his combat sense. The guy stood next to him, smiled and said that he was lucky, because he wanted to beat him so that he wouldn't be able to lift a spoon for the rest of his life. And Ronan looked at him and said that he was lucky today, even though all his life he had been haunted by bad luck. The guy kept doing something with his sword, and then he told him to get on his knees and beg him for mercy, for that was the only way he would let him live. The guy said he would take one of his arms. This guy's words didn't scare Ronan at all. The guy also told him that he didn't have to worry, for even if he killed him, he would take good care of his little sister. Ronan asked him if he said anything about his sister. The guy said that when he sees her he has only one thing on his mind. He added that she has such a luscious figure and he would play with her. Ronan was very angry. He swung and made a punch. Pieces of skin and blood flew. The guy was already standing without one ear since Ronan had cut it off. The guy's ear was still falling to the floor. He dropped his sword. Then he grabbed the ear that was no longer there and started screaming loudly. His friends watched and didn't know what to do while the guy continued to scream in pain. Ronan then stepped with his foot and called out to the guy. He walked up to him and called him a freak. Ronan approached him and asked him if he wanted to die. Ronan stood next to the guy putting his stick on his head. Behind Ronan was that kid with the magic and behind the guy were his terrified friends. They were wondering how he could cut off his ear so easily. And that all with an ordinary stick. Ronan turned to his friends. They were very frightened. He asked if they liked this kind of show. He lifted his leg over this guy's head and told them now to fuck off and take this bastard with them unless they wanted to come like him. This guy was sitting down and squirming in pain. This guy was looking at the bloody stick while Ronan told them to leave both the money and this kid and leave a fee for his ruined mood. They shakily agreed. They said they would give it all back. To that kid who was hanging on the tree Ronan gave a big sack and said it was all for him. The boy was very surprised and once again asked again if it was all for him. Ronan held the boy's sword in his hands and looked at him while the boy expressed his surprise and asked a bunch of questions saying that there was much more than they had taken from him. Ronan replied that he only had the sword. The boy cried with happiness as he clutched the sack in his hands. Ronan said that these guys would not come back for him as they would be afraid to hang around so he could take it easy. The boy never stopped thanking Ronan for all of this. Ronan waved his hand and told him it was nothing and he could go home. That kid with magic decided to remind himself. Both the boy and Ronan turned to him. He said in a shaky voice that he was really sorry. Azil lowered his head in shame and apologized. He remembered Han's face and said he understood. 
Azil remembered how scared he was and said that he understood that such a thing could not be done, even under Han's threats. Azil cried and said that he was so scared that he couldn't stop himself. He started to claim that it was his fault and kept apologizing while Ronan and that boy looked at him silently. That boy said that Azil was crying as well. Looking into his crying eyes he said he was crying just like when Hans first brought him here. He said that when he saw him, he immediately thought that they were bullying him just as much as he was, and Azil listened to him in silence. Then the boy put his hand on Azil's shoulder and told him not to blame himself. He smiled and said that it wasn't his fault. He also added that he really appreciated his apology. The boy then walked away. Ronan just looked at him and Azil waved at him. Ronan turned around and looked at Asil. While the latter was waving at that boy, he smirked and thought to himself that he wasn't bad. Ronan tapped him on the shoulder and asked him if he remembered that he needed to talk to him some more. Asil got really scared and said he remembered. Ronan turned around and said that was good and then they should meet at the same place in four days. Asil couldn't understand why exactly in four days. Asil asked Ronan what he meant by that. Ronan told him that he was busy now so they should postpone the conversation for a while. He also added that they would meet when the moon rises. Ronan said that if he didn't come, he thought he knew what would happen to him. Asil immediately pictured Ronan pulling his sword out of its sheath and was scared. Ronan said he was going and that if Azil was late he was screwed. Azil watched in silence as he left. Azil stood there in shock. Ronan came to some house. He stood right in front of the door. You could see his shadow. Ronan stood with the flowers and wondered if it was too much. He was a little embarrassed. Ronan thought about how he remembered how his little sister loved flowers and how he had picked everything he saw. Then he turned around and said it was too much so he saw fit to just throw it out. But someone saw him. Someone came out of the house and she stood on the threshold and said she was thinking, wondering who it was here. It was a beautiful girl. She called out to Ronan. Ronan turned around. The girl asked if he was back. Ronan thought that when he was in the penal core, he often thought about what to say to her when he met her, whether he should apologize for leaving her without saying a word or just say that he missed her. And standing in the rain and looking at his hand, he thought that he was always thinking about what to say to her, but all those were just words that only Ronan from the penal core could say. He compared himself now and in the penal core. Ronan thought there was only one thing he could say to her now. The girl with her arms outstretched was walking towards him and telling him that he was early today somehow. Ronan shivered in embarrassment. He stood with his head down and flowers in his hand across from her and said that yes, he was home. There was plenty of homemade and surely delicious food on the table. The girl said she never thought the day would come. Holding these lovely flowers in her hands she said she never thought the day would come when her stale little brother would give her flowers. It seems his older sister Iral was very happy about such a gift. They sat down at the table. The girl said she was very happy. Ronan replied that he was glad she liked it. Iril started to offer her cute little brother some more or something roast. Ronan thanked her and said he was already full. Ronan said he wanted to ask how old she was this year. Iril told Ronan that she was 22 and asked him why the sudden question. The guy replied that he had just forgotten. Iril said he was stunned and said something like that can't be forgotten. Then she got up from her chair and started asking Ronan if he had a cold or headache. He thought about the fact that she was already 22 which meant it would be about 10 years before those bastards, I mean giants, arrived. Iril put her hand to his head. She held his head and said that he didn't seem to have a fever. Ronan didn't pay much attention to that. He was thinking that his sister hadn't changed much because she was still the same as he remembered her. He stared at her for a moment thinking about how bright, kind and warm she was. Iril kept asking if he was alright. He wanted this moment to last literally forever. Ronan took her hand and thought about the fact that in 10 years he had to protect the world and his sister. He put her hand on his shoulder and said he wanted to tell her something. Iril said she was listening to him. Ronan smiled and said he was thinking of going to the academy. She was a little wary and asked again about the academy. Her eyes glazed over and she clenched her hand into a fist and asked if it was true. She held his hand tightly. Tears were flowing from her happiness. Iril asked him to repeat it to her so that she would believe that she had not heard it. Ronan looked at her in surprise. He said that she had definitely not heard it. Iril said that he had never even heard her when she brought it up. She then abruptly went somewhere and said that for that matter. She started going through things and said that she knew this day would come and he's a smart boy so she was sure he would do well. Ronan thanked Iril for those words. She then pulled out some sort of huge cauldron. They both looked into it and Ronan asked what it was and Iril said it was a present for him. There was a lot of money in that cauldron. Ronan asked how she got so much money and Iril said that she was secretly saving it to surprise him later. 
Iril said that she really wanted to be able to pay his tuition if he was thinking about the academy. Ronan looked at it all with a smile. He said that was just unbelievable and asked when she had managed to save so much. Ronan stood and said that this money was not enough for him anyway. However, he was really grateful to her but asked her to keep it for herself. Iril asked what he meant. The girl got up from the floor and said that there was more than meets the eye and said that she didn't know what academy he wanted to go to. But Ronan interrupted her and said that he wanted to go to the Emperor's school, Philian Academy. She didn't realize it at first. Then once she realized, she was so shocked that she screamed all over the street. The Philian Academy Imperial School was very large and beautiful. It was the best leading school in the empire. Thanks to the continent's best teachers and the huge funding from the Imperial family itself. This place provided the best education. Philion Academy was so prestigious that it was nicknamed the Hero Factory. Its status was incredibly high. People like Commander-in-Chief Adeshan, Sword Master Shulafen, Worst of Bandits, Winter Witch and others were listed there. Ronan thought about how Philion students had performed very well during the war. They were so useful that he could understand why the Commander-in-Chief had recommended this particular academy to him. Ronan walked through the forest already with his packed items in his backpack and thought about the fact that the problem was its popularity, not to mention the exorbitant tuition and high standards. Ronan remembered his sister and thought of her reaction. She wished him nothing but good luck and believed in him. Ronan paused. He said he would prove things to her indeed. He went to the place where he cut off Hansa's ear. Azil was already standing there waiting for him. Ronan said he didn't expect him to come. Ronan called him Muscle. The scared kid corrected Ronan and said his name was not Muscle but Asil. Azil lowered his head and said that Ronan himself had said he wouldn't leave him alone if he didn't come. In response Ronan smiled and said they'd better forget it. Ronan took hold of his backpack and said that they still had a lot of things to do but he wanted to test it first. Ronan threw his backpack off his shoulders. Azil interjected about testing it. Asil asked what he was even talking about. Ronan had already started kneading his fingers. He said it was and there was nothing wrong with it. Ronan told the kid to use his telekinesis on him and pointed his finger at himself. He asked Asil to lift it as high as he could. Asil was excited. He asked how he would use his telekinesis so suddenly. Waving his arms around he asked why do something so dangerous. Ronan replied that it wasn't that dangerous and told him to just do what he tells him. Ronan said he wouldn't die from it so Azil might not be scared, in which case Azil agreed. Azil started to do something with his hands. He directed the power of his ethereal hand at Ronan. Ronan tensed up. Asil lifted him off the ground. Ronan was surprised because he didn't expect him to be able to lift him. The kid lifted him higher and higher as Ronan cheered. He thought about how the height and stability was certainly lame, but overall it was very similar to how he felt when he was being lifted up to the giant. Then he had been held by some girls. Ronan thought about the fact that it was telekinesis that allowed him to fight Agaeth on equal terms. Ronan remembered swinging at Agaeth. As he floated in the air he smiled and thought about how telekinesis was a very rare ability in mages, not to mention the fact that mages themselves were extremely rare. Ronan looked at Aesil and thought about the fact that Aesil would be a major part of his battle with Agaeth. Four starters. Ronan thought that was pretty good. Aesil was already holding Ronan through the force saying that he was already getting difficult. Asil asked if he could let him go. Ronan took up his sword and asked him to hold on a little longer as he wanted to check something else. He said he would go down by himself. Asil was very surprised because he didn't understand how he would do it. Ronan drew his sword. He swung and struck the air. Azil watched and didn't realize what was happening. Ronan had just just taken and slashed Asil's mana landing on the floor and he couldn't understand how he did it. A surprised Azil asked how Ronan did it. Ronan replied that he didn't do anything like that and it was just a trick he learned a long time ago. Asil asked what kind of acrobatic trick it was. After all he had never seen anyone cut mana. Ronan rubbed his head and told him that he should score because he himself did not know how he could do it. Ronan put down his sword and thought about the fact that figuring out what this ability was was one of his biggest challenges. Looking into the reflection of the sword he saw Agaeth there and thought about what he thought. That it was because of him that his sword worked for him. Ronan turned back to his things and thought that he would think about it later. There were more important things to do right now. Ronan picked up his backpack and told Asil that he had passed the test anyway. He tossed Asil his other backpack and told him to follow him, because they still had some things to do before the moon disappeared. Asil asked how they would do it this late at night. Ronan said he didn't know yet. He smiled and said it could be his first page of Ronan's biography. Ronan said it would be the greatest history book of the empire. The moon was shining bright enough. Asil was walking with Ronan's backpack on his shoulders and they were discussing Phil Leon Academy. 
Asil asked if he had heard about the academy and asked if they were going to a place where only the elite of the empire studied. Ronan told him that he had heard correctly and asked why he was asking him why he was asking him again as it annoyed him. Azil was very surprised. Azil moved closer to Ronan. Ronan asked if he even wanted to go there. Azil said yes of course. Asil got embarrassed and said that Ronan has talent in martial arts and he has none at all. He also added that he was cowardly and shy. Ronan turned to the kid and asked if he wanted to continue living like that. Azil tensed up. Ronan said that he had a natural talent and he was wasting it just amusing some scum and asked if Azil really wanted to live like that. Ronan folded his arms and said that honestly Azil has a bunch of retarded sides, because he's cowardly and shy. He also said that Azil is a crybaby, ready to burst into tears over any little thing, and a loser on top of that, and he was talking about little Azil. Then Ronan said that it's all okay because it can all be fixed now. But he added that he can't change the past. Ronan said that one day Azil would regret that past, and thought that he would do it just like himself. He remembered standing among the pile of corpses. Then Ronan put his hand on his shoulder and asked him if he had changed his mind, and Azil turned to him in a trembling voice. Asil looked at Ronan with his sweet eyes. He covered his mouth with his hands and was surprised that Ronan was worried about someone like him. Ronan said he wouldn't force him to do anything because it was his life. Ronan told Asil that he could come back if he wanted to. Ronan turned around and said he went. Asil immediately asked him to stop and said he wanted to change. And said he would go to Philly on with him so he asked to teach him everything he needed to do that. Ronan got a small smile on his face. Ronan agreed and said this is the first time Azil is acting manly. He also said they need to deal with the first obstacle to manly Azil. Azil agreed confidently. A smile appeared on Ronan's face and he thought about this kid getting caught. A fire was burning. Asil turned his attention to it. Azil and Ronan were hiding behind the bushes near this fire. Azil asked if this was his first obstacle. Ronan said it was. Ronan said the best opponent to show skills is a moon goblin. He was sitting near this campfire and he looked bad to say the least. Ronan said that he was also their leader and pointed to the other goblins lying around. Ronan smiled and asked how he was doing, but Azil was not really happy, rather he was very scared. Ronan asked if they would start. Ronan and Azil hid behind a bush and watched the moon goblin. Moon goblins are a type of goblin that often appear in this area. Most people distinguish them by their yellowish skin and mutilated bodies. But their real specialty was their love for gold and various treasures. They like to ambush traders and steal their valuables and then collect all the loot in one place. When they ambush them they don't spare anyone and just kill the traders. When they collect all the loot in one place they make a feast. They all stand around this pile and like prey on it. They do this on the night of a full moon, like tonight. Azil started biting his nails in fear. In a trembling voice he said that means they came here to hurt him and Ronan interrupted him. He smirked and said they would steal all their gold today. Asil said that he had never heard of goblins gathering treasure in one place and having another feast. Ronan opened his backpack. Azil asked how he knew all this. He told him that he had his sources but thought about the fact that he couldn't tell him that he had met them in his past life when he was traveling. Ronan hugged Asil and told him that anyway, all he had to do was transfer their treasure into the backpack using telekinesis and not to wake these guys up in any way. Ronan hugged him even tighter and said it was easy, and a frightened Azil said it didn't sound that easy. He asked what would happen if he made a mistake and woke them up. Ronan said that in that case things would go very badly and he had already pictured them in the hands of those goblins. Asil said that it was all too dangerous and they still needed to think it over. Ronan looked at him and said he was a coward. Ronan told Asil to listen to him carefully now. He pointed two fingers and said that to get to Phil Leon they only needed two things. The first reason was money. They need to pull the insane tuition cost. And the second reason was experience. Ronan said money was also an issue, but experience was much more important to them. Still also pointing two fingers Ronan said, Asil knows that Phil Leon is full of aristocrats who have elite training from birth. Ronan asked Asil, who was sitting on the floor with his legs tucked up, if he wanted to win them, and if he did, they only had one way. And Ronan said that way was that they needed to gain experience by risking their lives. Ronan pointed to the goblins again and said that they were the perfect opponents for this. He said that thanks to them they would get both money and experience. In other words kill two birds with one stone. Ronan asked Azil if he was right and if Azil had any better ideas. Azil said he didn't know and so Ronan immediately said it was settled then. He tapped Asil on the back, opened his backpack and said they needed to start now. It was already deep into the night. Azil was in the process of carrying these treasures to their backpack. The backpack was already almost full. There were a lot of items. Ronan had said there was only a little bit left. 
Azil carried over some gold knife as well. This was the last item, so Ronan told him to let it go. Looking into this backpack Ronan smiled and said it was excellent. He said it was the last backpack. They had stuffed several backpacks with blunt gold. Ronan rubbed Asil's head and said he told him that experience was the most important thing. Asil said, very cool that it worked out. Ronan looked at Asil with a smile and thought about how honestly he wasn't sure if they could make it work, but Asil even made it work very fast. Keeping his hand on the head of a pleased Asil, he kept saying in his head that he was better than he thought he was. He smiled wickedly and thought to himself that he had found himself a great acolyte. Ronan started going through his backpack of gold and said that since they had filled their backpacks to the brim it was time for them to leave. Asil was surprised that they were done so quickly. Ronan said they had already done everything they needed to do so they should get the hell out. Before something went wrong. Some raven flew very fast through the forest. Some guys were chasing it. They were shouting in its wake. Ronan and Azil took notice. Ronan asked what kind of sick bastards were making such a commotion in the middle of the night. One of the goblins woke up and growled a little. He looked at the already empty chest and growled. He asked what the commotion was in the middle of the night. He started yelling very loudly and furiously because all of their treasure was gone. This caused the rest of the goblins to wake up and they started screaming, calling them thieves. They all got up and started asking where the thieves were. Then they turned around. And they saw Asil and Ronan there. Asil was very scared and Ronan wasn't really scared. They stood and looked at the goblins running at them. They realized that things were very bad. Asil grabbed his head. Asil sat down on the floor. Ronan said he knew this was going to happen because everything was going too smoothly. Asil didn't know what to do. He asked Ronan if they should drop their backpacks and run. He told him that they shouldn't do that under any circumstances. Ronan started to draw his sword and asked Asil how he was going to pay the tuition and asked if he thought the money would come out of nowhere. Asil said that wasn't the point. The goblins approached them. Asil started yelling to Ronan that they were here and he hadn't even gotten his sword out yet. He thought about the fact that this sword was made of cheap steel and with such weight and strength. Ronan looked at that sword, saw his reflection in it and wondered if it would even last 15 strokes. Ronan estimated that there were about 30 of these goblins. One of the goblins had already prepared his clothes to strike. Asil shouted to Ronan. Ronan wasn't worried at all and kept thinking about the number of blows. Asil shouted for him to pay attention. He clenched the sword in his hand. Then he thought that 15 blows should be enough for him and took down several heads of those goblins at once with one blow. Ronan braced himself for the blow. Three heads flew off. Azil looked at those severed heads with high five eyes. Ronan's sword was covered in blood. He thought about what was left. 14 blows. Some crows were watching and screaming. Ronan plunged the sword into the goblin's head again. He asked if it was the last one and said it didn't turn out too bad. Asil looked at the sword in the goblin's head and thought it was just impossible. He couldn't understand what it was in the first place. Asil thought of Ronan decapitating three goblins with one blow. He also remembered the moment when Ronan was pounced upon by the crowd. A bunch of goblins were running at him alone. Ronan smiled. He slipped through all the goblins and cut off all their heads in seconds. Azil thought about how when Ronan reappeared there was nothing left of the crowd of goblins. And at the end Ronan chopped off the head of another goblin. Asil looked at this picture. Where Ronan stood calmly and behind him was a pile of corpses of those goblins. Asil thought about how he made such a spectacle. Ronan turned to Azil and asked why he was standing in a pillar. Azil apologized and said it was just that simple. Ronan interrupted him and said he didn't need to apologize and would rather just pack his things. Ronan smiled and put the sword on his shoulder and said they were going home. The moon was still shining just as brightly. They walked with their packed backpacks on their shoulders. Ronan walked and resented how tense everything was. He thought they would be able to do everything quickly and calmly, but things as usual didn't go according to plan. Asil was having a hard time. Ronan thought about the fact that his muscles were starting to ache from just a couple goblins. Ronan figured it was all because he was still growing. He stretched his arm and thought about the fact that once he got back he would need to get into his physical training. Asil asked Ronan what those screams were. Ronan told him that he didn't know. He remembered the moment when he was handing the backpack to Azil and someone told someone to stop. Ronan asked why the hell those bastards were yelling in the middle of the night and called them sick bastards. He said they would pay for the inconvenience he caused, but it wasn't that easy. Someone standing a dozen meters away from them drew an arrow. The arrow flew at them. It flew straight at Asil. He turned around when it was in his face. But Ronan caught the arrow just a centimeter away from Azil and asked what now? 
Azil only realized that it was an arrow so he was very scared. A frightened Azil asked where it came from. Ronan said that this forest was cursed and asked why there were so many sick freaks walking through it. There were two guys standing there with crossbows. Ronan asked who they were. The guys seemed to realize they were humans. Ronan standing with an arrow in his hand said they were and said they were children. One of those guys scratched the back of his head and apologized. He said he heard someone rustling and thought it was some kind of monster. From Ronan's backpack, a shiny gold piece was peeking out. One guy turned to the other and said that they had just almost killed a man, and the other guy told him it was no good. They asked with a smile if they had hurt themselves, Ronan told him to stop talking nonsense, because they weren't even trying. They were surprised, Ronan said he'd had enough of this stinking game and asked them to speak up. And in a more convincing tone he asked them who they were. The boys sighed. One of them came closer and said he forgot to introduce himself and apologized for that. He clutched something in his hand. He then pulled out a knife and swung it at Ronan saying they were Calabaro. In the reflection of Ronan's eyes you could see the bastard. Ronan grabbed his hand where the guy was holding the knife. And he stabbed him. Blood came out of the guy's mouth. Ronan said he was one of those scumbags. The other guy also pulled out a knife and was ready to attack Ronan too, calling him a bastard. This was brought to Assel's attention. He called out to Ronan and started using telekinesis. He told Ronan to be careful and used the power of his invisible hand against the other guy. He started complaining that he couldn't move. Ronan cheerfully turned to Assel. He said that was pretty good and stepped with his foot. He took the guy's knife for himself. He did the same thing he had done to those goblins. The guy looked at him questioningly. He asked who they were. But he never got an answer. He had already fallen dead beside Assel. Assel asked Ronan if he was dead, and Ronan told him that he was, because why would he spare someone who wanted to kill him? Ronan added that the guy was from Calabaro, and Assel queried the name. Ronan said poaching, kidnapping and selling people, there's no crime these bastards don't do, and he added that they're the most badass group in the empire. Then he stuck a knife in one guy's chest and said that if he hadn't killed them, they would have stripped Assel for his organs and buried the remains somewhere, and Assel found it all very creepy. One of the bodies was lying near some kind of sack. Ronan said that leaving these guys alive knowing who they were was akin to a crime. The bag was slightly open. Ronan told Azil not to make a scene and just pack up the stuff. Azil telekinesis lifted the bag. But I guess it wasn't Azil who did it because Ronan was very scared and asked why the bag was moving. Azil asked if those guys were carrying the bag. They sat down next to this sack. Azil asked if there could be a stolen animal in there. Ronan took the sack and said it was possible. He then opened the sack and said they were about to find out. Two eyes peeked out of the sack. A bird flew out of there. It flew right above them. Ronan said it was a very strange chicken. This cute chicken had blue feathers. Assel was fascinated by this bird. He said it was the first time he saw one. Ronan said it was the first time he saw one too. He paid attention to the shackles of this bird. The bird's legs were shackled. Azil was fascinated by this bird. He said it was the first time he saw one. Ronan said it was the first time he saw one too. He paid attention to something. He paid attention to the shackles of this bird. Ronan wondered if it was a Calabaro trap. These were Calabaro poaching shackles. They disrupt the prisoners' mana flow and restrict their movements. Ronan said he thought they were used on rare occasions, like when they were catching some fantasy creatures. Ronan said that maybe that bird, but he was interrupted by someone asking for an answer. Ronan and Azil became alert. Something like some kind of pentagram appeared around the bird and someone as if from the bird said that he was finally contacted. Asil was very scared that the bird was talking and immediately reached for Ronan. He held Asil and said he was an idiot and it was just bonding magic. Ronan thought about the fact that judging by the fact that they were spoken to as soon as the bird flew out of the bag, then he could probably block the mana. Ronan asked if he was the owner of the blue bird. The one sitting on the other side said he was and introduced himself. His name was Baron and he said he studied fantastic creatures at the institute. He also said he was the guardian of the bird. He said that no matter how many times he tried to contact her, he couldn't get in touch with her, and he wanted to write a report, but it seemed to be all right. Baron asked them not to take his question as rude and asked who they were. Ronan showed Asil a sign to keep quiet and said they were just passing by. He also said they got into a fight with poachers, who had stolen his bird. Then he remembered how he cut those guys up. So he thought what had happened was too bloody to tell Varen about it. Ronan said short and clear that they had saved that bird. The man standing on the other side started to marvel at everything that had happened. 
A shocked Varen said he had certainly thought about it, but for it to be like that, he said he owed them a lot. Varen said that he doesn't even know how to repay them for this. Azil appreciated his words and said that he is cute. Ronan said that all this is unnecessary and asked him to just tell him how he can get this bird back. He also added that this bird looks emaciated because of the shackles. Ronan asked if he takes them off. Will this bird be able to fly normally then? Varen said yes it should. Varen said that birds have a good instinct to return so he said if they can free her. Ronan took up his sword and said well then. He then swung his sword, thereby shattering those things on his paws. Ronan told him to fly to daddy. He smiled and told him not to make him worry so much. Shiny Ash chirped a couple more times and Ronan took notice. Shinyash turned on his butt to Ronan and Ronan asked him what it meant that he was shoving his butt in his face. Varen replied that it meant that he wanted him to pluck one feather before he flew away. He also added that it looked like she wanted to meet him again. Ronan carefully plucked out one feather. Varen said her feather would work as a compass for her. Varen asked if he had plucked it out and said when he was at the institute, have her stop by to visit him in Marpez. The bird had already flown away, following Ronan and Asil. Varen said once again that he would definitely repay everything. Ronan marveled at how damn fast that bird was. Asil asked what he had on his arm. Ronan said it was pinching his arm. They both looked at his arm. He asked what it was. A few days later, a carriage arrived. Workers were unloading everything from it. There was some valuable jeweler's stone. Some fellow was holding it, and said that everything in this jewelry was excellent and said he would give it to him for 20 gold pieces, and this fellow was the master of the Carable merchants and his name was Don Carable. He said he had a bunch of marvelous goods brought to him now and said he was very lucky today. He said he met a very valuable customer. Ronan walked with Asil and said he finally met someone savvy. Ronan said that all the other merchants had turned out to be phonies and they had worn him out. Ronan shook Don's hand and told him that he hadn't been walking around for nothing since he'd been able to meet such an honest merchant, and he told him he was glad to hear that. He asked him if he wanted anything else, and Ronan reached into his pocket and asked if he could. He pulled out some kind of ball that looked like space. Carable pulled out his lens and looked at it. Ronan said he didn't want to sell it, but to ask him to just look at it as he was just curious to see what it was. He thought about what that night, the blue bird or dream bird had left him, this egg. He held in his hand this beautiful egg that looked like space. At first Ronan thought that the bird had pooped in his hand, but that was not the case. Asil covered his nose and Ronan said that the stupid chicken had repaid his kindness with feces. He threw that egg at the wall and said it was disgusting. But the egg didn't break, it broke the wall instead. He thought about how he knew it was so damn strong. Ronan looked at that hole in the wall in surprise and couldn't figure it out. Don was looking at that egg and couldn't figure out whose egg it was. But he knew for sure that it belonged to an extremely rare kind of fantasy creature, so he thought that this treasure might be worth a lot. Don held this egg in his hand and said that this color and texture. Ronan looked at it with a smile and asked him just not to say that it was some kind of horse feces. Don scratched the back of his head and said he really didn't know what it was but he thought it was something unusual. Ronan said of course not. He took this egg in his hand and stared at it intently. Don asked if he should take it to a specialized place. Ronan put the egg in his pocket and said it looks like that's all he has left and he can't sell it without recognizing what it is. Ronan asked the merchant if he sold books about Philion. Don asked if he meant the academy. Ronan said they are going to take the entrance exam there but they don't know anything about the academy yet. While Ronan was saying all this, Azil was just standing there smiling. Don said they want to join the academy too and said it's a good coincidence. He said his little girl was going to join there too so he was sure she would definitely help them. The merchant added that she should be here soon. So she came, she asked her father what was going on here. She asked who they were. Don pointed to this girl and said that was his little girl. She was his only kin, her name is Maria. Ronan noticed her name. He thought it was her. Don told her to say hello to Ronan and Asil as they were important clients and he said he had just made a big deal with them. Maria asked if it was true. She called Ronan and Azil babe. Her father immediately stood up and told her to watch her language. Don apologized for her and said she just grew up in a merchant and that's why she's so rough on the tongue. Asil said it's okay. Azil wanted to say something to Ronan. But he had already gone to Marja. He asked if she was really Marja and the girl was a bit confused about the question. Ronan asked if her middle name was her first name son. She said yes and asked how he knew that. Ronan lowered his gaze and said she just looked a lot like someone he knew. Except Ronan asked one more question. Only he said he would ask it in her ear. He moved closer to her ear. Maria asked him what he wanted. 
Ronan asked if she had something else long down there between her legs. And this question surprised Maria very much. He moved even closer to her ear and quietly asked about his cock. She thought about what nonsense she had just heard. She wondered what must be so long between her legs. Ronan said that no matter how he looked at her it didn't look like she had one. The girl wasn't too happy about those words. Ronan asked her if this old man had another child that he didn't know about. Maria slapped Ronan across the face and told him to shut up. Ronan was very familiar with the feeling she created while slapping him with that slap. He definitely realized it was her. Ronan remembered some girl with short hair and her name is Count Marja's son. Maria's son. When the fine soldiers were in the town of Armarlin, Maria was in charge of providing for them. Ronan remembered having drinks with Maria and thought about how with his excellent work ethic and good-natured character, Maria could befriend anyone. Maria was a very impressive person. He pounded on the table. Ronan thought about the fact that however, if you mentioned the object between his legs in conversation with Maria, he would get uncommonly very angry and would start slapping everyone. He slapped Ronan first. Ronan said he didn't realize at the time. Why would he do that? Ronan lay on the rock and thought about how he wanted to ask him that the next time they met. But the opportunity was gone. The opportunity was gone because Maria was dead. Ronan looked at Maria, smiled and thought that he had found the answer to his question. He thought that Count Maria seemed to be a girl and there was nothing between her legs. Angry. Marja asked if he was amused and asked if she could hit him again. Ronan didn't say anything so Maria ran at him and swung at him. Ronan grabbed her hair and told her to calm down, and Maria screamed in pain. A bump appeared on the girl's head. Ronan told her not to get cocky just because he let her slap him once. And only because he was wrong. Marja didn't seem to like what he said. Ronan started a new sentence, but he was immediately interrupted by Maria asking what would happen to her if she slapped him twice and hit him in the chin with her head. They grabbed each other. Ronan asked her what she was doing and called her fucked up. They both yelled at each other that they were corpses. Azil and Dawn watched this with their mouths open. They ran to them and asked them to stop. A little later, Asil wondered what was wrong with these two. He looked at Maria and thought about the fact that they were the only ones fighting like they wanted to kill each other. Maria asked if they had decided to sell it. Ronan asked to see if he was okay. He said if it wasn't, he would buy something from them to replace it. Maria and Ronan then sat peacefully at the table stacking swords. Azil walked over to them and thought they had become friends. Ronan folded three swords and a magic rod. Maria asked why he had three swords and said they would be hard to carry. Ronan told her it was just in case as he had them break quite often. Ronan asked her what she thought of them. Maria said they weren't bad, but she thought the black one was the best. She put the sword in its sheath and said that black iron is very strong, so all the famous knights want weapons made of it. Maria also said that she didn't know how rough Ronan's swords were, but this one probably wouldn't break. She handed him some sword. Ronan reached for it and thought about the fact that it was a black iron sword and he had loved it in the past. Maria said that this rod had a good magic stone in it, so he saved it. The girl pointed at Asil and asked if he was saving it for this cutie. She asked if he was a mage. Asil smiled and started to listen carefully to what she was saying. Maria asked a confused Asil what magic he uses. He replied that he uses telekinesis. The girl was very impressed. She said it was incredible. Maria said that if he tried his best he could get a scholarship. Asil scratched the back of his head and smiled. Maria now turned to Ronan. She said that means it's only a matter of him now. The girl asked what technique he will show in the practical exam. Holding this sword in his hand, Ronan queried about the technique. Maria said that he seems to be out of the loop about getting into Filion. He needs to impress the professors and show his techniques in the practical exam. Marja said that the theoretical exam was also difficult, but not as difficult as the practical exam, and she added that if he did well on the practical exam, he would definitely be accepted into the academy. Maria said that in other words, if he doesn't prove his worth, then he might not even think of getting into this academy. Ronan exhaled saying that a swordsman just needs to be able to wield a sword. Ronan asked what they are usually shown. Maria replied that most nobles show their family's secret techniques. The girl rested her head on her hand and said that most martial artists and those wishing to enter are shown their own martial techniques using mana. Ronan asked her to stop and noticed the mention of mana. Ronan asked if sword kids at that age could use mana even without being mages. Maria was surprised and asked what he was even talking about. She said if he wanted to enter Filion he should definitely be able to do that. She said he should learn to feel his mana. Ronan looked at her not understanding anything. Maria added that he needed to learn how to use his mana in combat. She said that was the basics and asked why he was looking at her like that. Maria asked him just not to say that he doesn't know how to feel his mana. 
Ronan folded his arms and remained silent. Ronan asked her isn't it the same as Aura? Maria only got angry. Marja grabbed her head and asked him if he was really going to go to Philian Academy. The girl asked him how he could compare Aura and Nana. Ronan said that maybe he knew a little about it and asked why she made such a scene. Maria said it doesn't work that way and said they need to get out. Ronan asked why so suddenly. Maria took the sword saying she would borrow these swords as she was at the forge right now. She took the swords and turned around. Ronan asked how she had so much confidence in her and asked what would happen if she damaged them. Maria told him he could not worry because they would be done before that happened. Maria said if she hurt them she would pay double for them. Then she said she would pay triple for them and asked if he was satisfied. Ronan looked away. Maria opened the curtain and told him to stop talking and just follow her. The girl said she would give him a special training session. Mana is nature's original source of power. It's like air that is everywhere. However that doesn't mean that literally everyone can use it. In order to use mana, you must first experience your own mana and develop a mana sense. This can be accomplished through talent, training, strong desires, or anything else. Many factors influence whether or not it will work. But it usually takes people a year to participate. And those entering Philion had already passed that stage. Thanks to his own mana techniques, the road to Philion was open. It was already night. Maria asked him if he understood now. She told him to forget about his senses, because now he didn't even understand the difference between Aura and Nana, and he was about to enter Philion. Marja stood in front of him and called him a storyteller. Marja then said that if you look at it that way, Aura is a type of mana, but the difference between the two is like heaven and earth. Ronan asked if it was that serious? Maria said that even with talent and incredible effort, it takes at least a dozen years of training to get an echo of the innate power of Aura. The girl asked if he understood even a little. Ronan replied that he understood a little. Ronan thought about the fact that sometimes he would meet such on the battlefield and they would boast about using Aura and whatever other unusual powers there were. Ronan thought they were nasty opponents, but not that they were unbelievable. He remembered himself from the past. He thought about how if they were chopped up, they would die just like everyone else. Maria said it was time for them to finish with the explanations and suggested they start already. The girl said she thought he would understand faster if he used his body instead of his head. She started on her toes. Ronan thought to himself that she was just a young girl. She and her sword were already quite close to Ronan as he just stood with the sword on his shoulder. Ronan noticed this and became wary. They clutched at each other. Ronan was surprised. He looked at her. Marja looked very masculine and strong. Ronan and Maria clashed their swords. He made a thrust knocking her back with it. Ronan looked at her and thought how she at such a young age was already able to exude so much power, still using paired blades. The girl was looking at him seriously while he thought he hadn't noticed anything like that yet so he couldn't say for sure yet, but he thought it looked like it was her mana fighting technique she had told him about. Marja looked at him and thought about what was wrong with him. She wanted to end the fight with just one attack and show the power of mana to force him to give up on enrolling in this academy. Maria felt that it would be better than if he embarrassed himself in the entrance exam. But for some reason right now he was crowding her. Marja wondered how he was able to do that without using mana. Marja thought for a bit. She thought it was all nonsense. Ronan asked sharply what she was thinking about. She swung her two swords and Ronan swung as well. He got into a ready stance to strike. He told her to dodge, not block the blows. Ronan made a strike. It hit just into the floor as Maria managed to dodge. The girl pulled back a couple of meters. She leaned on her sword that she had stuck in the ground and smirked saying that was dangerous enough. Marja looked at him and asked him about being an unusual guy. Ronan said that he was like her. As Ronan put his sword in its sheath she said that he was not only good with mana but also with his sword. Only he had a problem with the center of gravity. Ronan abruptly turned around and walked away. He said if she solved those problems she would be stronger. Maria asked where he was going. She started to get angry and asked the guy just not to tell her that he already thinks he is a winner. Ronan told her that the most important thing is to keep your word. Ronan said she said so herself and pointed to the cracked sword. That she would pay him in triplicate. When she pointed that sword at Ronan it just broke into crumbs. She looked at it with surprised eyes. Marja looked at Ronan and asked how and when, and he just told her to get the money ready. Someone tapped on Marja's shoulder. It was Assel. He smiled and said she was good girl. Assel just understood her feelings. Ronan called out to Assel telling him to hurry up because he was very tired. Assel immediately ran to him. Maria looked at him very surprised. She stood behind them, looking at them and wondering who they were. It was already afternoon. Ronan said he had come for the money. 
He was standing with Assel and Marjane. He leaned over and asked what it was. There was a barrel with bags on it and next to it were two backpacks full of books. Ronan asked if they were books. Mariana said yes, they were theory books for joining Filion and her notes. Maria asked him if he needed any and said he was only a month away from admission. Ronan said he needed everything and asked why the sudden generosity. Ronan got close to her face and said if she was trying to screw him over somehow and Maria said it was nothing like that and she just liked him. She smilingly told him it was just a small favor for them all to join this academy together and said it was all for free of course. Ronan said if it was free he didn't know. Maria said she'd like to tutor him personally, but commerce doesn't wait and she had to get going. Maria slapped him on the shoulder and told him he needed a good tutoring himself. She also added that if he failed after all she had done for him, she wouldn't forgive him. Maria asked him if he understood. Ronan smiled and told her better worry about herself. She got into the carriage, waved to him and told him that then they would see each other already in the capital. At the entrance exams, Maria had told him to read everything from crust to crust. Ronan didn't even think about waving to her, while Assel smiled and waved after her. Ronan thought for a moment. He looked at his hands and thought about the fact that he needed to train his weak body. And he would have to learn as well. It was a particular challenge for him. But he was even enjoying it. After returning home, Ronan's daily life went on as usual. He was still living in that cabin with his sister, but still with a few changes. They had lunch together with Iroh. Iroh would look at him stuffing his belly so that it was almost bursting and say what a good appetite he had. And then he would burn off all those calories by hunting all night on the various monsters around the village, thus slowly improving his stamina and the adaptability of his body. Ronan stashed his sword in its sheath and exhaled. He interrupted a huge pile of monsters and said that he was done for the day, and continued until there were no more monsters left in the vicinity of the village. In addition, Ronan was constantly studying, which was also an incredible feat, as a soldier of a fine battalion. In the evening he sat at the table near the window and studied. He was angry. Ronan wondered why the nobles of the north had to learn table etiquette. Not knowing what results this would lead to anymore, Ronan tried his best. After a month, they finally reached the main action point of the story. They reached the incredibly beautiful capital of the empire, Valon. It lies the best educational institution in the empire, the small city of the White Tower. Azil looked at something and was very surprised. He asked if it was Filion. Azil said it was very beautiful there. He didn't have time to finish as he was interrupted by Ronan. He asked why he froze in the middle of the road. He told him to stop acting like a fool and finally pass or they might still be late for their exams. Azil apologized to Ronan. Ronan then asked him what happened. Ronan stepped a foot and Assel said nothing and it's just that it's only been a month and Ronan has grown so much. He asked Azil if he was back to his old self again. He scratched Assel's head and told him to stop talking nonsense and walk already. Assel walked and was shocked at literally every building. Ronan said since they had arrived in Filion they could meet him. The holy swordsman Shulapan. He was the heir to the famous swordsman family, Grania. He was a genius renowned as the strongest swordsman of the empire. Ronan thought about the fact that this swordsman should be about his age now so that he could safely meet him in the exam. Then he looked up and thought about it, not that it mattered. Asil asked Ronan if he had that thing with him, but Ronan didn't seem to understand him. Asil said he was talking about the feather that the dream bird left behind. After that explanation Ronan realized what he was talking about. Ronan said he grabbed it before he left. Ronan took the blue feather in his hand and said that he planned to look for it after the exams. Ronan stood with that feather in his hand. He said they were on the top floor of this building. Someone sitting in the office was saying how hard it was for him and that he really wasn't cut out for the job of a professor. He thought about becoming a searcher again. A blue bird perched on his shoulder and chirped a couple times. The man decided to pet the cute bird saying that Marpez was cheering him up. This Verlev's name was Baron Fanaras, and he was a professor of zoology at Phil Leon Academy. He said that they would need to air out the room, or it would be kind of embarrassing if Marpez's savior came today. Marpez opened the door and Ronan was already standing there. He said he hadn't even knocked and they had already opened it for him. He saw Sinyash in Varen's arms. He roared at the whole town. It was a cute lion with glasses holding Marpez in his arms. He asked who he was and asked how he got in here. Azil sat on the open window. Ronan said he thought he was going deaf by now. Azil said it was because he said he should have just taken the stairs. A lion with a marpez in his hands asked if they had come for his marpez. Ronan showed the feather. The man stopped. He asked if they were saviors. The man said he was being very rude to the heroes. Azil, 
Ronan and this. The lion man sat behind the chairs and talked. The man asked them to forget about it. Ronan said he already said it was okay and asked him to stop apologizing already. Ronan said that if he was being honest, it was all his fault because he picked them up. Assel said that it was Ronan who told him to use telekinesis because he was just too lazy to go up the stairs. Ronan squeezed Assel's cheeks and told him to be quiet. Holding Assel's mouth Ronan said that they better not talk about it and said that he was more surprised that not only that the owner of the bird turned out to be Verlev, but Verlev was a very rare species of beastmen. Ronan was more surprised that he was also a professor of Philion. Verlev replied that he was surprised too and said that who would have thought that Marpe's rescuers would turn out to be their applicants. The professor said it was a shame they hadn't gotten to know each other sooner, because he could have written them letters of recommendation, but the exams were today. Verlev said that he hoped they would pass the exams, but if not, he, Ronan said that was okay, and said that since they were here he wanted to ask them something, he said that as the professor knew they had very little time. He held out his hand with something in it, he asked Verlev what it was and said that Sinyash had pooped on his hand, the professor apologized and asked again about what Marpez had done. He said it was the egg of a fantastic bird. The professor picked up this egg and started to ask if Marpez laid this egg. Ronan also and said that birds seem to be supposed to lay eggs. The professor tensed up. He said so and so said that's true. But Marpez isn't just a bird. She's the bird of dreams. Verlev said that's not even the most interesting part. He said he didn't know who would hatch from that egg. Ronan tensed up too and asked how. The professor smiled and said that since it was a bird egg, a bird would hatch out of it too. But the bird of dreams was different. He said that depending on its surroundings, the dream bird would absorb different types of mana and lay an egg. He also said that in a place with lava, a phoenix wrapped in tons of flame would hatch. Or in a nest of monsters, the chick would take on the appearance of the monsters living there, and so on, and sometimes not even a bird at all. Verlev was fiddling with the egg and said that of course, if he analyzed the mana flows that the egg emitted, he might be able to predict what kind of bird would eventually hatch from it, but it wasn't that simple. Verlev said that there are billions of types of mana intertwined in this egg and they are all like future molten metal. Verlev said that right now it's hard for him to say for sure who exactly will hatch from the egg, and Ronan said that somehow this egg is making a lot of trouble. He asked Marpez where she'd gone to lay an egg like that. Ronan said that he had never met such a shameless bird before. Then the professor asked him if he could do something for him. And he asked if Ronan could look after that egg, and Ronan said he didn't mind. Ronan asked if he could do it because it was expensive, and Verlev said of course he could, because the bird of dreams only lays an egg once in a lifetime. Verlev said that since Marpez laid this egg in front of her saviors, he thought she felt something special about them. The professor said he wanted to honor the choice of his girlfriend he had lived with for so long. So the professor left them. Ronan picked up that egg and looked at it. He said he too was curious what would eventually hatch out of it. Ronan said that time was running out and they had already solved all their questions, so Ronan was about to leave, but this waller asked them to wait. He said he was thinking about what to give them as a reward and literally just now the perfect option had occurred to him. The professor held out his hand with some kind of sheet and asked them to take it. He said that everything that would help them incubate this egg was written down here. A short while later, the practical exam room and the main building of Castle Galleon. The waiting area for the incoming martial artists. Everyone was sitting and preparing for the exam. A guy came out and said that applicant number 111's exam was over. He called out applicant number 112. The guy went to the door. Ronan heard that number 112 went now. He realized he was next. Ronan sat with his leg folded over his leg and said that he had to wait a very long time. Maria was sitting next to him and he decided to ask her if she thought so. The girl replied that it was like that for all the exams. Ronan asked why she was dressed like that. He said it was embarrassing. Maria sighed and said that she was paying too much attention to her appearance. She said that all the aristocrats were going to Philion. Maria tilted her head to Ronan and said that those aristocrats might become their clients in the future. So she thought she should be dressed like a needle. Ronan said she was trying too hard. Maria said she was sorry their cutie wasn't with them. Ronan said there was nothing they could do about it and that the mages were taking the exam in another room. Ronan said he would be glad if Azil didn't at least burst into tears there from loneliness. The guy came out again and said that applicant number 112's exam was over. Looks like he screwed up. Ronan got up from his chair and said it was his turn. Maria told him not to be nervous and just go all in. Maurice told the departing Ronan in that room that if he failed, she wouldn't forgive him. Ronan sarcastically thanked her for her support. He turned around and said he would be back soon. When he entered the hall, there were flags and such hanging there. 
Ronan stopped. He looked and wondered who it was. It was the professors of Filion. Ronan looked at the teachers and thought about how everyone stood out in their own way. He turned his attention to Principal Prof Kratir and to Navarroza's Fichting instructor. Ronan bowed and introduced himself. He was told it was a pleasure to meet him and the academy principal introduced himself as well. His name was Krava Kratir. The principal said his opponent would be a magic dummy. Ronan turned his head towards the dummy. Kratir asked him to demonstrate his technique and asked him what he wanted to show them. Ronan said nothing much. He added that he wanted to show a simple chopping blow and reached for his sword. Ronan said he thought it would be enough for this dummy. Krathir was surprised and the other examiner asked if he would use a simple chopping blow even without using mana. He turned to the examiner on his right and said that there was always some guy who would start talking nonsense at the sight of a magic dummy. He told him that they couldn't do anything about it because of the hillbillies here. They said that it might not look like it, but the mannequin can withstand a blow with aura, and it recovers quickly, as it is a well-thought-out product of magical engineering. Those two examiners kept whispering. One said that even the genius Shulapan could barely leave a scratch on this dummy, so he was wondering what this guy wanted to show them. The other told him that no one knows and maybe he could cut him in half. He laughed and called him a joker. Director Kratir didn't like these conversations. He told them he could hear everything, and Kratir couldn't understand why they were so rude despite the fact that this guy was right next to him. He wondered what would happen if the child showed otherwise. Ronan stood in front of the mannequin. Krather noticed his aura and wondered where he got it from at his age. Ronan leaned on his leg and made a stab. The holy swordswoman was shot. Ronan hit his sword immediately after the blow and said that he was done. Those two examiners laughed from the fact that he only showed one strike and sarcastically said that it would be hard for them to evaluate such a talent. Then they turned to the principal and asked what he would say to that. The principal sat there with his mouth open. He was shocked at what was happening. Instructor Navarroza then stood on the table. She pushed herself off the table and jumped straight towards Ronan. Her sword was already very close to him. Holding the sword at his neck she stopped. Ronan looked at her and said she scared him. She asked who he was. And asked who taught him how to wield a sword like that. Holding the sword at Ronan's neck she stopped. Ronan looked at her and said she scared him. She asked who he was. And asked who taught him how to wield a sword like that. Navarroza didn't remove the sword from his shoulder. Ronan asked what she was even talking about. Navarroza said she would ask him a slightly different question then. She asked if he had seen her movements. Ronan told her yes and said she was truly amazing. Ronan said it's hard to bear your sword that fast, but she also managed to swing it three times. Navarroza said he was right and she did three swings just as smug as the ones Ronan himself had shown. The boy was wary. In the reflection of the sword you could see Navarroza's furious face. Nabirosa asked if he thought. She wouldn't figure out his stupid trick. She said he deliberately slowed the last blow, as if to make sure they'd see it. The principal asked if he'd forgotten where he was, and called those examiners fucking theoretical professors. Ronan looked down at the floor and thought that Nabirosa had misunderstood, because he had only held back the force of the last blow so that the sword wouldn't break. But judging by her negative attitude, Ronan doubted she would believe it. She lifted the sword from his shoulder. Turning around, she put the sword back in its sheath and said she had it memorized. Ronan was surprised she was so quick to get away from him. Nabaraz looked at him and said she would train him personally. Ronan smiled slightly and thought there was more to it. A furious Nabaraz sat down next to the headmaster. Crather thought about her phrase and thought about what it meant. To him it sounded like she had already taken the boy as her student. Kratir thought about the fact that it sounded like she had already taken this student as her student. He thought about how he needed to be more careful. Kratir said that was a good job. The principal said they would end the test with a simple question. He said there was no right answer and asked Ronan to answer it as he saw fit. Kratir asked him why he wanted to study at Filion. Ronan thought about his past. O oh, said that it was an interesting question. He said the answer to it was to have no regrets. Ronan said that is what he would like to learn first. The principal was very surprised. The principal said he understood and said he could go. The door slammed shut behind Ronan. Kratir thought about Ronan's words. The principal smiled and asked how to teach him that, and the other examiner wondered what just happened. He asked the headmaster what this boy had done. He asked if this boy had done some brilliant trick. Kratir said you could say that, but he would call it talent. Then they were both very much surprised. It looked like Ronan had chopped off the head of this magic dummy. The dummy's head fell to the floor. Ronan stood and looked at the door. He thought about that lady's sword. 
Ronan thought about if he had faced her in the past, would he have been able to defeat her? He remembered her serious face and thought about the fact that he thought that he thought he had had enough hardships already, but it looked like he still had a very hard and long road ahead of him, and he realized that. The boy thought back to the commander-in-chief with a smile and thought that he hadn't come to Philion for nothing. Ronan thought about how he could learn a lot here. He stepped his foot and thought about the fact that now all he had to do was write a written test. Ronan had been studying hard for it for a month. Ronan smiled and thought it should go great. He sat with his knees tucked up and said nothing good there. Ronan said in a shaky voice that he had screwed up, really screwed up. Then he said that his life had basically always been a total disgrace. Maria was very angry with him, and Asil looked at him pitifully. Maria turned to Azil and said that to think that he hadn't answered half the questions. She wondered why and said that she had told him to go through all her notes in her bag. Azil turned to her and said what about it? Azil said Ronan took a couple of those books and set them aside in his bag and then he concentrated on his studies and completely forgot about them and there was a bunch of material in there. In a trembling voice Asil said that it was all his fault and if he had asked him it wouldn't have happened. Maria asked how such a fool the earth even carries such a fool. Maria asked if Ronan had been in such a state since the end of the test and asked if the results were coming soon. Maria lifted Ronan's hands and told him to stop whining already and told him that everything will be fine because the practical test is always more important. She added that she was sure that with his skills, the academy building started to glow. What guy told everyone to pay attention to the results? Asil and Maria turned around. There were a bunch of people gathered near the virtual results plate. Asil asked if this was the list of those who had joined the academy. Maria said it was much earlier than she thought. Asil's line said that he had a 12th place in the Faculty of Magic on the practical exam and a 1st place on the written exam. Maria's line said that in the Martial Arts Faculty she had 9th place in both exams. Asil and Maria looked at each other. Maria was in a stupor. Then Maria and Asil hugged each other and shouted that they had passed. Maria patted Asil and said that he had gotten 1st place in theory. Asil couldn't believe it. Maria pointed to the line and said that three other people shared the first place with him. The girl praised the cutie. Asil smiling and embarrassed said he was just lucky. Satisfied Maria turned to Ronan and asked what place he was in. He stood with his face down to the floor. He said in a shaky voice that he knew he was not going to be on the list. He thought about why he was even hoping for anything. Asil couldn't believe it either. He said it was impossible. Maria was very angry. She started touching his face and told him to stop messing around, because she couldn't believe it either. Ronan said he was definitely not on the list because he had read literally every name on it. Ronan said that he had already said he was wrong. Then there was a flash of fire of some sort. Ronan asked what the new flash was. Maria said it was a salute to honor those who passed the exam the best. There appeared a phoenix of glory. It flew upward. And then just floated in the air. Ronan stared at it in surprise. There was some kind of explosion again. And a sign popped up saying that Ronan was in the second place of the martial arts faculty. He was in the first place in the practical exam. And in the written exam he was in the 5702nd place. Maria, Asil and Ronan opened their mouths. Maria and Asil hugged him and said in one voice that he was in second place. They were insanely happy. Maria said that to get such a place in the theoretical exam, he was still able to get the second place of the faculty purely because of the practical exam. Asil said that was just amazing. Asil said that he knew Ronan was a genius and Ronan smiled and said that Asil was a good judge of people. Ronan's face changed and said that if he got first place in the practical exam, then it turns out he lost to him. Ronan thought about the fact that with this guy's temper, he definitely won't bitch about it. Although Ronan was very happy, but he was very scared. Then some guy came and said that it was Ronan who had won first place in the practical exam. Ronan stood with his back to him and thought about how he knew they would meet like this. It was the Holy Swordsman Shulapin. Ronan and Saint Swordsman Shulapin stood opposite each other. Some guys were very surprised to see Shulapin here. The girl said that he never thought of meeting the Star of the Empire like this. Maria told Ronan that Shulapin seemed to want to talk to him. Asil found the atmosphere around him frightening. Ronan got angry. He thought about how he had gotten into trouble and how Shulapin hadn't changed at all. Ronan thought of Shulapin as a guy who couldn't stand anyone who was better with a sword than him, with a nasty desire to always win. Ronan thought about how he could resolve things quietly and peacefully. He said he didn't understand what first place was even about. Shulapin got angry. He asked why Ronan was lying to him and Ronan kept pretending he was some kind of fool and asking why he was lying. Ronan asked the swordsman if he had any proof and he said that if he didn't have any, he should stop fighting and just go on his way. Shulapin then took up his sword and repeated the words about proof. 
He said that he would have proof now. He then made a punch, but Ronan blocked it immediately. A guy tried to hold on to Shulipan's sword. Maria and Azil tensed up as well. Ronan asked if that was enough. He told him that if he hadn't been in the first place, he wouldn't have been able to react. The guys who were nearby shouted that a fight had started. Shulipan told him to show him. Show him skills beyond his skills. Ronan discharged and called him a fucked up bastard. Ronan then put his sword back away and said if that's what he was asking. He raised his gaze and said he would show him. Ronan jumped back. Shulipan looked at him and didn't realize what was happening. Ronan disappeared again. Shulipan threw one punch but it did nothing. Ronan questioned if the bastard wanted it and asked if he was satisfied now. Shulipan lowered his gaze. He said he now understood why he got such a good grade and said his technique was excellent. He then lifted his foot up on his toe and said it wasn't good enough. They clashed swords again and Shulipan said that as he realized, this technique was not enough to beat him. Ronan held Shulipan's sword. He said he was just fucked and told him to chill out a bit. Shulipan said to show him everything he was hiding. He started to get really mad. Shulipan said that one wouldn't make it. They then took another round of punches and Shulipan said he still didn't recognize Ronan's victory. Holding Shulipan's attack Ronan wondered if the idiot had stuck to him because he had a death wish, which was the reason Ronan didn't want to cross paths with him. Ronan thought about the fact that at this rate, this idiot would be able to use his aura, and that would be a problem for him. With one swing of his sword, Shulipan could cause a storm, and because of his incredible aura, he was called the Sword of Storms and Ronan could not handle it. Ronan decided at one point to turn his back on Shulipan. The man got angry and asked what he was even doing. He also asked how he could afford to turn his back on his opponent during a fight. Ronan clenched his sword in his hand. Shulipan went at Ronan with a punch and asked if he really thought he would let him go so easily. Ronan had already prepared to block his punch, only he started blocking it with Aesil. Ronan hid behind Azil. A startled Azil asked why him. Shulipan called Ronan a vile bastard because he stooped to the level of using a lady as a mere shield. Aesil in a shaky voice corrected Shulipan saying that he's a guy. Ronan said that Aesil's character doesn't change even on the brink of death. Ronan then put Aesil aside and made a kick at Shulipan. He was in pain. Ronan called out to Asil and Maria, and said that this was a chance. He shouted to them about running away from here. They ran holding each other's hands. Shulipan asked them to wait, but they didn't pay attention. And some bald man came out of the gathered crowd of people and asked what was going on here. He said he heard there was some kind of fight. A slightly injured Shulipan was standing on one leg leaning on his sword. The bald man asked what was wrong with him and if he was alright. He started to ask what had happened here. The bald man asked for a description and said that the guards would find and punish them. Shulipeg told him to speak normally. He said that he wasn't the son of the ducal family now but just a normal student like everyone else. He got to his feet and said they could not worry about that because it was a fair fight. He said he could take care of himself. Shulipan turned his attention to something. His sword cracked. Shulipan was very surprised that a sword made of high quality mithril cracked. Shulipan thought that there was nothing unusual about Ronan's skills, but he didn't think he would do such a thing to his sword. The swordsman became curious. He smiled and said he would remember his name. The next day on the outskirts of the capital, Shimu Forest. The boy stepped with his foot. Ronan was walking with a tired Azil and maps in his hands. He said it must be around here somewhere. Azil asked Ronan in a shaky voice if he was sure it would be okay. Ronan turned to him and asked him what he was talking about. Asil said he was talking about the guy he fought with yesterday. He said he heard that he is the heir to the ducal city of Grantia. It is the second most important city after the imperial family. Asil said Ronan broke the nose of such a powerful man. Asil asked what he would do if Shulipan wanted to take revenge on him. Ronan looked at the cards and told him that he could not worry, because Shulipan was not a bad guy. He was just a swordsman. Ronan said that he has his reasons and he can be trusted. He said that Shulipan is an example for the weak and protects them. Maybe Ronan thinks that Shulipan is the epitome of a perfect aristocrat. Ronan said that probably Shulipan said yesterday that it was just a normal fight, or else they would all be in jail by now. Asil looked at him and said that he believed Ronan was right. Ronan told Asil to knock it off and told him to take a better look at where they came in. There was literally glistening water in this place. Ronan said it was the mana vein that Professor Varen had told them about. They came to the insanely beautiful Fernando Spring. Ronan began to tell me that mana envelopes literally the entire world, and the place where it, for some reason, gathers and forms a puddle is called a mana dwelling. Near such puddles mana permeates the entire environment. 
A simple stone here can become a high-grade mana stone, and an ordinary wheat can become a miraculous healing herb. Understandably, for these effects a mana vein is sought after by absolutely everyone. Ronan squatted down, looked into the water and said that since it was an incredibly valuable place, no one was eager to talk about it. Ronan remembered how he and Assel had sat in that professor's office and said that that professor was very generous for sharing such a huge value with them. Ronan decided not to finish that sentence and asked Azil what he had to say about it. He asked if he felt anything unusual. Azil looked at his hands and said that it was the first time he felt so much mana in one place. He also said that he thought he would be able to use his magic here, much stronger than his normal magic. He remembered about the egg. Azil said it usually does that. But now the egg had started absorbing mana at an incredible rate. The egg seemed to really like the mana here. Ronan said it was clear to him and then said he wouldn't understand it himself anyway. Ah so, said that Maria would have loved it here too. He was sorry she had to do the merchant business and if not that she would have gone with him. Ah so, wanted to say something else and turned to Ronan. Asil asked him if he thought this place was somehow strange. Ronan didn't understand at first. He said that Professor Varen said that there is a lot of mana here and that's why a lot of fantasy creatures come here. Which meant there must be plenty of regular animals here too and Ronan tensed up. Asil and Ronan wondered why they couldn't hear these animals then. Ronan exhaled a breath. He thought about the fact that he had gotten too relaxed. He grabbed his head and said that things were not going according to plan again. Ronan asked why it was like this everywhere he went. Asil asked what was wrong. Ronan told him to get ready. There was a dead animal lying on the floor. What people with burning eyes stood around the pile of animal corpses. Ronan said he could smell blood. A frightened Asil asked what blood odor we are talking about. Ronan asked him what he thought. He looked at him and said that someone had already visited here before them. Ronan said, except that these guests were unexpected. An arrow flew from the forest. These uninvited guests stood with drawn arrows and wearing some sort of animal masks. Many of these arrows flew straight at Ronan. When the arrow was already in his face, he drew his sword. He cut that arrow with lightning speed. It shattered into pieces. Ronan looked at the arrow more closely. He thought about the fact that he had definitely seen these arrows somewhere before. In a past life. A boot camp. A guy was holding the same arrow as the one Ronan had just cut and asking if they knew how powerful it was. It was a red-haired and smiling guy. He said that this unusual arrow could take even an orc's head off. He stood across from Ronan who was sitting on a log. He asked the captain what he would say and asked if he would buy it. Ronan got angry and told the man to shut up. As a man caught poaching with such a thing, he dares to brag yet? He said that such arrows can only be used by hunting dogs, those who have successfully pulled off hundreds of sorties already. The boy said they were Calabaro's elite. Ronan thought about the fact that this was Calabaro again, and no longer mere mutts, but some kind of hunting dogs. But Ronan didn't give up right away. Ronan stood in front of Asil and told him to hide somewhere, but told him to be careful and not let him make a porcupine of himself. In the meantime he would step back for a while, and after saying that, he immediately jumped back and chased off somewhere. Those guys who launched the arrows wondered who he was and how he was able to chop up all the mana-filled arrows in one fell swoop. He ran very fast, bouncing off every tree. One of them spotted him and shouted for everyone to scatter, then surround him and attack. Ronan thought about the fact that this guy was as quick to make decisions as he thought, which meant that these guys were different from the little mutts he'd met in the woods the other day. They all scattered in different directions. Ronan thought to himself that this was going to be hard enough. He stepped with his foot and told them to stop. Ronan said they couldn't tell lies from enemies anymore. The main guy sitting in the tree wondered what the hell he was talking about. Ronan smiled and said it looked like they hadn't heard it yet. He put his sword on his shoulder and said that he was the youngest hunting dog of the Damasus branch. Ronan introduced himself as a Gaeth. They all approached him and asked if he was really a hunting dog. Ronan said he was and asked if he believed him. He got angry and asked if he wanted him to believe this nonsense. He said a sucker like him wouldn't be taken into the hunting dogs even by connections. Ronan calmly said if he didn't believe him he suggested he asked the wolf of his branch. Ronan said he would give him a little advice. Ronan smiled and said that thinking everyone around him is worthless just because he himself is like that is not a good habit. Ronan told the already angry hunting dog that it made him look pathetic. The guy took Ronan by the sweater and asked him how dare he insult him at all. He got close to his face and asked him if he wanted him to rip into shreds. Ronan started throwing up his hands and laughing at the fact that this guy also likes to attack people. Ronan said it usually ends badly. The other masked guy put his hand on his shoulder and told him to calm down. He asked him not to doubt him just because he was still a kid. 
He said that only Calabaro knew the ranking system and branches and he was the one who knew everything about it. Calabaro's ranking system was small. There were only three. The lowest rank was that of the wild dog, then the hunting dogs and the highest was the wolf. The masked guy said that they should first ask the captain if he was lying or not, for if he was, they might have a conflict with the Damas branch. Someone came out of the bushes and said that he was telling them to just observe. He saw the whole scene and asked what kind of baloney they were making here. It was their bald captain. He was the wolf of the Demir branch of Vium. The guy let Ronan go and said he was right on time. He pointed at Ronan and said the asshole was talking. The others realized that they were going to be reprimanded. Ronan thought about the fact that since the wolf was here, Ronan had a slightly sinister smile on his face. The captain asked Ronan if he was a Gaeth of the Adams branch. He said yes he was. The captain asked what he was forgetting here then because this part of the mountain range is the territory of the Demir branch. Ronan smiled and said that he didn't know. Looking at the angry face of the captain Ronan said he was not a Gaeth. He made a stab. He chopped off half the bodies of those dogs standing next to him and said that he had just given himself the most bastardized name he knew. That guy and the captain were shocked. Ronan swung around again and said it was a name to match the stinking poacher. Some bits flew out of the captain's mouth. Ronan chopped the head off their bald captain. That guy was standing there with a knife. He decided to turn to the captain. Ronan turned to him and told him that he told him he was going to end badly. Ronan then chopped off his fingers, causing him to drop the knife from his hands. The boy screamed in pain. He fell to his knees and grabbed his arm. Ronan stood with his sword on his shoulder. Ronan said if he wanted to die here let him pick himself up and take this. Ronan threw him some wrapped paper. Ronan told him to mark all the locations he knew on it. The guy sitting on the floor didn't understand at first. Ronan smirked and asked what was unclear and asked what he wanted. He kept that sinister smile on his face and said that since he did, there was no point in letting him live. The guy stuttered in fear. He immediately started saying he would do anything, but he had nothing to write with. Ronan said he had already made him an excellent pen. He told him to look at his right hand. He clipped his fingers on that hand and asked him why he didn't have a pen. This guy couldn't hold back his tears anymore. Ronan sat on the stump and read what the guy had written there. He said he was good and he could see he was trying. Ronan said you this guy has talent in drawing. This guy thanked and smiled. Then he asked if he would let him go as promised. Ronan then hid the drawing in his pocket and said what about it? Ronan took his sword and cut this guy in half. If you looked from the other side, you could see Ronan through that slit. Ronan after cutting this guy said that of course he wouldn't let him go. The sun was shining brightly. It was already evening. Someone was making strange sounds like he was throwing up. It was a zeal leaning against a tree. Ronan told him to stop being dramatic. Ronan told him that he warned him. Asil turned to him and apologized. He said it was too much. Asil pointed to the dead animals and asked if Calabaro had done all that. There was a huge pile of dead animals. There were really a lot of them. Ronan said he had already said that it would be a crime to kill those guys when they met. Asil started to say something but Ronan interrupted him telling him not to worry because all those guys were wanted criminals who needed to be executed. Then Ronan thought about it. He remembered Professor Varian and thought that if he saw that. Ronan looked at the dead bird and he was upset too. Asil asked if it was time for them to go back. The egg that was in Ronan's pouch started to do something. Ronan turned to him and asked what was wrong. Then he reached into the pouch and started pulling the egg out. Asil looked somewhere and turned to Ronan. Azil pointed at something. He asked in a trembling voice what it was. Ronan looked over there. Ronan became wary. Blood began to pool as if it were rising upwards. A cloud of their blood formed over the slaughtered animals. The blood continued to rise. Suddenly the blood began to come in a wave over Asil and Ronan. Ronan stood in front of Asil and reached for his sword. They couldn't understand what nonsense was going on. The egg that was in Ronan's hand suddenly began to float in the air and glow. It rose up to Ronan's face and began to glow even brighter. Blood began to swirl around it. It floated in the air and absorbed all that blood. The egg glowed so brightly that Ronan and Azil covered themselves with their hands from the light. Asil held onto Ronan and asked in a trembling voice what was going on. Ronan replied that he didn't know himself. Ronan smiled and said that however he was definitely sure. He stood and continued to smile. Ronan said that whatever was under the shell was something unusual. The blood was becoming less and less. The egg was absorbing the last drops of blood. The blood ran out. Asil asked if it was all over. Ronan said it looked like it. He said that nothing had changed. But he didn't finish because the egg started to crack. 
the cracks were getting bigger. Asil was wary. Ronan smiled because he was excited that something was going to hatch out of it. A hole formed in the egg. Ronan was very excited. He was excited to see what kind of bird would hatch. His smile grew whiter and whiter. Something flew out of the egg right into Ronan's face. Ronan touched the wound the creature had left and asked what the hell. It was a bird with black and purple wings. Ronan looked at it and asked if it was the bird of dreams. He started to look at it but the creature didn't look like a bird to him. Azil said it looked more like a dragon. Ronan turned to Azil and asked if he thought so too. Azil said yes, because that's what they draw in the books. Ronan looked at the dragon and couldn't understand where this bird had absorbed the mana to be born like this. Ronan stroked it and said it was cute. Immediately after saying that he started yelling at her and saying that it was too much for a greeting, Ronan asked why she hit him in the face. She was just looking at him. She then started creating some sort of thing. Ronan's nose started to glow. It looked like this dragon can heal the wound. Azil marveled that this kid knows healing magic. Asil said that also Ronan liked her a lot. She rubbed her face nicely on Ronan's face. Ronan said that she is much more capable than she looks. Asil offered to give her a name on the pretext that she couldn't be called the bird of dreams all the time. Ronan agreed. Ronan thought about what name would suit her. She became alert. Then she yelped and tore off somewhere. Asil asked where she was suddenly. Ronan smirked and said he was surprised that she was able to sense someone's presence. Someone was running. It was someone from Calabaro. He was a messenger from the Demir branch and his name was Ballas. He couldn't figure out what the hell it was. He ran to the place where Ronan had killed all those Calabaro guys. Ballas looked at them and thought about how while he was running errands they had all died. Then he remembered how he saw the egg absorb the blood and wondered what that even was. Ballas started to run. He couldn't understand what was going on here. He was being chased by a bird of dreams. Ballas got caught on something. And then he fell. He turned around to face the bird. It was hovering in the air right above him, glowing. The guy's chest was bleeding and he started screaming and begging for help. Then someone came over. He told her to stop. Ronan called her Sita and asked her to stop. Azil interjected about Sita and asked if that was her name. Ronan said yes and it was her name now. He added that it had been going around in his head for a long time. Ronan petted her and asked if she liked the name. Sidi smiled. Ballas looked surprised and wondered if it was a kid. He wondered if he owned this monster and who he even was. Ronan had a Sita sitting on his finger. He asked how the kid was and called him by name. Ballas was kneeling in front of him. He said he was alive because of Ronan and thanked him. He asked how he knew his name. Ronan put his sword on his shoulder and said he didn't need to know. Ballas looked at that sword fearfully. Ronan realized that this was the guy who was advertising to them the arrows that were used to shoot the guys he killed and said that no one would have thought they would meet like this, but he was glad to meet them anyway. Ronan asked how his poaching business was going. Ronan called him the chatty hunting dog Calabaro. Ballas had his hood down a bit and so you could see his face. He paid attention to the way Ronan called him. In a guttural voice he said he was just a messenger. Ronan asked if he had a low rank at this time and said he would need to do something for him anyway. Ronan smiled and said he wanted to clarify right away. He said it wasn't a request. They came into town. Ronan shook the coins in his hands and said that it was good. Ronan walked with Alish through the night city. He said that everything worked out even better than he expected and Azil said he was shocked too. Ronan said he was a little confused when he said even the spring water is akin to gold. He lifted some flask of spring water up and said he made him dial it up a bit. When he gave this flask to Maria's father, Ronan could not even raise that he would offer so much for it. Asil said that because of him they would be able to not worry about money. Ronan said yes, but they owed Professor Varen a lot. Ronan said that when they went to thank him and show him Sita, he had already left on a business trip. Ronan thought about that still, considering the map he got from that hunting dog. He also thought about the assignment he'd given Asil Ballas. Then there would be more to the conversation than a simple thank you. He remembered Ballas crying and thought about how much he had intimidated that asshole into not daring to betray him. Asil asked Ronan what he was going to do with all that money. Asil began to tell him that those who took second place in the faculty were exempt from tuition and even received a scholarship. So in essence Ronan didn't have to pay for anything. Asil asked if he wanted to do something with the money and Ronan thought about it. He thought about the fact that the admission ceremony was coming up. A few days later, a stagecoach station in the center of Valen. A guy opened the door and addressed the lady. He said they had arrived and she thanked him. She looked outside and thought to herself, this is what the capital city is like. It was Iral. She looked around and said it was very beautiful here. 
Ronan came up behind her and asked his little sister how the road went. She turned around and shouted his name. At the splash Sita sat hiding a bit. Ronan asked if anything had happened while he was gone. Iral said she should be the one to ask him. She furiously asked if he had any idea how surprised she was when she saw the luxury carriage in front of their house. Iral asked where he got the money for it. She started touching Ronan's cheeks and started asking why he had lost weight and if he was eating well. Ronan said she couldn't worry as he was eating quite normally. Iral calmed down. She noticed Sita on Ronan's shoulder and asked who was that cutie. She peeked out from behind his shoulder and smiled. Ronan said it was Sita and for some reason she followed him. Ronan said that was all later and said they needed to hurry. Iral asked where they needed to hurry to all of a sudden. Ronan took her hand and told her that he would be very busy when classes started at the academy. But before that, Ronan wanted to do whatever he wanted to do. Iral called out to Ronan. She said she knew he had made a lot of money. Ronan looked at Iral and reflected that just as he thought absolutely everything suited her. Iral said she realized he was so carefree because he had gotten a scholarship. But still, that wouldn't always be the case. Iral stood in an insanely beautiful yellow and white dress and asked if it would be expensive for a gift. Ronan turned to the attendant and asked if they could deliver it all. They said of course they could. Iral turned to the pile of gifts and asked if it was too much. Ronan said no. After all she had been through so much because of him. So it was time for him to repay her for that. Iral covered her mouth in shock. She asked her little brother when he had time to be so mature. She started yelling and telling everyone to see what a kind little brother she had. Ronan asked her to stop. Those who were serving them said they were getting along well. Ronan was very embarrassed. He said since they were done here he suggested they go on. She immediately agreed. Iral asked where they would go now. Ronan said that they would go to Craftsman Street because he needed to get a proper sword, as he had damaged his own. They walked out of the building and Shulapan was already standing there. He turned to Ronan. Ronan screamed in fright and Sita screamed along with him. Ronan grabbed Iral and asked him what he was doing here. Ronan called him a stalker. Shulapan said that he had come to get his new sword that he had ordered nearby, because this one had become a little defective because of Ronan. Shulapan looked at him and said he saw it by accident and decided to wait. Shulapan asked if he cleared up the misunderstanding. Ronan said he had and meant was a stalker. Ronan called him fucked and asked for the sword becoming defective. Ronan got angry and grabbed his sword. He furiously asked Shulapan how he even had the nerve to say such a thing after what he did to his sword and asked who else should blame who. They were both very angry with each other. Shulapan and Ronan stood forehead to forehead and reached for their swords. Ronan asked if he could show him what a truly defective sword was. Shulapan said it sounded interesting enough and said that if he wanted a rematch, but he didn't have time to finish his sentence as Iral started to defend him. She told Ronan to stop swearing. Ronan started making excuses, saying that she had it all wrong, but she wasn't calming down at all. Shulapan couldn't understand what was going on. Iral fixed her hair and told Shulapan that she was really sorry for what had happened. She said that her little brother might be profane, but he was really good. The heir to the great noble empire of Grandia, the rising star of the Shulapan Empire. Shulapan looked at her without taking his eyes off her. This moment was forever imprinted in his memory. Iral asked if he was hurt. Shulapan looked at her like a goddess. He really thought he had met a goddess. Iral started to apologize and said that it was all her fault as she didn't raise Ronan well. Shulapan started to say something in a trembling voice. He lowered his head and said it was all because of his temper and added that she had nothing to apologize for. She looked at him with her sweet eyes while he said that what happened was his fault so he asked her not to worry. The girl said that he was very kind. Iral took Shulapan's hands and called him very good his friend. She was very happy for them. She asked Shulapan to take care of her brother. Shulapan of course agreed. Ronan watched all of this and couldn't understand what was going on. Shulapan continued to be confused. He said he would buy Ronan a new sword to start with, but he said he didn't have any gold with him right now. He held out his hand with some huge coin in it and said to accept it. He said it was his family's identification code. Iral accepted it. Shulapan said she could go anywhere in the empire with it. Ronan was shocked to say the least. Ronan asked if he realized how valuable a thing he was giving her, but his question was successfully ignored. Shulapan said if they wanted to buy a sword he recommended a visit to the smithy at the west end of Croft Street. He said they have a 500-year history, so it's very difficult for ordinary people to get into it, but with this pass it would be easy enough. Shulapan turned around and said that he hoped that they would be made a fine sword. Ronan still stood with his mouth open. He thought about how Shulapan was fucked and didn't realize what he had just done. Ronan looked at the token and said that even a decent-sized village could be smoked out with this token. 
Ronan looked at the departing Shulipan and thought about the truth of this Shulipan he knew. The next day, Philian Academy's entrance ceremony. The principal stood in front of the assembled students and said that he was pleased to meet the freshman of the 787th set. He introduced himself and said that he was the principal of this academy. Kratir said that as they know they are all talents who entered here after passing a rigorous selection process and proving their potential. Kratir said that he is sure that by combining their boundless talent and Philian's best training, he smiled and said that they could all go down in the history of the empire. Kratir congratulated everyone on their enrollment. Ronan thought about how grand it was that hell had gaped. He looked at his little sister who was wiping away tears and thought about how moments like this in life were needed too. The principal raised his hand and said now this. Then he snapped his fingers. Magic went through all the students. They all looked up. Azil turned to Ronan. Someone shouted for everyone to look over there. It was as if something cracked in the air. It was as if the heavens were collapsing. All the students found themselves in some sort of coliseum. There were a lot of people there. They greeted them, calling them Junior. The guys couldn't understand what was going on. Ronan thought of the principal moving the entire playground with a simple snap of his fingers. The principal said that in honor of the completion of their induction ceremony, they would begin the Senior Younger Meeting. Senior Younger Meeting. This meeting is held to share experiences between freshmen and sophomores. It is a special event at Philion, and it always has a tense atmosphere. It looks like this. The first and second place finishers on the entrance exams each choose one of the four strongest sophomores, as first and second place finishers Ronan and Shulapan will choose. Each of these four sophomores has their own fighting style. They have to have a duel with them. The principal said that this event depicts the approach to training in their academy. Kratir said that they believe in learning not only from professors, but also from other students, because finding vulnerability in each other, teamwork and competition, will start the learning process. Iral was very excited, and the principal added that this ceremony is the first step towards learning through jousting between students from different courses. Of course the first-year students get the right to choose their opponents, but they can also choose not to compete. Kratir said that he hoped that they didn't intimidate the first years too much and they would want to participate. Ronan complained that he talks a lot, but in fact it's just hazing. A girl named Nasto, she is a martial arts student. She is the first ranked sophomore. A guy named Braum, he is also a martial arts student. The guy is in second place. Braum said that these two guys are the main celebrities of this year. A girl with red hair named Irina is a martial arts student and is in third place in the ranking. And the last person is a guy in fourth place in the ranking named Karun. Brown was already very eager to fight these first-ranked guys. Ronan was a little scared and called him a tough guy with a trembling voice. Ronan looked at Iral and thought about the fact that he had a great opportunity to show his little sister that he could stand up for himself just fine. And that making friends wasn't a problem at all. The headmaster had said that members of the same age group could choose their opponents, and Ronan was wary. Ronan turned to the headmaster and asked if he could suggest something to him. Kratir said he was listening. Ronan said that if he could choose freely, he would like a lesson from all the esteemed seniors, and the headmaster was surprised but didn't object yet. The sophomores were starting to get angry. Ronan smiled and said he wished he could get that lesson from everyone at once. There were a bunch of people around them, freshmen and sophomores standing across from each other. The principal and the rest of the teachers were discussing something. Kratir turned to instructor Neighboraz and asked her what she thought about it. She said that he should be allowed to, since the main principle of the academy is that you can do anything you are strong enough to do. Neighboraz added that whoever wins, it will be a lesson to them anyway. If anything, she said she would intervene in the fight. The headmaster thought for a moment, and then agreed. He said that's what they would do then. The sophomores looked very serious. They were not very happy with this turn of events. Karun said that it was absurd. He said that this guy had milk on his lips and he was already looking down on them. Irina said that second place had just gone to his head. She said he needs to be taught a lesson. Nasto told them to calm down. She said he may be arrogant, but he still defeated Shulapan and should not be underestimated. She took up her sword and said that they should put their best foot forward first. Nasto asked loudly if everyone understood and everyone began to draw their sword. Iral became even more worried. She said it all looked very creepy. From the crowd, she shouted to Ronan to be more careful and told him that if he didn't handle it, to let him surrender right away. He smiled and waved his hand. Iral just stared at him. The principal said then the first battle between the seniors and juniors begins. Nasto immediately ran towards Ronan. She was already very close to him but he wasn't doing anything yet. 
She then made a punch but he dodged it by throwing his head back. It wasn't a bad punch, he thought to himself. This punch he thought was much better than that punch from Maria. Ronan was beginning to realize that these four were on a whole different level. Ronan thought about the fact that Irina had already come at him with a sword, but he immediately blocked her blow. She looked at him and thought about her next strike. Ronan took a swing. Karon was already running at Ronan, telling Irina to duck with the blow. She ducked and Karon launched his sword at Ronan. The sword was already literally in Ronan's face. He put his sword in front of him, blocking the blow. Ronan thought to himself that they worked well as a team. He then pulled back a bit. Ronan turned his attention to something. Behind him, Brahm was already standing with his huge sword raised upwards. He asked Ronan why he had started all this. Brahm took a swipe and said he wanted a serious battle with him. Ronan looked at him and thought his blow was very strong and confident. They attacked alternately and without respite. While Brahm lowered his sword, from the other side, the other three sophomores ran at Ronan. But Ronan simply disappeared from Brahm's strike. And it turned out that he just hit the floor. No one could understand what happened. But Ronan was already behind them. Irol appreciated his speed. Ronan made sure they were all hit with their own weapons. Ronan thought to himself, Filion is impressive. They went down. Ronan turned around. Brown told him that he really was tough. Ronan smiled and said he hadn't lost his fighting spirit. He readied his sword and said that since that was the case, he would be serious until the end. Brown and Ronan took a swing. He turned his attention to Ronan's stance. Ronan was about to take a swing. This stance was one-to-one -one like Navarro's instructor's stance. Ronan smiled. He leaped behind Brown, thereby destroying his sword. Ronan stood and said he had learned a lot from them. He looked at them and called them elders. Shards of the sword lay on the floor. The battle had stopped. Iral was in shock. The other people were also looking at it with their mouths open. Everyone started shouting about how incredible this rookie was. At first people thought he was losing, but then they realized that it was nothing like that. People wondered if this guy was definitely a first-timer. Nasto looked at her broken sword and said that she had nothing to object since she was no match for him. They couldn't understand where Ronan came from like that. They called him a real monster. Ronan turned around. Ronan looked at Iral crying with happiness and thought about how she could definitely not worry about him now. Then he thought about what to do now. Ronan looked at the dejected elders and said that he had learned a lot from them. The boy bowed slightly and said that he had learned a lot from them. Ronan said that he amidst the joy of enrollment was a little over the top, but they are much stronger than he thought. Ronan thanked them for taking the challenge. Maria and Azil heard it and were shocked at what he was saying. He asked them to forget about his rudeness today and said that he hoped he could learn a lot from them in the future. The guys stood with their broken weapons in their hands and were shocked at such a speech. They glanced over at each other. Brow said that he thought he was an asshole at first, but then he realized that he was not only strong, but well-mannered. He took Ronan's hand and said he didn't need to be humble. Brown said Ronan was absolutely fair to win because of his skills and asked him to act more confident. He held his hand up and said that's what Filion is all about. Brown winked at him and said that Ronan showed incredible skills. Ronan smiled and told him that he was spunky not just in battle. Ronan looked at his crying sister who was telling him that he had really grown up. He thought about the fact that now he had shown her his social skills as well, so now she should definitely not doubt him. Some girl was watching from below. She said Ronan was very interesting. They went back to the academy. It looked like they were having a banquet. Everyone was eating and socializing. Ronan said that he kept wondering when there would be a banquet to celebrate their admission. He looked around and said he didn't think it would be so grand. There were several long tables with tons of delicious food. Taking a piece of meat in his hand Maria said she told him that she told him that this was the most prestigious academy in the imperial capital and he shouldn't have expected anything less. Ronan said that was true and he even stopped surprising everything. Assel turned to Ronan and asked if he had already escorted his sister out. Ronan said yes. Ronan said she was too worried about him so he had to calm her down for a long time. Iral told him to eat well. Don't forget his letters. Don't fight with his friends and a bunch of other things. Ronan said he had sent Sita with her just in case, so he didn't have to worry about her. Assel was pleased that Ronan cared so much for his sister and Ronan smiled. Ronan reached for the meat and said it was time for them to find out how they were fed here. He wished everyone a good appetite and was about to take a bite, but Shelapan appeared behind his back and said that he was just enjoying his meal now. He then called out to him and Ronan turned around. Ronan got very angry and asked Shulapan what the hell he wanted now. 
Ronan while getting up accidentally broke a plate. Ronan put meat on the broken plate and asked Shulipan in a raised tone what he wanted him to do. Shulipan calmly said he didn't come to fight but to find out something important. Ronan interjected about the something important. Shulipan took out his notebook and asked where Lady Iroh's main base was and how far it was from the Imperial capital. Shulipan asked more and more questions. He asked if there were bandits there, what was the quality of the roads on the way to it and so on. Ronan didn't understand what he wanted. Shulipan asked if Ronan had taken care of the escort and said he was sure the guy had at least hired mercenaries. And said if not, he's worse than the inmates of Rodolin prison. Ronan got pissed and told the bastard he took care of everything and said someone more reliable than mercenaries was looking after her. He told Shulipan that he didn't have to worry, nothing would happen to her unless Wyvern or something like her showed up. Shulipan got mad, Ronan yelled at him and told this calmer to calm down. Ronan asked why the hell he was putting on this circus here and asked who the hell he was to her in the first place. Shulipan fell silent. And then in a trembling voice he said he was just worried for her safety, for her fate had crossed with his. It was his duty as a knight. Some girl came to them and said that they had put on an interesting show here. She asked the wolf Grenius since when did he become so talkative. Shulipan and Ronan looked at her. Shulipan asked what she needed from him. The girl's name was Elizabeth Akalusia. She was a freshman who was ranked first among the incoming students in the Faculty of Magic. She smiled and asked Granthia not to misunderstand her. She said that she was only interested in Ronan right now. She was only interested in him. Ronan looked at her with surprise. He asked again if it was definitely him. Ronan asked why all of a sudden and Shulipan was wary. He blew out a breath and said she was fed up with her evil hobby. She turned around and said he was done with his job, so he told her she could do whatever she wanted already. Shulipan turned to Ronan and said that he would send her a couple of his family's guards after all. Ronan told him to hurry up and leave already. Then someone came up to him and addressed him in a trembling voice. It was Asil. He said the same girl, that during the duel the girl was good. Ronan asked him not to remind him. But Asil continued, saying that she showed complete superiority. Her eyes were glowing and she had a staff charged with magic in her hands. She created some kind of explosion. Asil said she even overdid it. Elizabeth smiled and asked if he thought those who got naked needed to be taught a lesson. She asked Ronan if he knew what she meant. Ronan said he didn't and asked why she was here. Elizabeth said she was impressed with his talent. She said that was why she had come to make him one offer. Ronan asked what the offer was. She said it was an offer that even a petty criminal wouldn't even dare to dream of. She smiled and said it was a special offer and held out her hand with some kind of necklace. Ronan looked at it questioningly. He thought about the fact that it was an invitation from the Akalusia family. Akalusia, unlike other nobles that valued blood ties, to them was the main talent. Their family had nurtured many talents and because of that, they ranked as one of the pillars of the empire. To those who had potential, they gave the opportunity to become part of their family. Their symbol for this opportunity was an invitation to Akalusia. This was the invitation Elizabeth gave Ronan. Ronan asked if this thing could be handed out to people for nothing. Elizabeth smiled and said since he was asking that question he knew what it was. He looked closer at the invitation and said that he had just heard of it. Ronan was sitting on the floor of some camp. Someone held out their hand with the invitation and said this is it. Ronan asked if a commoner like him and soared this invitation could become part of the family. With this invitation in her hand sat the commander-in-chief and she said yes. Her name was Akalusia Adeshan. Adeshan said that first you have to pass a test from the head of the family, but for those who have the talent, it's not a problem. So she asked Corporal Ronan to keep that in mind. She said once he washed away the sins of accomplishment in this war, then he too could get that invitation. Ronan listened to her with his mouth open. Adeshan said it was because she thought he was talented. Ronan looked at this invitation in silence. Elizabeth said that since he is already aware of it, she doesn't see the point of explaining it all to him, she added that she hopes he will make the right choice. She also said that even if he was born a wolf, living among sheep, he would become one of them. Then she turned around and left with her boys. Asil standing behind Ronan exhaled and was glad she was gone. Ronan asked if it was true that geniuses always do what they want. Ronan thought to himself that it was good that he would be able to contact them now. She clutched the invitation in her hand and thought of accolation and felt that he could use them. Filion Academy values the abilities of the students in it more than anything else. Depending on your grades, your environment changes as well. The most glaring example of this is the dormitory system. All the middles get into the Netian Hall. Everyone gets a clean room there, an upscale cafeteria and the like. It's a pretty good dorm with everything you need. 
On the other hand, the 30% with the worst grades go to the Crater Hall. This dormitory looks like an ordinary farmhouse. And the first day in it usually starts with students shouting. Some guy in the crowd shouted what it means. The guy asked why they had to live in this crumbling shack. He yelled about how they were nobles and they needed at least a few servants. The one who escorted them here said in a calm voice that there were no workers in this hall. He said that each room accommodates four people. The cafeteria, showers and toilets are shared. Everyone was very surprised by this. The guy said that these are the rules of the academy and asked them not to look at him like that. He also said that they should study hard. Otherwise they would have to stay here for the next semester. And the last hall, where only 10% of the students are located. It was the Nabardas Hall. It was very big and beautiful. There was only one phrase to describe it. Ronan stood across from it and stared at it with his mouth open. He walked into a room that was all gold. Ronan said it was very rich. He was shocked that it was all done for the students. Ronan walked over to the table where there were pieces of paper and a quill in an inkwell. He looked at them and wondered if this was the course selection form they had told them about. Ronan picked up one of the sheets and wondered if he just needed to choose the courses he wanted to take. The first year you just have to adjust, so everyone said not to pick a lot. To Ronan all the courses looked very interesting, a classic mistake of freshmen who have hell ahead of them. He wondered what he should choose. It looked like Ronan had already chosen, he was glad he had. Ronan chose a lot of courses, he thought it was too much, but since he's at Filion, he felt he should take all the courses he wanted. The man named Abar, who was an instructor of basic imperial swordsmanship, said that Ronan didn't need to take any more courses. Ronan was surprised. He started to get worried. He asked what Abar meant since they had just started. The instructor said it was his words. He looked at the floor and said that they had just started. And Ronan had already learned all the basics of imperial swordsmanship techniques. Ronan wanted to object. He said that the academy rules allowed students to be excused once they had mastered the entire curriculum. Abar said that if Ronan stayed, he would demotivate the other students. The instructor told him not to get cocky, but to keep studying hard. Ronan stuck his sword in the sand and sat by the river with his legs tucked up. He was frustrated. He couldn't figure out what the hell, not only from imperial swordsmanship but from archery. And from monster hunting. He got angry and shouted that he had been kicked out of everything. He grabbed his head and said that this wasn't how he had imagined it. And someone behind him came up and said that he thought Ronan looked familiar and asked if he was supposed to be in class. Ronan turned around. It was the instructor Nabarosa. She said she understood and asked if Ronan had finished all the courses. He went up and asked if all the courses would be like that. Ronan said he expected better from Filion. Nabarosa looked at him and thought about the fact that she knew they were just freshman courses but to finish them all on the first day, but she figured that was to be expected. She remembered his battle with the seniors and thought about how it would only take Ronan one look to copy her technique. Maybe Rose said that as an instructor she couldn't turn a blind eye to that. She held out her hand and asked Ronan to give her his sword. He gave her his sword and asked what she wanted to do. Nabarosa told him that she would teach an important lesson. He then became wary and asked why she wanted to do this. Something started to happen behind him so he couldn't finish his sentence. Something was happening to the water. The drops started to rise up. She put the sword down and said that was all this piece of metal could do. Nabarosa said it couldn't be called a weapon, because it only prevented the boy from unleashing his powers. Ronan looked at his sword and listened to Nabarosa with his mouth open. She reached for her sword and told him to look carefully. She took the sword. Ronan was surprised. Nabarosa made a thrust. All the water went on Ronan. The water pressure was tremendous. The water went upwards. It rained. Nabarosa held the sword near Ronan's face. She put the sword in its sheath and asked if Ronan now realized what he was missing. A strong and sharp piece of iron, made for fighting enemies. It is desirable not to break it when using it, but even if you do, you can just get a new one. In other words it is a consumable item. Ronan looked at what was happening to the water and said that was what he thought. Until he saw it, the water had formed a kind of passage because it split in different directions. He watched and thought about how absurd it was. After all, Nabarosa had just changed his sword and made exactly the same swing. But the difference in its power was colossal. She said it took literally one breath and a tiny drop of strength. She said it seemed like a small thing, but on the battlefield it was the smallest thing that could cost someone's life, so wasting strength was certain death. Nabarosa said that moreover, if he uses mana, he just has to pick the right weapon, but she said he doesn't realize that. After all, he still doesn't use mana. 
Ronan clenched his fingers into a fist and asked if she knew that. Nabarosa replied that she did and she found it hard to believe that he was able to demonstrate such power without using mana. Ronan was a little upset. Nabarosa said that one day he would be able to use it. She smiled and said he would need a good weapon to do it right. She looked at him and said he was thinking hard. Nabarosa told him to come to her classes. Ronan was surprised. Ronan asked if he could. Nabarosa was about to leave, so she turned around and said yes, although her class was only open to sophomores and older guys, but she decided to make an exception for him. She asked Ronan to come with a normal weapon and not this piece of iron. Ronan looked at his weapon. Nabarosa added that it was a condition to get a pass to her class. There was a sign hanging where the word hammer was written three times. He asked if it was because of the meeting with instructor Nabarosa. Asil was standing there with Ronan and Marja and he finished his question if that was why he had come here on his first day off. Azil asked if this was the forge? The one Shulipan had recommended to him. Asil smiled and said that no matter how you look at it, it doesn't look good. Marja finished his sentence and said that it looks shabby. She added that she had a feeling that this forge would fall apart at her touch. Marja asked if the Grazia family was sure that they shopped in it all the time. Ronan smiled and said that they probably did. Ronan said they would find out when they got inside. They pulled the door open. There was a bunch of cobwebs. They stood at the entrance. Ronan said it was even worse inside. Ronan said that was strange, because Shulipan wouldn't lie. Someone with sharp claws came out of the door and asked who was making the noise. He also said he was actually asleep. Some creature stepped with his big foot. It looked like a wolf. It asked them who they were. The creature asked why they were making noise in broad daylight and asked them if they could see that the fire wasn't burning. They all stood there with their mouths open. The creature turned out to be a werewolf. He asked the assholes if they were deaf. Werewolf asked why they were here. He wanted to say something else, but Ronan held up Shulipan's family pass. Ronan said he was here to buy guns here. Ronan said Shulipan recommended this place to him and said they do things very well here. Werewolf turned his attention to the token. Asil was startled, while Maria and Ronan stood with a serious expression on their faces. Werewolf asked what he wanted from him and said he could shove that token up his ass, but it wouldn't make him one of the grunts, and Ronan was surprised. Werewolf yawned and told them to fuck off, because they weren't catering to kids, and Ronan got angry. But then he stopped. He licked his lips and said there was one option. He pointed at Asil and said they should give him his hand and maybe then he would agree. Azil hid behind Ronan while this blacksmith said he was hungry and he wouldn't turn down such a bounty. Azil started screaming and saying he didn't taste good. The werewolf opened its mouth so wide that Ronan could be seen there. Ronan took up his sword and called out to the stinking mutt. Ronan said he was out of line. Ronan stuck his sword into this werewolf. He screamed in pain. He then grabbed the spot where Ronan had hit him. Ronan looked at it and said he thought so, for the blow felt very strange. He asked where it came from. An armor formed on Werewolf and Ronan asked where it came from. The one looked at Ronan strangely as he said it didn't matter at all. He stood over him and said he could just break it. Werewolf asked him to stop. He said it was just a test. Ronan asked what kind of test it was. He said they always check the skills out of customers. Werewolf said he just wanted to air out his invisible armor, so he was a little over provocative. He tried to assure Ronan that he didn't mean to harm them. Ronan said that was a very original excuse. Ronan asked if he really wanted him to believe that. Werewolf said it would be strange if the blacksmith serving the Grazia family didn't have any checks. He also said that if Ronan didn't believe him, let him ask Shulipan later. Ronan put down his sword and said it was a very funny test of how painful it can be to die. Werewolf got up from his knees and said it was all his fault. He smiled and said he didn't mean to scare him at all. He told Azil that he didn't eat people, and that was a relief to Azil. The werewolf introduced himself and said his name was Didikin. He said he was still the gatekeeper here. Didikin asked what his name was. He told him his name was Ronan. He asked again if Ronan had come for the weapons. He then stepped with his foot and said he would lead them inside and ask them to follow him. He opened the door and said this was the entrance and so the real forge was inside. Didikin asked the boys if they were firmly on their feet. Then he pressed one of the bricks and told them to get ready. The gears started working. Didikin said that now they would see wonders and they started to go down. They went lower and lower. They looked up and Didikin was telling them that this elevator was made of magical stones and pulley. He said it was the fastest way to his forge. He said this place was the best and biggest forge in the empire. It was called Grand Cappadocia. The forge did look very large. Ronan looked at it all with his mouth open. He said that he couldn't believe that there was such a place underground. 
Denikin smiled and said that Ronan could be glad that he had passed his inspection, for only then would he take responsibility. Ronan looked up and Denikin said he would take him to the best artisan in Cappadocia. Then he said not just to the best artisan in Cappadocia, but to the best artisan in the empire. The blacksmiths were at work. They were making new swords, who would have ever thought there was such a huge forge under the capital? Ronan watched it all and said it was really incredible, Didikan said it was, but this forge only works on supplies for the royal family and nobles. Didikan said that there is no discrimination here, as the best craftsmen work here, but only one can be called the best. They came to the building and he said that the elder dwarf lived here, he was a master who had been smelting metal for 400 years. Didikan lifted his foot and said that this old man was quite stubborn but his skills were incomparable. He tapped his foot on the door and said loudly that he respected him. He asked what the elder was doing. Didikin walked into the building where a huge pile of various swords were lying around and said he had brought guests. He turned around and said he had the nerve to barge in and asked if it was Didikan. He said he asked him to be quiet when he was working and called him a bastard who doesn't listen to anything. Didikin asked what to do and said there were guns in front of the door so he could not open that door. Didikin told Elder Doric to clean the place up. The man told him he was whining too much for a youngster. Ronan and the others came in too. Doric said he had brought guests anyway and asked if they were not bad. Didikan said of course they were. He pointed his finger at Ronan and said he checked him out and called his sword skills just fine. Didikan said when he saw them he would just be shocked. The elder was surprised. He said he thought the guy looked like some kind of skank. He asked Ronan to demonstrate his skills because he would only be able to say something when he saw them. He took up his sword and said that he would show everything now. Doric looked at his used sword. He broke it in one blow calling it trash and asked how he had been carrying that weapon all this time. Maria, Assel and Ronan were surprised. Ronan got angry and asked the old man what he was doing. He pointed to a pile of swords lying in his room and told him to swing one of them, because with such a broken sword he would not be able to appreciate his skills. Doric said he would give him the sword he chose for free. Because any of those swords would be better than this piece of trash, and Ronan marveled. Then he looked at the smiling Dinikin. If he insisted, he said. Ronan took one of the swords and held it up. Ronan thought about how it did feel different. He squeezed it in his hand and thought about whether it really was different. He turned to Doran and told him that if he broke it, it wasn't his fault, and he told him that the important thing was that he tried and asked him to put all of himself into the sword. Ronan looked at his reflection in that sword. He remembered Nabarosa's strike. Ronan swung and got into a stance. The elder noticed his stance. Ronan took a swing. Something happened. It was like an explosion. The people standing outside couldn't understand. They looked and couldn't understand what was happening there. A hole formed in the room. A blast furnace exploded. Both Doran and Ronan were shocked. A huge breach had formed there. Ronan said he hadn't planned such a thing. The elder said the technique belonged to Nabarosa. He asked if he was an apprentice. Ronan turned to Doran and asked if he knew Nabirose, and he told him of course he did. He said he had made a sword for her. Ronan asked if the comically long sword was the one he had made, and Doran said yes. That sword was called the Secret Sword of Horus, he called it his masterpiece. Doran said that the sword that Ronan was holding in his hand now was no match for that sword, but he asked if he liked it, and Ronan said he did, because it was incredible to him. Ronan said he didn't think there was anything special about it, the elder told him that he should say that, for he thought Ronan was a newcomer who didn't know his own worth. Doric said he hadn't seen talent like that in a long time and tapped him hard on the back. But he said that great talent could also be a big problem because he would have a hard time forging a proper sword. He pointed to a crack in the spot and said that it was hard for him to withstand such blows. Ronan turned to him and asked what he should do then. Doric replied that ordinary materials would not withstand his strength and he would have to use a superior alloy and alloy it with a special material. He added that it would have to be a wyvern subproduct. Ronan queried about the subproduct. Ronan said he was unsure about it so he took it with him. Doran asked what it was. Ronan had a broken egg in his hand. Doran asked if it was an eggshell. He struck it with the hammer. Doran couldn't believe that the mithril hammer didn't leave a scratch on that eggshell. Doran couldn't believe that such a material existed. His eyes lit up and he asked if he could really use such a precious material. Ronan said it was useless to him, so yes. Ronan asked if it would be enough to make a sword. Doran said yes and told him to come back in a week or two. Doran said he would make the best sword in the empire. Ronan smiled and said he would wait. While Ronan was talking to him Marja and Azil were looking at something there. 
Ronan turned to Maria and Asil told them that since they were here he told them to go to the other masters, the guys got very excited. Dorig said he couldn't kick them out empty-handed and said if they said they were from him the other masters would take care of them. Doran raised his sword and said he could take care of it himself. But right now he didn't want to be distracted. It was a beautiful sound, he said. Ronan thought to himself, this old man is crazy. Torches were burning. Someone had said the people above them were so loud and it annoyed him terribly. He wasn't alone. He said he wanted to burn out of everyone there. Another answered him and told him to be patient as it wasn't time to expose himself yet. He lifted his head up and said that there was not long to wait. Starting with these ignorant blacksmiths. To the entire empire. They were standing in front of some kind of walled up monster and there were a bunch of stone statues all around them and one of them said that the day would soon come when everything would be buried in streams of light. A few days later. Ronan walked down the street with his hands behind his head. The old man, considered the best blacksmith in the empire, said he would personally make a sword for him. Asil and Marja had also placed orders with the blacksmiths and it looked like they had hit a snag. But that wouldn't be their problem. After all, it would be him, and Shulopin, who would be paying for sure. There was only one problem, it would take about half a month to create the sword. Ronan walked down the street and tried to think of something to do to kill time, because Azil and Maria were in class. After briefly thinking about it Ronan turned his attention to the building he had come to. He turned his head and thought it was a training hall for high school students. It was the Hall of the Galilean. Instructor Nabarosa seems to hold her classes here. Ronan doesn't come to her classes because she said to acquire a normal weapon first. But since he already has a temporary sword, he asked for something, but he didn't have time to say anything because he saw the instructor. He turned to her and addressed her in a trembling voice. She immediately grabbed his ear. Ronan cried out in pain. Navarosa said they hadn't seen each other in a long time. She told him to come back as soon as he had a weapon. So she was wondering what he had been doing all this time since he only came now. She asked him if he had been truant. Ronan immediately began to deny it. He said he had his reasons. Nabiros didn't care. She dragged him along saying she would listen to his excuses along the way. Ronan shouted that he supposedly understood everything and begged her for mercy to no avail. Some girl turned her attention to them. She was standing by the window holding a stack of papers. The girl wondered what the noise was. She wanted to ask what the noise was, but the guy shoved her and told her to get out of the way. The girl apologized, and Cardan said she was supposedly too retarded as a teacher's assistant. He told her to stay focused and get ready for class, then called her a dope. The girl kept picking up papers that had scattered when he pushed her, and she agreed in a shaky voice. And then walked away. Arena number one. The instructor was introducing Ronan to the others. Many might already know him. After all he had made quite a noise at the admission ceremony. Maybe Rose said she would introduce him to them again anyway. Nabarosa called him an asshole and then informed him that he would be attending classes with the rest of the boys starting today. When Ronan was finally given the floor, he introduced himself, but in person, and then said that he was a first-year martial arts student. It was nice to meet the seniors. The other students started discussing the new guy. They were discussing his second place in the rankings. Someone asked if he was really good looking and a girl told him that he looked like a fop. Ronan was pissed that everyone started discussing him. He thought about what he was hearing those bastards say. But still some of the guys he was glad to see. Nasto and Brown. But there were some who were just the opposite. And that was our favorite Shulapan. Ronan was sure he would have fun with his new circle of people. The very girl with the papers abruptly burst into the arena. She began to account for being late. To Ronan that voice sounded very familiar. The girl asked Nibiros if she had missed much, to which the instructor told her not to worry, just to catch her breath. Nabarosa said that she had just finished introducing the newcomer, so the girl hadn't missed anything. The girl asked if it was the boy everyone was talking about. The girl said she was very pleased to meet him. She later said that she was from the second year of the martial arts department and was also Nabarosa's assistant instructor. Ade Shan. She introduced herself, and then she extended her hand in a sign of respect and desire to get along with him. Ronan realized it was the commander-in-chief. Akalushia Ade Shan. She was renowned for her exceptional ability to command and she was the first female commander-in-chief. She ruled the battlefield with her coolness and outstanding leadership skills. She was nicknamed the Iron Lady. Everyone who had been under her command said that her veins ran not with blood but with red-hot iron. Ronan looked at her and pondered the fact that he would never have thought the commander-in-chief could do that. He watched her smile and thought about how he never would have thought she could smile like that. 
Ronan looked at her and thought that he could see by her that she didn't have any memories from her past life and he could see the real her. Ronan remembered her request. A long time ago she had asked him to tell her not to do anything stupid and just become a dressmaker. Ronan didn't know what to do. It was very difficult for him, but that was not what he was worried about right now. Some guy asked Adeshan to look at his rack. The girl replied him that she would look at it now. On the other hand she was told about the towel smelling very strange. Adeshan said with a smile that she will bring it now. She was darting back and forth and fulfilling everyone's requests and Ronan couldn't understand why everyone was harnessing her like this. He thought about her being forced into a servant role. Ronan wondered if a teacher's assistant should even be doing such a thing. Someone approached Ronan and asked if he was bored. He asked him if they could spar if he was okay with it, and Ronan's back turned to him. Ronan turned around to him and asked why all of a sudden, Cardin apologized for such a surprise. The guy introduced himself and said he was a third year. He smiled, scratched the back of his head and said that he had heard that he had performed incredibly well at the entrance ceremony. Cardin said that if that was true he would like to duel with him and learn something. Ronan answered him and said that he was busy for now. Cardin smiled and said he was a fool for forgetting his weapon and also offering a duel. Cardin called Adeshan a loser and said to bring him a practice spear. The girl immediately agreed. Ronan didn't understand the prank. He was really angry with him. The girl held out her hand to him with the spear. Cardin started yelling at her and saying that she is a dope because she brought him the wrong spear. Adeshan got scared and started apologizing. Cardin continued to mock her. He hit her and asked her how an assistant can be so brainless. Cardin said that she doesn't even have the right to come to class and was only allowed in because she tearfully begged Nabarosa for it. Adeshan kept apologizing. Then someone grabbed that spear. It was Ronan. Cardin asked Ronan why he was interfering. Ronan said that he wanted to have a duel right now like he wanted. He said if the man refused, he didn't know what he would do to him. Cardin started to ask what he was talking about. Ronan looked at him and called him a freak and said they should fight. Cardin and Ronan held a spear to this. Cardin asked Ronan again what he said. He asked if he heard him correctly and asked why he suddenly changed so quickly. Ronan was silent, and Cardin told him not to say it was because of that fool. Then pointing to Adeshan, Cardin asked if Ronan knew her. Or are they both commoners? The guy made a pathetic look and asked if they were dating. Ronan let go of his spear. He took up his sword and told Cardin to close his mouth and try to block his blows. He also added that it was only if he didn't want to die. Ronan threw a punch, but Cardin did his best to block it. Cardan couldn't understand what the hell. Ronan can be so strong without using mana. The spear started to break because of Ronan's great strength. Ronan threw Cardan aside. Ronan said that since Cardan was whining so much about not wanting to use the long spear, he decided to shorten it for him. The spear was broken in half. Ronan asked if he liked it. Cardan got angry and called him a bastard. He asked how dare he even. He swung around and asked if he had forgotten his place. Cardin asked if he thought he was going to get out of here in one piece. The spear was literally at Ronan's face. But suddenly the point of the spear broke. And then the rest of the spear broke into small pieces. Cardin was shocked. Ronan was calm. He said that Cardin had better only worry about himself. Ronan took many blows at him. Then punched him in the face. Then in the stomach. He swung again and knocked Cardan out. He hit clearly on the chin. Cardan went down. Ronan said he was lucky they were in the academy. Because if they were outside, Ronan would have finished him off by now. The guys watching couldn't understand how Cardan could lose, since he was the best among the third-year students. Then Ronan turned to the others. He raised his sword and pointed it at the girl, calling her a rude scum with a towel. Ronan said if it stinks then let her wash it. She should deal with it herself and why the hell should she stress others over such trivialities? He was about to call Adeshan the commander-in-chief but he didn't finish. Ronan asked if the teaching assistant was a servant to them or what. The girl started stuttering and crying. He called her and said he will fix her nose so that she won't be disturbed by such things again. Adeshan asked Ronan to stop. She stood in front of that girl and said that everything is fine as it is. Ronan didn't let her finish and asked her to get out of the way. He said he can tolerate a lot but not these idiots. He thought about how he wouldn't bitch about her being looked down upon. He thinks that at the very least no one in this empire should look at her like that. The girl was very embarrassed. He pushed Adeshan back slightly and said that he won't stop until he tears those bastards to shreds. Then the instructor intervened and asked him to stop. Ronan stopped. Nabarosa said she wouldn't blame him for what happened during the fight, because it happens often enough. 
Nabarosa said that if he continued to cause trouble, she wouldn't let him get away with it. She asked the guy to drop the sword and step back, but his body didn't move. The guy heard something and turned around. He saw a snake. But then he realized that it wasn't an ordinary snake. It was Nabarosa's aura, the unique holy sword. Nabarosa stood in front of him and said that what Ronan was trying to do was not a duel. She said she would not allow such a mess. Ronan said on second thought, she knew how her assistant was being treated. But still she continued to stare at it in silence. Nabarosa said it was only their business and asked the guy to mind his own business. Nabarosa said in a serious tone that it was a final warning. But Ronan didn't seem like he was going to do that. Ronan said that if she was a former sword saint or whatever, it wouldn't change his answer, but he wouldn't put the sword away. Ronan sent her off. Navy Rose said there was no choice then. She used the crushing snake. Ronan fought back. Ronan turned to the commander-in-chief and said he asked her some more. He asked why she volunteered to command in this war when everyone else had scattered. Adeshan said that one day he would realize that there is destiny in the world. She turned around and said that everyone has won. He reached for his sword and asked what she was thinking when she answered like that. Ronan was lying on the floor. Adeshan stood in front of a mountain of corpses. Ronan asked what kind of weight she had put on her shoulders. The commander-in-chief told Corporal Ronan that she was truly sorry. She turned to him and told him not to forgive her for anything. For dumping this burden on him. And then she was gone. Ronan cried out, no. He got out of bed. Someone asked him what was wrong. She asked if he had a nightmare. He sat next to Adeshan and thought about the fact that it was the commander-in-chief. He couldn't help but stare at the Grand Commander while she stares back at him. Ronan called Adeshan Grand Commander when he woke up. Adeshan was surprised to hear this. She asked Ronan about what he was talking about. Ronan laughs and tells Adeshan that he made a mistake. He tells her not to worry about it. Adeshan was very confused by Ronan's behavior. Ronan then asked her if he is currently in the clinic. Adeshan told him that he is. She told him that Navarro's asked her to bring him here. She revealed to Ronan that Navarro's said that she will correct his behavior in the supplementary classes. When Ronan heard this, he immediately knew that he he messed up and Navarro's was going to kill him. After passing on Navarro's message, Adeshan asked Ronan if he was angry for her sake when he fought Navarro's. Ronan was startled when he heard Adeshan's question. He looked away from her and told her that the reason he fought is because he is an upright gentleman who values manners a lot. Adeshan immediately knew that Ronan was lying when he said this. She told him that he is a bad liar. She told Ronan not to hate Cardan and the other students too much. She said that she understands why they treat her like that. Ronan was shocked to hear this. With an angry look on his face, Ronan told Adeshan that she did not do anything wrong other than working hard as a teaching assistant. He asked her why she is even a teaching assistant in the first place. Adeshan was surprised to hear this question. Ronan told Adeshan that he understands the fact that Navarro's allowed the students to misbehave because they are young and they got caught up in the moment, but he will never accept the fact that an instructor turned a blind eye to the evil deeds of her students. He asked Adeshan if she was not angry with Navarro's. Adeshan smiled and told Ronan not to misunderstand anything. She told him that the reason Navarro's turned a blind eye to her situation is because she asked her to. Ronan was shocked to hear this. He thought Adeshan was spouting nonsense. Adeshan told him that she is enjoying privileges that she does not deserve. She revealed to Ronan that one has to reach the level of sword expert to attend Navarro's class, but even after taking a one-year leave from school, she can barely control any aura. Ronan was surprised to hear this. He could not believe that Grand Commander Adeshan, who had such an incredible aura on the battlefield, also had a time when she was powerless. Adeshan told Ronan that she asked Navarro's to turn a blind eye to whatever treatment the students gave her. She asked for this favor because she did not want to burden Navarro's, who accepted her as her teaching assistant. She told Ronan that she is enjoying a lot of privileges, so she has to pay the price for it by enduring any humiliation. The lady also told Ronan that she can handle it, so he should not worry. She thanked Ronan for what he did for her. She told him that she used to believe that she had gotten used to the trivial things, but today it was a bit painful for her. The room was then filled with silence. Ronan asked Adeshan if the reason she is going through such links is because she wants to become a grand commander. Adeshan was surprised to hear this. She did not understand how Ronan was able to find out about her goal. With a smile on her face, she told Ronan that her dream is to become the Grand Commander of the Empire. She told him that while her dream may sound stupid coming from someone who has not reached the level of a sword expert, she does not plan to give up. She told Ronan that she is confident in military science and tactics, and she is working hard to reach her goal. After saying this, she realized that it is already time for her next class. She told Ronan to take a good rest before going back to class. Ronan thanked her for watching over him, Adeshan smiled and told him not to worry about it. After saying this, she left. When Adeshan left the clinic, Ronan remembered her last moments. He remembered Adeshan telling him that if they ever meet in the past, he should advise her to stop trying to become a grand commander and just focus on tailoring. With a smile on her face, she told 
told Ronan that she has done a lot of things, but she has never tried tailoring. Ronan was in a dilemma. He did not know how to tell Audacian to give up on her dream and try being a tailor. A few days later, Ronan, Asil, and Mary all went to the forge that led to the entrance of Grand Carpadoki. This was because Doran told them that he wanted to see them, but when Ronan and his friends arrived at the entrance of the forge, there was nobody there. Ronan was angry to see this because Doran sent him a letter through a carrier pigeon in the middle of the night. Doran wrote that he has created a masterpiece and he wants them to come over to get it. While looking around, Ronan accidentally steps on a helmet. He kicked the helmet away in anger and said that the forge is too dirty. He could not believe that they treat customers so poorly. Maria was surprised by how Roman reacted. She asked Assel why Roman is so sensitive these days. Assel said that he has no idea why Roman is so angry. Roman told his friends that they have to go to the forge themselves. Assel and Maria were surprised to hear this. Maria asked Roman if he is allowed to do such a thing. Roman reminded Maria that Doran was the one who asked them to come see him. He told her to stop talking and follow him. They stepped into the elevator, and Ronan pressed the secret button. The room started moving and Ronan claimed that he was right, while the elevator was going down. Ronan said that Doran is an old man with poor customer service. He said that he will deal with Doran once he meets him. Maria and Assel could not believe how insane their friend was. As the elevator moved further down, Ronan saw something that shocked him. The whole grand carpet doki was engulfed in flames. Ronan did not understand what was going on. He looked around and found people lying unconscious on the ground. Assel immediately called Ronan's attention and pointed something. The rock giant was chasing after the blacksmiths. Ronan did not understand why rock giants would be in the forge. Assel asked Ronan for their next course of action. Ronan grabbed Assel by his waist and carried him up. He put his leg on the elevator rails and prepared to jump. Assel was very confused by the situation. As for Maria, Ronan told her to go back up and bring any master or soldier she can find, and she immediately complied. RMC then jumped down from the elevator. He asked Assel to use his telekinesis. Assel immediately used a skill called Invisible Hand. The scene shifts, and we see the blacksmiths about to get crushed by a rock giant. The creature that was still on a rampage held its hands up high. Fortunately, Ronan jumped over the giant and destroyed its hand when he landed on the ground. The creature didn't expect this and it was still confused. Ronan addressed the blacksmiths and said that there is a lot on his mind these days and his head is a bit stuffy. With a terrifying look on his face, he told the giant that it chose the wrong day to attack this place. The rock giant was not even intimidated. It used its other hand to attack Ronan. It swung its fist towards RMC. Meanwhile, this guy was not moving. He maintained his serious expression. But when its hand got close to Ronan, he suddenly vanished. Ronan dodged the attack and jumped on the giant's hand. He used this opportunity to leap off the giant's shoulder, and in a split second, he destroyed its head. The creature had no way to process what really happened. The head fell down and it still created a massive explosion along the area. The blacksmiths who Ronan saved could not believe that someone as young as Ronan could defeat a rock giant in one blow. They also recognized him as the one who came to Elder Doran last time. RMC then got their attention. He climbed on top of the giant and asked the blacksmiths for an explanation. Ronan was now hoping to find out what the hell was really going on. Their conversation then went on, but this time, Assel was already with them. RMC can't believe what the blacksmiths had told him. Dozens of rock giants barged into the forging groups. The blacksmiths said that they do not know why the rock giants attacked them. They came out from somewhere underground and destroyed everything as they saw fit. They killed and captured several blacksmiths including Doran. After capturing some blacksmiths, they went back to where they came from. The old men also informed RMC that Didacon also chased after them but given that the werewolf was not good in fighting, he might also be in trouble. Ronan's expression quickly shifted as he knew that those who had been chasing him were not the ones who had been captured could immediately become the food of the rock giants. After hearing about the situation, Ronan stood up and asked the blacksmiths if the giant he killed was the last one. The blacksmiths said yes. Ronan then ordered Assel to check for other injured people with Maria. He also told Assel to heal anyone they find. He asked her to take Sita with him to assist him in healing. Assel was shocked to hear this. He asked Ronan what he was going to do. He told Assel that he is going to save the captured blacksmiths, especially since he has something he wants to get from Doran. The scene shifts and we see Elder Doran holding a sword while shaking in fear. He told Didacon that while he is grateful that he came to save him, it will be better for Didacon to run away. Two rock giants were forcing their way through an enclosed space in order to get to Doran and Didacon. Upon seeing the situation at hand, Doran urged Didacon to run away quickly. He told Didacon that he will be able to survive with his invisible armor. The werewolf had enough of it and shouted to Elder Doran to shut up. He told him that things are already tough for him as it is, so he does not need Doran to be spewing some nonsense. With an angry look on his face, Didacon 
Didacon told Doran to swing his sword if he had the strength to say such ridiculous things, but Elder Doran told Didacon that he cannot swing this sword because it is his best masterpiece, with wide eyes filled with wonder. He mentioned that he didn't want to spoil the sword with his not-so-great sword skills. Didacon called Doran a quirky old man upon hearing this. He told Doran that this is not the moment for him to act crazy about swords. While they were talking, the rock giants had slowly managed to break the place they were hiding in. They had finally entered. A rock giant held its gigantic hand up high and was already targeting them. The next thing we saw was that the hand had already hit the ground with tremendous force, but something seemed to stop the gigantic hand. Elder Doran thought that they were going to die, but something surprised him. Didacon had managed to block the giant's attack, but even with this feat, the werewolf clearly took significant damages. Didacon could also tell that all the functions and benefits that his armor provided him got destroyed in one hit. The rock giant started to retreat its hand, and while he was thankful for surviving that attack, Daikon thought that he should have done everything he wanted in life. The werewolf was so busy contemplating life that he didn't notice something that moved swiftly near them, and as he thought that he still had so many regrets in life, someone appeared right behind the rock giants. This person was also wielding a sword. The werewolf was then frozen in shock as he witnessed something incredible in front of him. Multiple red slashes were seen, and these attacks were done in a split second. Slowly, the rock giants had crumbled towards the ground. A voice was also heard and it praised Didacon for doing a great job. The person that just defeated multiple rock giants was none other than Ronan. He also told him that he can now rest easy as he will be handling everything. Elder Doran and Didacon were very surprised to see Ronan standing in their front. The werewolf asked Ronan how he was able to get to this place because there are a lot of giants along the way. Ronan smiled and told Didacon is the one who killed all the rock giants. In the process, he also saved the remaining blacksmiths. Didacon and Doran could not believe what they heard. Didacon wondered if such a thing was possible. Ronan then stretched his hand out and asked Doran to give him the new sword because his current sword is already ruined and cannot be used anymore. Apparently, our MC had heard the old blacksmith say that this thing was his masterpiece. That was the time he found out that it was really his sword. Elder Doran asked Roman to take it. The old man also added that the hilt is still incomplete but the sword was already usable. Our MC smiled and thanked him for the sword. He took a stance and unsheathed the sword. He wondered how good his new sword really is. The moment he did this, more rock giants entered the cave they were in. The giants rushed to attack Ronan. Our MC didn't move immediately as he was still thinking about testing the sword by using a light swing. The simple movement he had done had created a massive red slash. These creatures were stunned to see such a powerful attack coming towards them, and upon hitting the rock giants, they were all blasted away. Ronan was completely amazed by the level of power the sword possessed. Didacon was very surprised to see what happened while Elder Doran was extremely happy with his creation. Ronan wondered about the weapon he was holding. Elder Doran then approached our MC and asked him if he liked La Mancha. Ronan was surprised by the name of the weapon. Doran told him that he got the name from his favorite daydreamer. With an excited look on his face, Doran told Ronan that the sword is so light that you can barely feel the weight on. Your hands and the material is sturdier than mithril so it can withstand all swordsmanship. This old blacksmith added that he didn't even cast it any enchantment on the weapon but it had already possessed a powerful trait. La Mancha then began to sack the blood of the dead rock giants. Doran revealed to Ronan it has the ability to restore the damage it has taken by absorbing blood. Ronan wondered if the reason La Mancha has this ability is because it is made out of Cetus eggshell. After that, our MC told Doran that he is more amazing than he expected. Doran told Ronan that he is glad that he likes the sword. Meanwhile, Didacon was confused by the situation. He could not believe that Ronan and Doran were complimenting each other in their current situation. He told Ronan that they are the only blacksmiths left so it is better they get out of this cave. Ronan was relieved to hear this, but instead of coming along, Ronan told Didacon to take Elder Doran out of there. He said that he has something he needs to check. Didacon asked Ronan about what he wanted to check. This guy took a deep breath and said that it was nothing much, with a menacing look on his face. Ronan said that there is a rat hiding in this place, and the rat is a very big one. Along with it, there were two mysterious beings guiding it. Didacon didn't get the metaphor that Ronan meant. He got confused hearing the word rat. This werewolf then asked our MC to explain more about it. Ronan revealed that he knew something was off. He further discussed that he knows a lot of things about the rock giants and these creatures were not known for mobbing or attacking anyone. As a matter of fact, they were considered well-behaved. After that, Ronan touched the rock giant. It then started to vibrate and it startled Elder Doran and Didacon. There's something unusual at the back of the heads of the rock giants. A few seconds later, a magic circle appeared and Ronan told them that this was the first time he had seen one from these creatures. Our MC asked Elder Doran to inspect it but the old man revealed that he was not quite familiar with these kinds of things. But he mentioned that the reverberation of the mana 
of this magic circle was quite crafty. Sweat fell down his face as Elder Doran revealed that this was the reason why the rock giants went wild. He wondered who did this and Ronan also seemed to have no idea. Our MC's expression changed into more grim as this topic was brought up. He looked at the footprints of the rock giants and told everyone that this was something that they needed to find out. The underground cave continued to emit this chilly aura. Ronan followed the footprints and dashed towards the inner part of it. He thought that he was still not sure about it but he had noticed something while looking at the footprints of the rock giants. There were some footsteps that were much smaller which confirmed that there should be humans that headed the same way. He also encountered some defense system type mana stones so these ones were protecting something. As he found more clues along the way, Ronan figured that this attack was planned out. A few seconds later, something stopped him in his tracks. Ronan heard people's voices talking, he then slowly this place and hid himself. He wanted to find out the identities of these people. His expression turned grim as he peeked, and that was because of this thing that shone and glowed in a bright gold color. It was like a rock giant but unlike the normal ones, it was filled with gemstones. Ronan also saw two people in white robes that were standing in front of it. He immediately thought that whoever these two were, they were the ones responsible for the chaos that just happened. But the most important thing was the creature in front of them RMC even compared. The previous rock giant he defeated to look like children compared to this monster. Ronan thought that the creature was still sealed as it was not moving. But it will really be a problem when it starts wreaking havoc. He was also startled when he heard one of the mysterious people mention one intruder. The other one asked if his comrade was certain about it. And the other one confirmed it because the brainwashing connection he casted on the rock giants got disconnected. They said the person who casted the spell was a lady with blonde hair. And the other one was a guy with red eyes. The guy commented that it was unusual for the empire to act this fast. He then inquired on what they should do next. They were already out of rock giants to control and they still can't operate this gigantic creature. And since they ran out of options, he suggested that he should just go and take care of the pests himself. This guy had this intimidating expression and ominous aura kept on seeping out from him. The lady addressed him as Edwin, and she agreed since they have destroyed most of the surrounding facilities that will greatly affect the output of the empire's weapon manufacturers. She also emphasized that if their identities were to be revealed, a certain person they knew won't sit still. This was also the time her name was mentioned. The name of the blonde lady is Cirilla, and she suggested that they should now clean up and leave this place. Speaking of cleaning up, Edwin asked her if he can now get rid of something. Cirilla agreed. The one that Edwin was talking about was none other than Ronan. Our MC's expression quickly changed as he found out that these two mysterious people already sensed his presence. Edwin announced that he found this out because of the smell of the smith's sulfur. This guy then immediately casted a fireball and threw it towards Ronan. Our MC was not able to react right away as he didn't expect these two to discover him this quickly, but since he had no other choice, he gritted his teeth and prepared himself. A massive explosion was then seen along the area. Edwin let out a laugh as he commented that this situation was kinda unexpected. As the dust settled, Ronan's eyes exuded an intimidating glare, seeing him unscathed. Edwin wondered who the hell was this kid right in front of them. The area around our MC was still filled with flames. This guy then commented that our MC was quite agile since he was able to dodge his fireball spell. And while talking, Edwin casted another set of fireballs. He asked Ronan if he should tie his feet first. Ronan stared at the incoming attack. He figured that if his enemy was able to materialize magic this fast, he isn't the average guy. Edwin stepped forward and asked him another question. He inquired how Ronan was able to get in this place as the defense system they had set up was not easy to break through that easily. But our MC didn't answer their question. Instead, he made a question as well and asked who they were. Ronan even teased them that even though they were so eager to meet each other, this place was too extreme for that. And since Ronan had the time to make a joke, Edwin humored him and told Ronan that it will be more fun if they will kill him right now. Cirilla then commented that they were just wasting more time. But this guy just smiled and requested for Cirilla to allow him to have some fun as there isn't much time left. He was talking about the Empire and with a maniacal way. He exclaimed that this place will be soon buried in starlight. As soon as Ronan heard this comment, something clicked and his expression changed. He remembered something that changed his whole life. To be buried in starlight was the same comment as what Ahayuth said to him before dying. The playful voice of Ronan was now gone. He then asked Edwin again to repeat the words he just said. All Ronan could feel right now was wrath. Even the nerves in his face were already popping. This was because those exact words meant something to him in the past. The smug expression that this guy had also changed as he felt that the aura coming from his enemy also turned into something grim, wielding his sword. Our MC told them that they needed to come with him. He exclaimed that he had a lot of questions to ask. Edwin smirked as he heard Ronan's request. He also wondered if Ronan even had the strength to capture both of them. He then formed another fireball onto his palm as he addressed our MC. Edwin was just about to ask Ronan if he thought that it was really possible, but his words were stopped as Ronan dashed towards him and severed his arm. The attack happened so fast that it took Edwin a few seconds to process things. This was also the time when Ronan answered his question that it was really indeed possible for him to capture them. With a more annoyed expression on his face, Ronan told them to just become obedient or else they would feel bad. Edwin groaned in pain as he fell on the ground. He also tried to reach for his other arm. Meanwhile, Cyril also needed some time to get a hold of herself.
herself, she can't believe that even her comrade was not able to react, and while she was lost in thought, a hand suddenly appeared in her vision, Ronan gripped her neck, he didn't spare Cyril even though this lady was already chalking, Ronan then stared at her and told her to obediently answer his questions unless she wants to end up like Edwin, even with her throat being held tightly, Cyrilla still mustered her strength to speak, a bright yellow light covered her body, she got to cast a spell called Mana Shield, and this immediately pushed our MC back, but this didn't even intimidate Ronan, he just took this as her answer on not going to be obedient, he also took a glance at his hand as it was still trembling, he noted that the shield was quite sturdy, the only problem was it was not enough to withstand the attack that he just launched, two red slashes were now coming on Cyrilla's way, based on her expression, she clearly didn't expect that her mana shield would just be shattered by a mere student, and just like that, Ronan landed a decisive wound towards the speech, she coughed blood as she screamed in pain, our MC had this soulless stare at Cyrilla as he found out something about her, it was revealed that this lady right here is a half-elf, her ears were quite noticeable, Ronan took note of this and wondered how she got associated with Edwin, and while Ronan was busy with Cyrilla, a weird thing was starting to form behind him and also gathered flames around it, the next thing our MC knew was that he heard a voice that said explosion, a massive fireball was also coming his way, but this surprise attack didn't catch him off guard, he quickly turned his attention to a magic spell, he swung Lamb Manchet and it exuded a powerful slash that cut the massive fireball, the cut fireball then headed towards the massive creature behind them, dust then covered the area, Ronan wondered how this thing was possible, he was sure that he just cut his limbs, the one he was referring to was now covered with this brown substance that kept on taking its form, it was none other than Edwin. this guy just regenerated his body parts and he was now ready for action, our main character thought that it was quite an unpleasant sight, Edwin was clearly annoyed at how the situation had turned out, he also exclaimed towards Ronan to get away from Cyrilla, the atmosphere just became more tense, it was as if one wrong move would determine the course of their survival, Ronan was the first one to break the silence by stubbing Cyrilla on her leg, he told Edwin that he still hadn't gotten a grasp of the situation yet, seeing that his comrade will be in danger, this guy became more wary of his actions, he clearly hesitated as they were the ones in disadvantage, with a serious expression, Ronan made it clear that these two guys have messed up, our MC then repeated stubbing Cyrilla while giving Edwin options on what to do, he can either be obedient towards him on answering his questions or Ronan would give her a taste of amputation, he wondered if it would grow back just like Edwin's, this guy got rid of the fireball that he was casting and lowered his guard, Edwin has finally chosen to follow our MC, Ronan was glad to hear this, he commented that he wouldn't want more blood to be spilled, he looked at Cyrilla and added that it would be troublesome if these guys would just die, but something was clearly wrong, the innocent face that this half-elf had was gone, she had this sinister smile now, our MC wondered why she was smiling, and while thinking about it, a huge hand with glowing gemstones was already heading towards his way, Ronan was clearly caught off guard, he now questioned when she finalized and finished the seal, luckily, he was still able to use his sword and attempted to block the attack, but the force coming from a giant was powerful enough to send him flying, Ronan crashed on the ground, the impact was quite massive, the whole area was filled with dust once again, incomplete regenerated feet then emerged, it was from Edwin, he asked Cyrilla if she was fine, the lady said yes, and she noted that she owes him one, turns out, Edwin's massive fireball was just a diversion to distract Ronan's attention, and during their talk, Cyrilla managed to cast a magic spell that hindered our MC's perception, that was the time when she was able to activate the giant, but the thing was, its arm was the only thing she could control, she was still thankful that the surprise attack had done significant damage to their opponent, and just to make sure, Edwin told her that he will change, she checked and put an end to their opponent now, while still groaning in pain, Cyrilla reminded her comrade to still be careful, she remarked that Ronan was a monster with the face of a child, Edwin then reassured her that he wouldn't be careless, in his mind, he agreed with Cyrilla, the one they were fighting just about now was no mere child, he knew that if he wouldn't kill our MC now, he would be a huge threat to their organization later, dust was clearing out, and we could see that Ronan was still on his knees after that massive attack, our MC thought that he won't lose to someone like this, and then, he dashed and vanished in an instant, the next thing Edwin knew was that his limbs were all severed, Ronan continued by unleashing more slashes, this guy definitely played fruit ninja, no doubt, the regenerated body of Edwin fell on the ground, and while holding his sword tightly, Ronan asked them where they thought they were going, he gritted his teeth and exclaimed that he thought he made himself clear a while ago, Cyrilla was shocked after seeing that Edwin just got defeated in an instant, our MC told them again that he really has a lot of questions to ask, and the sound of his desperation filled Cyrilla with fear, she can't even move her body, instinctively, she moved and was about to cast a mana shield again just to protect herself, she's wondering how an injured student still moves, meanwhile, Ronan's body was already trembling, the strain that the previous surprise attack gave to his body was significant, but he uttered that he will never let them go, the moment he said this, something happened, it was as if the time froze, Ronan fell on his knees once again, the adrenaline that kept him fighting was slow 
slowly fading away. He struggled as he thought that his body won't even listen to him now. He was at his limit. Cirilla noticed this. She wanted to kill Ronan but she still can't guarantee if she could win this fight. She then decided that reporting this incident should be her first priority. The half-elf blonde lady casted a magic spell and a bright portal appeared. But before leaving, she turned around and talked to Ronan. She reminded him that their fight was still not over. Cirilla promised that she will find out everything about him and take them away. With a displeased look on her face, she stressed that she would begin by talking about Ronan's family, loved ones, and even his friends. Hearing threats like this was just a sensitive point for our main character. You guys all know how this would turn out. Mentioning harm to his family made Roman's expression turn serious. He thought to himself that he can't let this happen. He just barely managed to find a clue blue about the so-called angels that destroyed the world last time. In his mind, if these people could escape his grasp, all things will be the same. Roman still tried to stop Cirilla. He kept on shouting for this lady to not go. But then, a familiar voice was heard beside the shouts of Ronan. Someone that was holding this white sheathed sword and was emitting this green and deadly aura. This person also said the word stop. And unlike Ronan's pleas, Cirilla's body stopped. It was as if she was commanded to. Ronan turned his head as the voice told Cirilla that she also had a lot of questions. The person who came to the scene plans to have this lady answer them all first. Cirilla was still stunned. She knew that a predator was lurking. The aura of the unprecedented sword saint has completely lingered and enveloped the area, with an annoyed and furious expression. Naviros asked why the hell these people dared to touch her disciple. The whole place was then filled with silence. Instructor Naviros told Ronan that she had heard everything in detail and she praised him for doing such an amazing job, even with himself being beaten. Our MC still managed to smile and comment that Naviros timing. This lady right here was the backup that Miriam managed to get, and truth be told, she was more than enough to handle everything. Ronan told her that he was glad to see her in a place like this, but instructor Dr. Naviros just scoffed at him and remarked that since he was still able to blabber, she could assume that he was doing fine. Her calm expression then changed as she turned her attention to the blonde lady in front of her. Cirilla felt a chill down her spine as she heard Naviros saying that she will be dealing with them first. She trembled as she recalled the person whose aura could take the form of a snake and paralyzes the body of the opponent. This half-elf was puzzled why that person was here. Cirilla was just thinking of running away but Naviros' hand was already about to touch her. Her cheek was grabbed and she was not able to utter any magic spell. Naviros informed her that Cirilla had done things she shouldn't have. But what upset Naviros the most was that these individuals had just caused harm to her apprentice. This right here was a point of view of the half-elf blonde lady. Naviros just showed her the future that she wouldn't want to see. In front of them was a huge snake that opened its mouth and was ready to devour Cirilla. This one tried to escape but it was no use. She had no choice but to stare at the aura of Naviros. Her consciousness then slowly started fading away. In her mind, she apologized to the ones who were called stars. And just like that, Cirilla has completely fallen on the ground. Ronan stared at her blankly while Naviros once again commended him for holding these two mysterious people until she got there. As for the report that will be needed after this incident, Ronan would have to go to the principal himself. Our MC also asked his professor if the future she was referring to a while ago was the Lottalan prison. This waifu confirmed it and wondered how Ronan knew about this place and why he was asking about it. Ronan, on the other hand, was speechless upon hearing this information. The Lottalan prison was a place also known as the Fortress of Screams. It was built in the middle of the sea. It was notorious for interrogating criminals who have gone against the empire. They also use all sorts of means and methods just to receive any form of confessions. Ronan wanted to take this opportunity and then asked Naviros for something. He wondered if he could observe the interrogation that will be done towards these two. Naviros was just about to tell him that it was a ridiculous idea but then Ronan held her hand. He expressed his desire to go to that place once. Our MC pleaded and revealed that this is a really important problem to him. The sword saint didn't expect this from her disciple so she got speechless for a second. A few moments after the fierce battle, healers and backups from the empire have arrived at Grand Carpadoki. The whole place was still in a mess, but the great thing was all the injured people were being taken care of. Mara let out a sigh of relief as she witnessed that everyone was being dealt with now. Her state was quite more acceptable than Asil. The red-haired mage had been too busy healing and helping everyone out. Even Sito was exhausted, but even with his tired state, Asil was still worried about Ronan. He wondered if their friend was doing fine. As soon as he said those words, someone walked towards them and asked if someone called his name. These two were shocked upon seeing the person that called their attention. It was none other than their knight in dirty student clothes. Ronan, he greeted them and praised the efforts of his friends as he had heard all the things they have done to help the blacksmiths. Mara did her best to bring the backups as soon as possible. As for Asil and Sita, their mana got almost depleted just by saving over half of the craftsmen who were buried. Ronan then asked them if they were hurt somewhere, but his friends blurted out that he was not in a position to ask that question given the situation he was in. Asil and Sita even tried to cast a healing spell on him but Ronan declined. He stated that he had already received basic treatment a while ago. Our MC's attention was then shifted as he saw two people being transported. These were Cirilla and Eduin. They were still in a critical state but not life-threatening. Ronan gazed at them with his serious expression and told Maria and Asil that he still had 
something important to do, a few hours later, at the secret rendezvous for Lotalan's convoy. This place was called the Gringo Forest Cliff and a group of people had already gathered here. Navarros and Ronan could be seen positioned right in front of the group. The sword saint told Ronan that they're here while staring at something. Huge wings could now be heard flapping. The ones Navarros was talking about were these guys riding enormous bird-like creatures. These were the Lotalan's escorts. The bird has landed right in front of Ronan and Navarros, while Cirilla and Edwin were still tied and lying there unconscious. These guys immediately greeted and paid their respects to Professor Navarro's. Their presence alone was already emitting a dark and eerie vibe. And finally, the person in front, who seemed to be the one in charge, stated that they had come to escort the criminals. Navarro's then confirmed that the guys lying on the ground were the ones they came for. She warned the interrogators that the man has an incredible regeneration ability, something that they should be aware of while interrogating him. But the leader seemed pleased upon hearing this as it would really be helpful for their work. This guy even commented that such a fun object has come for the first time in a while. Lotalan's escorts then brought Cirilla and Edwin with them. The leader told Navarro's that they will be contacting her after the interrogation was over, and with a blank stare, this guy thanked Navarro's for her continuous work for the peace of the empire. After that, the escorts made their way back to Lotalan's prison. Ronan and Navarro's watched them as they slowly faded on their sight. The sword saint broke the silence and told Ronan that one week was more than enough for those guys to open their mouths. She'll inform him as soon as she hears back from the escorts. Navarro's reminded Ronan always to be ready to leave a moment's notice. Our MC knew that this was more than enough for now. He then thanked Navarro's for the opportunity. This guy was now closer to finding out some clues about the giant beings that destroyed the world in his previous life. After that, time moved quickly. The restoration of Grand Carpadoki proceeded immediately thanks to the support of the Empire. Ronan also returned and started his training with Navarro's. The supplementary class was really aimed at improving our MC's sword skills, and a few more days after that, in a distant land, something was happening inside the Fortress of Screams. Law to land, even along the hallways, pleas and screams could already be heard. The interrogation tools have also been set on one of the tables. In one of the rooms, one guy was busy picking the teeth of one of the criminals. The interrogator even commented that he got so absorbed that he almost forgot something. This one was talking about the arrival of his guests. It was business as usual. As usual on the Fortress of Screams, the interrogator had remembered his expected guests and he immediately went outside to greet them. It was Roman and Naviros. This old man politely introduced himself. He revealed that he was the one in charge of the new criminals that were brought there. He will also be their guide for today's visit. The old man gave a bright smile and told them his name which was Karaka. Karaka asked Naviros if they already wanted to see the criminals right away. The sword saint confirmed it as she planned to hear more of the details along the way. The old man immediately turned around and asked them to follow him. Roman kept his serious face while staring at Karaka. He then commented something that caught Naviros's attention. He remarked that the old man was just too nice looking to be a Lottie Lane interrogator. He thought that it was strange. The sword saint let out a laugh as she had heard this comment a lot. Turns out, everyone says that the first time they met Karaka, but she reminded Ronan to never judge a book by its cover. Doors have opened and they have finally entered. As Karaka opened more doors, Naviros told Ronan that soon he would be able to know why this old man was called the worst nightmare here in Lottie Lane Prison. Inside, the hallways were only being lit by these large torches. Karaka spoke and told them that the cell of the criminals was not far from them so he would start briefing them. His kind expression a while ago has already changed as he revealed the first important information that Ronan and Naviros needed to know, and it was the group where the two belong. It was called Nebula Clacer. Naviros replied that this was the first time she heard of it. She then inquired if this organization was like Calabaro, but Caracas still can't confirm anything. But he was sure that Nebula Clacer was far more dangerous. Apparently, the group has already conducted several attacks throughout the empire. They were able to destroy a place called Nalanda Granary and the Magic Engineering Research Facility. Edo Men. These guys were now wanted for the large-scale attacks that happened this year. Ronan took note of them and tried to remember this information from his past life, but he knew that he had never heard of them. Karaka then continued that he will be giving them more information along the way but Ronan cut him off to ask something. He mentioned if the criminals that they caught ever used the word starlight or the star's advent. This remark shocked the interrogator as he told him that he hadn't heard that before. Ronan was put in an awkward spot as he was desperate to find more clues. He tried scratching his cheek as he thought of some alibi. All he could think of was that the criminals had said these words while he was fighting them. Karaka was left there speechless. He then held his mask. It was as if something changed. Ronan was still awkwardly trying to get out of the situation. But as he turned his attention to the old man, he saw that Karaka was already filled with an ominous aura. The old man was clearly annoyed. RMC was stunned. This feeling was completely different from the kind and nice-looking old man a while ago. He was sure that the atmosphere around them felt heavier. The old man was now done wearing his mask again. Turns out, he thought that he had displayed his shortcomings on their first meeting. Karaka was ashamed because of it. This was the very first time he was not able to get all the crucial information he needed from the criminals. As he opened the door of the cell, the old man commented that it seemed that he had not shown them his full sincerity. He added that he now had no other choice but to put all of his effort. Ronan was shocked by what he saw 
inside the cell, he recalled the smug faces of Edwin and Cirilla the first time he met them, and right now, their state was far from what he remembers them. Edwin was like a shower must stand waiting for customers. Cirilla, on the other hand, had clearly been sustaining more injuries. She can't even see now. Karaka then spoke. He remarked that the most amazing was Edwin. This was because he could use dark magic to regenerate his body. While holding something like a stick, the old man asked Ronan if he knew how to get closer to someone like Edwin. He revealed that it was quite more simple than others think, as he held a heated piece of metal in front of him. Karaka shared his secret with our main character. He revealed that someone should consistently apply heat to Edwin until he couldn't regenerate anymore. The demonstration for the interrogation had already started. This was the very same reason why this place was called the Fortress of Screams. With an ecstatic expression, Karaka exclaimed that this is what he does to the criminals to get closer to them. He even considers them his best friends after some time, but this method seemed to prove not effective anymore, and that was because of what Roland had revealed earlier. The old man expressed his disappointment and addressed Edwin. The criminal was still hiding something. Karaka held his silver hair tightly, with a piercing glare from his eyes. Karaka asked Edwin if he had broken his promise of being sincere to each other. The guy panicked as he exclaimed that he had told him everything, but Karaka was not convinced because he had not disclosed any information regarding the star's advent. Edwin knew he messed up. He then tried to explain himself. Before he could do that, Karaka reminded him that he could easily turn his attention to Cirilla and asked her the questions. But unlike Edwin, the half-elf didn't have any regenerative skills so it would be really troublesome. This lady was awake all this time. It was evident that her body was trembling from the threats that the old man was seeing. She then slowly tried to speak and pleaded to just kill her instead of this slow and painful situation. Roland stared at her and thought that this was really indeed too much. Even when he was in the disciplinary squad, he didn't witness something like this. Something then came to his mind. Our MC wondered if Edwin could really still hide something from Karaka even after all of what he had done. Roland started to brainstorm because this doesn't make any sense. The identities of the criminals were already exposed and they have nothing to lose now. And after a few seconds, he commented that instead of Edwin not saying anything, there's a possibility that he cannot even if he wanted to. The old man froze as he heard Roland's remark. Navarro's also got interested in this idea. Our MC further discussed that all of them knew that some insurance methods were being done to soldiers to protect top secrets. Methods like this could be done by using a forbidden cursed magic. They were intended to stop certain information from being disclosed. Karaka then stopped for a second as he pondered on Roland's idea. He let go of Edwin and commented that this day had really been a shameful day for him. At first, he felt betrayed by his subjects and now, he had missed something so obvious. The old man turned around and asked Roland and Navarro's to wait for him here. He emphasized that he will need to get something to help them make this process easier. A few minutes later, Karaka was back and Roland asked what he needed to get a while ago. The old man then brought out something. It was this creature called the Cursed Eye. These ones were known to be monsters that devoured curses. Karaka regarded them as companions, finding them quite useful for assisting criminals who couldn't speak due to curses during interrogations. His kind expression changed once again as he approached Edwin. He remarked that they will be starting with him. The Cursed Eye was now attached to Edwin's forehead. Karaka told the creature that it could now eat to its heart's content. The small tentacles from this one started clinging to Edwin. Once it was fully attached, a bright purple light enveloped the area. Edwin also screamed in pain. The eye of the creature started glowing, up until it changed its color. This was the indication that the process was done. Karaka then told Edwin that he will now start asking him questions again. The first thing he inquired was about the star's advent. Edwin was not able to respond right away. But then, words started coming out from his mouth. He said that the star is an eternal entity, and it's the only grace that will save the lowly beings on this earth as the small lights who are waiting for them begin beyond the stars. Cirilla was startled as she heard the information being leaked out. Edwin continued to tell them what they do. The organization works to make sure nothing interferes with their long-cherished wish. Cirilla then shouted for him to stop talking. Karaka spoke and asked for a simpler explanation. He asked if something would soon fall from the sky. The cursed eye continued to eat the curse that prevents Edwin from talking. But soon enough, he revealed that those beings were called the star's children. The room was then filled with an ominous aura. Ronan froze on his position as he heard the revelation. His previous assumptions about these guys were true, and the first thing that came to his mind was the name of the giant that he defeated in his past life. A Hyatt was definitely involved with this. Ronan was not able to hold himself back and started to walk towards Edwin. Karaka tried to stop him but it was no use. This guy's rage was at its limit. He stared blankly and addressed the criminal. Our MC just asked Edwin if the children of the star that he was referring to was none other than a Hyatt. This Shorma stand guy was startled by his question. Edwin inquired what Ronan meant with a Hyatt. His eyes were already emitting blood as he asked our MC how he knew about that being. Edwin was about to talk about a Hyatt more but then his face became distorted. There's something wrong about him. Ronan noticed this and he didn't know what to do next. Karaka then touched his shoulder and told him to stand back. The old man immediately turned his head and looked at the red magic circle towards Edwin. Bright light was already sipping out of this guy's face. And after a few seconds, Edwin's body bursted into millions of pieces. The spell that Karaka casted acted as their shield 
struggled to protect them from the explosion. The blood was scattered all over the place. Karaka commented that he didn't expect something like this to happen. Even though the cursed eye has eaten most of the curse, he still ended up like this. Our MC was disappointed with the outcome. He asked Karaka if things like this usually happen. The old man said that it was rare for things to get to this point. He revealed that the curse casted on Ejuan has two parts. The first part was to not reveal anything about the star's advent to someone who isn't a member of their organization. And the second layer was to prevent the members from mentioning words related to a Hyatt. Otherwise, the curse will explode. Since the interrogation was practically done, Karaka then held Ronan and asked about a Hyatt. The old man thought that a Hyatt was part of the secret information within Nebula Clacer. He's now interrogating Ronan how he knew about it. This one was already gathering ominous mana on his hand in case something bad happens. With this intimidating glare, he told Ronan that since he was the interrogator handling this case, he really needed to know the truth. Our MC just stared at Karaka while the old man asked him if he would kindly answer him. The intense atmosphere became calm as Ronan started talking. He revealed that he just coincidentally came to know of it. Ronan made an alibi that since he was the first person to aid the chaos in Grand Carpadoki, he caught Cirilla and Ejuan talking about it. He maintained a poker expression as he told him that he just eavesdropped on them. Our MC added that at first, he thought Hat what he heard back then was not important. But upon coming here, he changed his mind. Ronan also apologized to Karaka because he got too excited and interfered with the interrogation. After that, he asked the old man if that was enough for him to believe in. From his lifetime of experience, Karaka knew that it was impossible for this kind of secret information to just be coincidentally acquired. He was sure that Ronan was hiding the truth, but just by looking at Ronan's eyes, he also knew that the young guy was not dangerous to the Empire. The old man wondered if that strong willpower that seeding from his eyes was because of a great responsibility he was bearing or a conviction. And after a few moments, all things became clear to Karaka. The eyes of Ronan were filled with anger towards that said organization. Things were going out of hand so Naviros held her sword. A green slash was then released. Naviros got this annoyed expression as he commanded Karaka to stop with his questions. Apparently, the sword saint takes it personal of her disciple was being interrogated for something he was innocent. On top of that, it was being done in front of her. Karaka immediately surrendered the idea and apologized. He remarked that he was just double-checking things. He even playfully commented that he was just being extra careful regarding the matter. As a result, Karaka apologized to Ronan. Our MC accepted the apology and noted that he was just glad that they had cleared up the misunderstanding. But in the back of his mind, Ronan thought that that was too dangerous. He could easily be held inside this prison for interrogation as well. The old man changed the subject and told everyone that he was still ashamed that he lost one of his precious cursed eyes. They were very hard to kill. Unlike most fantastical monsters, Ronan was taken aback as he found out that these tiny monsters were that powerful. Karaka even suggested looking at them closely to appreciate their cuteness. The old man was just about to suggest for Ronan to touch them. But something happened. The cursed eye was acting weird. The color of its eyes already changed so it meant that this one just absorbed a curse. Karaka found this unusual. He then wondered where the curse came from because this one didn't even go near Cirilla. The only reasonable idea was that the curse came from Ronan. He recalled that the cursed eye did come close to RMC when he casted the spell that would protect them from the explosion. Karaka then addressed Ronan to get his attention. Ronan asked what's the matter. Without any warning, the old man placed the cursed eye on the hands of RMC. It immediately attached itself. This creature was indeed absorbing a large amount of curses. Its body was starting to change. Ronan stared at it as the cursed eye looked like it was about to overload. And a few seconds later, it happened. The cursed eye bursted. Its blood was splattered and Ronan felt disgusted with it. He asked why the creature just exploded. On the other hand, Karaka was somewhat amused because it was the first time the cursed eye was not able to handle the curse that it was trying to absorb. The old man became serious and asked Ronan not to be shocked and to listen to him. Karaka revealed that he thinks that Ronan was cursed, which took our MC in surprise. Ronan panicked and asked what he was talking about. The old man and then started asking questions. And the first one was if Ronan felt something like was restricting him regarding his day-to-day -day movements. Things like when someone can't run or hold objects of steel. The things that he was not able to do. Ronan thought of something and it was the fact that he struggled to feel mana. He tried hiding his expression from Karaka and Naviros but both of them quickly noticed it. The old man repeated that if Ronan didn't want to share this information to him, he wouldn't ask him any further because it's not like he could solve this issue for him. But, he reminded Ronan one important thing. Judging from the power of the curse, someone has cast a very powerful curse on him, and this one was filled with ill intent. The night became deeper as a few hours had already passed from the interrogation. Karaka, Naviros and Ronan were already outside the Laudaland prison. The old man thanked them for the visit and noted that he will be contacting them once again as soon as he found a way to lift the curse on Cirilla. He bet it would take some time. Naviros understood this and just reminded him to just quickly report to her if he found out something. Karaka's gaze was then shifted to Ronan. He commented that it seemed there's a lot going on in RMC's mind right now, which was true because Ronan got startled from this remark. 
Ronan didn't deny this, he was still thinking about the curse, but Karaka reminded him not to worry too much, after all, Ronan is a Philian student, RMC got confused and asked what he meant by that, Karaka then talked about someone that had been attending the academy for some time, the old man was talking about the only mage who knows best about curses, this person is the only one he knew that could help Ronan and it is Professor Maya's secret, right now, they are on their way back to the Philan academy, Ronan was having an uncomfortable feeling while traveling, and that was because he kept on scratching his eyes, he wondered what was wrong with him. Instructor Naviros noticed this and commented that this student couldn't just stay still. The sword saint then inquired if it was really that itchy. Ronan said yes and added that it has been like this for a bit, and that was since he was touched by that eyeball monster and confirmed the curse that was within him. RMC was already getting paranoid. If there's something wrong with him, but Naviros assured him that what he was experiencing right now is one of the most common symptoms that appear when a curse is getting weaker. Ronan was then asked if he knew someone that could be responsible for the curse, but this student noted that he couldn't think of anyone. He even had the guts to tell his instructor that he had just lived the life of a saint until now. The sword saint then started thinking if this was really true. As far as she could remember, this kid has been causing trouble every single chance he got. Her attention was then shifted to Ronan when our main character decided to thank her for what she did for him back at Lottaland. Ronan was talking about the time when Kraka was already about to interrogate him. He noted that the old man's eyes were really scary, and if it weren't for instructor Naviros, he would have made up some sin that he didn't even commit just to have him confess. The hot instructor just scoffed and let out a sigh. She told Ronan that he didn't need to thank her as she was just doing what an instructor should do. RMC looked at her and thought that instructor Naviros was really a good person aside from her monstrous talent in sword fighting. Ronan was starting to like her even more, but as he was thinking about it, he thought of something that felt strange. If instructor Naviros was this great, why didn't he hear any information about her in his previous life? Ronan then started theorizing about some scenarios that could have contributed to this. He wondered if the Nebula Glacier had something to do with it, but for now, he decided not to think about it and just focus on the present. The next day, things were back to normal inside the Philian Academy. There's also a place called Sherry Forest and it's known to be a training area for magic students. And inside this massive area lies a specific training ground called Pillar Park. Someone could easily think where the name came from and the massive pillars that were scattered all over the place. A voice was also heard near the area and it welcomed Ronan. This one even noted that this was the first time seeing him again after that day. And the one talking was none other than Each Shin. She had this bright and glowing smile as she noted that if it weren't for instructor Naviros, she wouldn't be able to meet him again. She asked how Ronan had been since that day but RMC was just too stunned to respond. He's still not getting used to seeing her like this. On top of that, he was wondering how he would tell her about his promise of advising her not to become a grand commander in this life. Ronan started to have some headaches just by thinking of it. He still has not thought of any way to fulfill this one. As he couldn't address the issue at the moment, our protagonist decided to simply laugh it off. Sporting a peculiar and light-hearted grin, he greeted Ichin with a long overdue hello. Ronan then asked her as well how she had been since then. Ichin told him that she had been doing well, especially when almost all of the students were treating her more nicely now. But this weird situation was more noticeable from Cardan who cowers in fear whenever he sees her, wearing an innocent expression. Ichin remarked that it didn't feel too bad. Ronan just looked at her and couldn't help but consider how naive his grand commander was. These two then proceeded to walk and continued their conversation. Ichin had found out about the curse that Ronan has. RMC then revealed that it was true and he was looking to meet Professor Secret, and this was the main reason why he came to this place. But as he looked at his surroundings, Ronan noted that the professor must be quite a unique person based on the pillars around them. Ichin agreed and added that Professor Secret's office is really unique too, so non-magic students don't even come there. That means she was not familiar with this place and asked a younger magic student for guidance. Ichin looked around and wondered if that student was still not there, and that was the same time when a figure started to materialize in front of her. This one then immediately approached the defenseless Ichin and buried her head onto Ichin's chest. The student that she was talking about was none other than Elizabeth of Caluthia, and she had this bright and excited expression as she hugged Ichin. Ronan was caught off guard by this scene. He was really dumbfounded and became more confused as he eavesdropped on their conversation. The two seemed to really have an incredible relationship with each other. He then recalled his memory of Elizabeth. From what he could remember, this lady was the one who was yapping about the wolf and sheep thing. But right now, it felt like she was a different person. Her intimidating smile was replaced with a beautiful and friendly one. Ichin then apologized to Elizabeth whom she addressed as a lie. She reasoned that she had some urgent matters to attend to so she needed a lie's help. But this lady seemed to be not bothered based on the expression on her face. Elizabeth then asked Ichin why she needed to meet with Professor Secret, and that was also the time when she noticed something. She looked at Ronan's blank expression. This guy was sweating profusely as he didn't know what would happen to him next. Elizabeth's bright and inviting smile also faded away. It was as if her soul left her body for a bit. Ronan then nervously told her that he was the one who needed to see Professor Secret. He also asked how she had been and addressed Elizabeth as a lie. The esteemed heir of the Akalushas then screamed in embarrassment. She was not prepared for someone like 
Ronan to see that side of her. Elizabeth continued screaming while asking Ronan why he was there. After some time, the area was quiet again. The only ones left here now were Ronan and Eli. They started going deeper into the forest. A few moments later, both of them arrived in front of this shabby house. Ronan asked Eli if this was really the office of the professor. RMC then became suspicious. He asked Eli if she was just planning to bury him here just because he saw something he shouldn't have seen. But his questions made her annoyed more. Elizabeth exclaimed to stop calling him a lie and assured him that she was not gonna bury him. She stomped her feet with annoyance as she commanded Ronan to just follow her. And while they were walking, Ronan looked at Elizabeth. He thought that it was a bit unexpected for someone like her to be friends with his grand commander. But then he recalled that Edeshin also showed him the pendant of Akalusha's which meant that she received massive support from the noble family. RMC now wondered how the two of them met. Ali then held the doorknob. She opened the door and revealed the almost empty house. Except for the fact that there's this old lady sitting on a rocking chair. Ronan stared at the old lady and thought of something. He wondered if she was Professor Maya's secret. Elizabeth answered his question and told him not to get ahead of himself. She revealed that there's still one more step, which made RMC confused. Eli then went in front of the old lady. Ronan followed her and observed what Elizabeth was talking about. The lady then put her hand in front and she started emitting this purple mana. She also reminded Ronan one thing, with a serious expression. She told him to just stay still and to not do anything. RMC agreed. Elizabeth then started chanting. She uttered the word Kishapa followed by Lunazir, Delphi Ram, and the last one was the word open. She also casted her own mana and directed it in front of her. The room was then filled with an ominous aura. Both of them just stood right there. Ronan looked at the old lady again just to confirm it. He noted that nothing happened. He said, as the old lady maintained her eyes closed. But then, her mouth opened and it became weirdly enlarged. The next thing Ronan knew was that the old lady turned into a titan-like being and it was ready to devour them. He panicked and exclaimed what the hell was this thing? Eli maintained her composure and assured Ronan that there's nothing to be afraid of. She also noted that this is the real office of the professor. After that, these two students were transported. The new place was filled with books and looked like a huge library. The name of this place is Separaxial. Ronan observed his surroundings. He noted that the previous one was just the entrance. He was just about to comment that things around this place were weird but then a person appeared behind them. This one had already expected the arrival of Ronan as instructor Naviros had already informed Professor Secret about him. Ronan heard her voice and turned his head around, and he was caught off guard on what he saw. Professor Secret had already appeared in front of him and she tried reaching for his eyes. While floating in the air, she noted that there's really something very vicious within RMC. This right is the continent's best curse magic user, Maya's secret. She also has a special trait. She's already 83 years old. She further checked Ronan and noted that things had become more interesting. Ronan couldn't believe his eyes. He wondered if this little kid in front of him was really the esteemed professor. This one noticed Ronan's reaction. She quickly reassured him that he didn't have to be surprised. With a kind smile, Professor Secret explained that she has her reasons for portraying herself like this. She added that she was already over 80 years old, which shocked RMC. Ronan was about to inquire how she made herself look younger. But then, she cut him off to tell him that they should just focus on his purpose of coming to her. Professor Secret then snapped her fingers. Multiple cords with ancient letters appeared all of a sudden. She iterated that relieving the curses that envelop Ronan is more important. RMC was bewildered as he looked at these ancient letters around him. He wondered what the hell they were. Professor Secret analyzed each one of them and commented that she didn't expect this amount of curses. Ronan even even has ancient curses were not only ancient curses that were close to their root of origin. This was certainly dangerous. It will also be impossible for normal curse magic users to touch something like this. RMC then protested and asked if these said curses can still be relieved from him. Luckily, Professor Secret assured him that even with this amount of curses, she could handle them. A magic circle then appeared below Ronan. Professor Secret revealed that she came prepared for these kinds of things. She then told Ronan to listen up. She informed RMC that from that point onwards, she will be materializing the curses in his body in an imaginary world within his consciousness. And as for Ronan, he only needed to do one thing when he found the root of the curse that binds him, that was to slash it down. Ronan repeated what she said and confirmed if that was all he needed to do. His face was full of confusion. He wanted to know how he would identify the curse and how he would slash it. Professor Secret assured him that he would be able to recognize it the moment he came across it. And without any warning, the professor emitted this blue mana on her hand and pointed her fingers on Ronan. She poked his forehead and whispered best of luck. Her finger glowed in bright blue light. It was as if it reacted to Ronan's body. The next thing RMC knew was that he was falling in an imaginary space. He was not expecting this and thought that why this was all of a sudden. His expression then changed after a few seconds. His surroundings have materialized. Ronan was transported to a world that was based on his memories. He then turned around to check out things, and as soon as he did this, he recognized a familiar place. Right in front of him was his house, the very same one where he had spent most of his life with his sister. While wondering if the root of the curse came from the inside of his house, someone with silver hair came running across him. He 
was still staring at the house when this person passed by, Ronan heard a familiar voice, and he was immediately frozen in shock, the voice came from Ural, and this timeline was when they were still young, the house has this homey feeling, Ural could be seen staring at a baby, she commented about how was, Ronan turned her head around and asked the person beside her why Ronan was always sleeping, she wondered if he was sick somewhere, the person she asked then answered her question, she said that babies need to sleep a lot to grow, just like when she was still a baby, this lady right here is the mother of Ronan and Ural, she looked like a lot of Ronan, but with a more innocent face, Ronan's mother then added that if Ronan turns out to be sick later on, Ural should take good care of him, because she was now his older sister, Ural happily accepted the responsibility and exclaimed that she will be protecting him forever, this conversation was now being watched by Ronan, and he was now sure that this scene from his house was back, when he had just been born, he looked at the baby inside the cradle, and wondered if this innocent looking one was really him, Ronan had his face in disbelief as he couldn't believe that he had a face when he was this cute, since he regressed, he already forgot that he was also a baby, taking all the information he was seeing, he concluded that he was looking at his past now, he thought that he couldn't remember any of this, and then the vibe of the room changed, the door slowly opened, a man with this ominous and fierce aura had appeared, Ronan immediately felt that the atmosphere suddenly felt too heavy, he knew someone else just entered the house, but there's one problem, his hands were trembling in fear, and his body couldn't even move, the mysterious person passed him, and he wondered who the hell was this bastard, meanwhile, the said person was happily greeted by Ural and his mother, his mom even commented that she didn't expect the person to be back this early, the unknown person said something, but Ronan was not able to hear any words, it was as if something blocked it, his mother answered the unknown person's question, and she said that Ronan is in the cradle right behind her, she's sure that this person must have been curious about what the baby looked like, his mother smiled and was just about to say that Ronan looked like him, but then the unknown person started emitting a dark aura from his hand, he chanted some words while casting a spell towards Ronan's mother, a few seconds later, she was already dazed, she still tried to ask what was going on, but it was already too late, Ronan's mother fell on the ground as she lost consciousness, Ural saw all of this and was confused, meanwhile, Ronan felt a bit of anger, he knew that something was wrong, Ural addressed the unknown person and asked why her mom suddenly fell, but then, the same spell was also casted towards her, and just like her mother, she lost consciousness, Ronan panicked and exclaimed the name of Ural, our MC was furious, someone just barged in and did something to his mother, he already forgot that what he was seeing right now was from his memory, so he tried to stop the unknown person, but something stopped him, the same ancient curse spell appeared on the unknown person's hand, and he was now on his way towards Ronan, our MC knew that these really were the same ones that came out from his body when Professor Secret applied her magic to him, a few seconds later, a bright light enveloped the area and Ronan blocked his view, he gritted his teeth and concluded that this unknown person was the culprit, the root of this curse that he should slash down, Professor Secret's remark was on point, he will just feel the root, meanwhile, outside the memory realm, Professor Secret's hands trembled, she commented that even though she came prepared to extract the curse, her mana still hit rock bottom, while maintaining the spell, she revealed that the curse that Ronan has was just too ridiculous, Elizabeth then inquired on how many curse spells were in our MC's body, the professor answered that strength aside, the number would be around roughly 10, this lady stuttered as she couldn't believe that there were that many, Elizabeth then concluded that it's no wonder why the esteemed professor's mana was draining out, extracting this much curse would really take its toll, but Secret stopped her and told her student that that was not the case, with a serious expression, she revealed that the number of curses she was facing right now was just one, the scene shifts and we are taken back to Ronan, after the mysterious man placed the curse in Ronan's body, the man said some words to him, and turned around, he walked past Irel and her mother, Ronan was annoyed to see this, after the man left the house, Ronan regained his strength, he quickly ran to check on his mother and his elder sister, he called out their names, but no one answered him, after calming down, he realized that Irel and his mother were simply at sleep, he placed his hand on his head and did his best to relax, he believed that there is only one thing to do in this imaginary world, and that is to kill the mysterious man, he cut his door into pieces, and ran outside with a look of anger on his face, when he got outside, he noticed something odd, he saw the mysterious man standing outside the house, he asked the man if he was waiting for him, with a serious look on his face, Ronan asked the man if he has any business with him, the man did not respond to Ronan, this made Ronan much more angry, he could not believe that the man actually hurt his family in front of him, he told the man that he will never forgive him, immediately said this, he unsheathed his sword and rushed to attack the man, is Rohan and moved closer to the man, the man activated his mysterious power, he used his ability to create a sword, which he used to block Ronan's attack, Ronan was shocked to see that the man was able to block his attack, he began to attack the man with more energy, unfortunately for Ronan, the man blocked each one of his attacks, Ronan did not understand what was going on, he could not believe that a mere curse was able to wield a sword, he was more surprised by the fact that the curse was actually beating him, the man used his sword to cut Ronan in different places, after seeing that Ronan was getting weaker, the man used his sword to launch an attack, 
attack that severely damaged Ronan. Ronan fell to the ground when he received the attack. Ronan could not believe what was happening to him. His sword was not able to even touch the man's skin, due to the fact that the man did not attack him while he was down. Ronan deduced that the man must not be able to kill him. He realized that the man was asking him to leave the imaginary world. Ronan was annoyed when he understood the man's intentions. He did not want the fight to end in such a horrible manner because he still had a lot of questions to ask the man. He pulled his strength together and tried to get up. After successfully pushing himself up, he screamed at the man. He told the man that he is not yet done with him. Ronan asked the man about why he treated his family in such a horrible way. He told the man that his mother and his sister don't usually show affections to anyone. He told the man that Iroh only has such an expression for people she loves. With a look of anger on his face, he called them in a bastard. He deduces that the man must be his father. He asked his father about why he did such a thing to their family. Ronan's father did not respond to Ronan's question. Ronan became annoyed when his father did not respond to him. A red energy began to cover his body. He could not believe that his father was not trying to explain or make any excuses after he treated his family in such a way and placed a curse on Ronan. Ronan closed the gap between him and his father. He placed the red energy into his sword and used it to cut his father's head off. The head began to slowly fade away after it was cut off. Ronan walked up to the head. Rowan and used his sword to stab the head before it could fade away completely. He told his father that he will figure out everything by himself. With a menacing look on his face, he told his father to stay out of his body. After his father's body disappeared, Ronan got transported back to reality. He quickly realized that he was in Sefer Aikido. Professor Secret came to greet Ronan. Immediately he woke up. She asked him about how he is feeling. Ronan was shocked to see Professor Secret. He asked her about who she was. After staring for a while, Ronan realized that the old woman standing in front of him is Professor Secret. Ronan did not understand what happened to her. He asked her about how she became old in the short time he left her. He asked her if she is growing old because of him. Professor Secret smiled when she heard Ronan's questions. She told him that her current situation is not his fault. She asked Ronan if he feels anything different now. Ronan already knew that Professor Secret was an unusual person. But now that he is able to see her manner, he realized that she was more outstanding than he expected. When Professor Secret saw that Ronan was able to see her mana, she realized that her plan worked. Professor Secret and Ronan sat down to discuss about what happened in Ronan's imaginary world. Professor Secret was surprised to hear Ronan's experience. She could not believe that the curse in Ronan was based on an old memory which even Ronan did not know about. She was more surprised to find out that the man who placed a curse on Ronan was his father. Professor Secret asked Ronan about how he knew the man was his father when his appearance was blurry. Ronan told her that he could tell by how his mother and his sister behaved towards the man. More importantly, Ronan felt something odd when the man placed his hands on his family. This feeling was something Ronan had never felt in his life. This feeling was an unfamiliar sorrow. Ronan realized that he became more angry and riled up thanks to this feeling. Ronan wondered if he was feeling in the same emotions as the man. Professor Secret asked Ronan if he does not have any memories of his parents. Ronan told her that he does not. What was more odd was the fact that he and his sister had never wondered about why they could not remember their parents. It was as if the memories of their parents was erased from their heads. Professor Secret was shocked to hear this. She realized that Ronan's awareness of his existence was sealed alongside his ability to perceive mana. She told Ronan that his father put a curse on him, and messed with his memories as well. In the process of placing the curse, some of his father's memories got transferred to him. She revealed to Ronan that magic spells related to memories occasionally have similar side effects. She told Ronan that his imaginary world was naturally materialized with his memories. She told Ronan that the fact that he could use mana to kill the curses because it became possible for him to perceive mana, which was a reaction to recovering his disconnected cognition. Upon hearing Professor Secret's explanation, Ronan realized that the shiny strings that he is currently seeing is mana. Professor Secret told him that he is only able to see man right now, but very soon, you will be able to manipulate it like other students. Of course, this is only possible if Ronan is able to release two more curses among the nine remaining curses cast upon him. Professor Secret told Ronan that it will take some time to remove his curses because all the curses placed on him are of unknown origin and are very powerful. She told Ronan that she will inform him once she is ready to break the curses. She told Ronan to return to his dorm because he has spent an entire day in our office and a new day has begun. Ronan noticed something odd when Professor Secret asked him to leave. Professor Secret had returned back to her youth. Ronan was extremely shocked to see this. He asked Professor Secret if her appearance changes depending on the time of the day. Professor Secret told Ronan that her body also has its own complicated circumstances. Professor Secret knew that the event Ronan witnessed in his imaginary world are a lot for a normal student to bear. She told Ronan to take care of his mind. She advises him to not be tied down by his past because he has more precious days ahead. Ronan was happy to hear Professor Secret's advice. He stood up and gave about his professor. He told her that he will be in her care. The scene shifts and we see a man standing next to the crystal giant underneath the Grand Cappadoki. The man was surprised to see how huge the crystal giant was. He could not believe that a student was able to stop the giant on his own. While the man was staring at the giant, his subordinate, whose name is Dolan, came to greet the man. The man asked Dolan if the restoration of the forage is going
going well. Dolan told the man that everything is going well. He assured the man that the forage will be operating in a week. Dolan told the man that he was not able to find any additional information about Cirilla and Edwin. He told the man that he was able to find Ronan's location through the academy. This man is Josephson Ivan de Gracia. He is the head of the Grand SIA Duchy and the Duke of the Empire. While Joseph was talking to Dolan, the crystal giant came to life. The giant raised his hand and was ready to crush the two men. When Joseph noticed this, he asked his boss to move aside. He placed his hand on his sword and told the duke that he will bring the knight troop to fight the giant. Joseph told Dolan to not bother himself. He told Dolan that the knights will be busy. Due to the fact that the two men did not make a move, the giant decided to crush them with its fist. The moment its hand got close to the men, Joseph unsheathed his sword and used his aura to cut the giant into pieces. When he was done, he put his sword back and asked Dolan to follow him. With a smile on his face, Joseph told Dolan that they are going to meet the young hero of Philly on Academy. At Ronan's hostel, someone knocks on his door very early in the morning. Ronan could not believe that someone came to visit him so early in the morning when Ronan opened the door. He sees Dolan standing outside. He asked Dolan for his identity. Ronan assumed that Dolan was a salesman. Dolan was annoyed to hear this he called Ronan a rude bastard. He believed that Ronan was acting arrogant towards him despite knowing who he was due to the way he was dressed. Ronan guessed that Dolan was an official of a noble family. He was not completely certain about Dolan's identity due to how dark Dolan's manner was. Ronan notices that there was something else mixed with Dolan's manner. Ronan did not know what he was looking at, but he was certain that he recognized this thing. While Dolan was staring at Ronan, the Duke comes to warn him. He told Dolan that it is their fault for visiting Ronan without notifying him. Dolan called Joseph Duke and apologized for his behavior. Ronan was surprised to hear that he was in the presence of the Duke. Joseph apologized to Ronan for Dolan's behavior with a smile on his face. He asked Ronan if he could spare him some of his time. The Duke stepped into Ronan's room and gave him a box. The box contained a sheath for Ronan's sword. Ronan was surprised to see this he asked the duke about why he brought the sheath himself. Joseph told Ronan that the blacksmith's endure own begged him to bring it. Joseph thanked Ronan for saving the Grand Cappadoki. He told Ronan that the house of Grand SIA in the grid in Capitola. He had been comrades for a long time. He told Ronan that his sword whose name is Failed Lord was created by Doran. Joseph put his hand into his jacket and brought out something. He told Ronan that he wants to give it to him as a gift. Ronan was extremely shocked to see what Joseph wanted to give him. Joseph gave Ronan the grantee, a crest of proof, which has the seal of the family head. Ronan could not believe that Joseph wanted to give him something so precious. This crest of proof can buy three villages. Joseph told Ronan that he has to treat their savior well so that the honor of the grantee lifts. He told Ronan that his men have also delivered the blacksmith's gifts and crest of proof to both Maria and to Sel. Ronan could already imagine how Asel and Maria would be behaving right now. After giving Ronan his gift, Joseph asked Ronan to tell him everything about the person behind the incident. With a serious look on his face, Joseph told Ronan that he is very interested in knowing Edwin and Cirilla. Immediately Joseph said this Ronan saw a very bright light. Ronan was shocked to see the horrifying man of the duke who leads the grantee of family. Ronan told Joseph that Cirilla and Edwin are crazy bastards. Dolan was annoyed to hear this. Ronan told Joseph that Cirilla and Edwin are fast and very annoying. While he was talking Ronan noticed an odd energy in the air. When he looked up, he noticed that Dolan was the one releasing this energy. Ronan was surprised to see this because Dolan had not moved an inch since he stepped into his room. But he started making a reaction. The moment Ronan talked about Edwin and Cirilla. While thinking, Ronan realized that Dolan gives off the same dirty feeling as Edwin and Cirilla. The Duke asked Ronan about what was wrong with him. He asked Ronan about why he stopped talking. Ronan was surprised to hear this question. He did not understand why the Duke was not talking about the man which Dolan is exuding. The Duke asked Ronan if he is feeling uncomfortable. Ronan was shocked to hear this question. He knew that Duke Gracia is highly renowned as a strong person in the continent, and yet he was not able to see the mana. Ronan quickly realized that he's the only person that can can see this unique manner. He asked the Duke if he has heard about the arrival of the stars. Immediately Ronan asked this question. Dolan's expression changed upon seeing Dolan's expression. Ronan decided to throw a bait at Dolan. He told the Duke about Nebula Clavier and their purpose. The Duke was very shocked to hear this. He could not believe that such an organization exists on the continent. Joseph asked Ronan if he obtained all the information by himself. Ronan told Joseph that Cirilla and Edwin spilled the truth after he cut off their lamps, with a devious look on his face. Ronan told Joseph that he enjoyed seeing Edwin and Cyrillic beg for their lives. Ronan wanted to say more but the duke stopped him. He told Ronan that he will confirm the rest of the information from the official document of Rhode Island Prison. He told Ronan that he cannot hear more about the incident because he will lose his appetite. Ronan accepted the duke's wish after talking to the duke. Ronan confirmed his suspicion about Dolan. Ronan realized that Dolan has not been able to control himself at all. Ronan could not believe that the Nebula Clavier was hiding even among the Grantia family. He realized that he needed an emergency measure. Joseph told Ronan that he wants to leave. Before Joseph left Ronan told him that there is something important 
important that he needs to know about Nebula Clavier Joseph asked Ronan to tell him. Ronan smiled and told Joseph that it will take a long time for him to explain. He told Joseph that he will organize it in the night and send it to him by mail. He assured Joseph that he will be really amused with the package, with a devious smile on his face. Ronan told Joseph that the package will be interesting, especially because it talks about Ahiyuri. Dolan was shocked to hear this. Later in the night, we see Ronan sleeping. Dolan breaks into Ronan's room and tries to assassinate Ronan. When Dolan hit Ronan's neck with his sword, he noticed that he hit some rocks instead of Ronan's neck. He was surprised to see that Ronan was not on the bed. Ronan was on the ceiling of his room. He called Dolan Ratbastard number 3 and welcomed him to his room. Dolan was surprised to see that Ronan expected him to come. He turned around and asked Ronan about how he knew about his intentions. Ronan jumped down from the ceiling and told Dolan to turn around. When Dolan turned, he sees someone watching them Roland and tell Dolan that this person is a special guest he invited just for him. Dolan was extremely shocked to see this person. The person turns out to be Dolan's young master Shelafen, with a horrifying look on his face. Shelafen told Dolan to explain the situation to him. A few hours earlier, Ronan went to visit Shelafen. In his room, Shelafen was surprised to see Ronan. He never expected Ronan to visit him on his own. He was more surprised to find out that Ronan wanted to ambush Dolan in the night. He believed that Ronan was crazy for suspecting Dolan. He asked Ronan if he has any proof to back up his actions. He told Ronan that Dolan is a knight that possesses great skill and loyalty. He told Ronan that Dolan's loyalty to the Grand SIA family is quite high among the knight. Shelafen told Ronan that Dolan was chosen as his father's bodyguard after he served their family for four years. Ronan was surprised to hear this. He could not believe that Dolan became a bodyguard for the Duke after only serving for four years. He believed that four years was too short for a knight to serve. He told Shelafen that his family is probably already filled with spies. Shelafen was shocked to hear this. He did not understand what Ronan was talking about. Ronan told him to not bother himself. He told Shelafen that it is not important for him to find out who Dolan is working for. He asked Shelafen to come to his room later in the night. He told Shell have fun that he will be saving his family if what he is saying is true. The scene shifts and we are taken back to Ronan's room. Shelafen brought out his sword and pointed it at Dolan he has stolen to explain himself. Dolan was shocked to see this. He did not understand why his young master was in Ronan's room. Ronan laughed at Shelafen when he heard what he said. He told Shelafen that Dolan is not going to answer him just because he asked he told Shelafen that he's very naive. Ronan believed that Shelafen will not survive in the harsh world if he continues to be nice. Dolan raised his leg up and hit it on the ground. The moment Dolan's leg touched the ground, his body began to release a large amount of mana. Ronan and Shelafen were shocked to see this. Ronan was surprised to see that his body suddenly became heavy. He could not believe that Dolan was using his aura to make his body heavy. While Ronan was thinking about his body, Dolan rushed to attack him. Ronan was able to block the attack with his sword, but he got pushed back. Dolan used his aura to completely suppress Ronan. Shelafen became angry when he saw this. He asked Dolan to give him a reason for his action. Dolan did not answer Shelafen instead. He rushed to attack him. The moment his sword touched Shelafen's sword, Dolan told Shelafen that he is too naive. Dolan was relieved that Shelafen was inexperienced in controlling the range of his aura. He knew that Shelafen would not use his powerful technique in a place where other people could easily get swept up in his technique. Shelafen could not still believe that his fateful knight would turn on him. He was very annoyed with the situation. Dolan attacked Shelafen and told him that he is sorry. While pressing Shelafen down with his aura, Dolan told Shelafen that he did not want things to end badly between them. He told Shelafen that his plans got ruined by Ronan. Shelafen was surprised to see the skills which Dolan possessed. He told Dolan that his current skills are different from the ones he is familiar with. He could not believe that Dolan has been hiding his powers for years. He asked Dolan about when he betrayed the family. Dolan was annoyed to hear this. He used his sword to push Shelafen away, with a deadly look in his eyes. Dolan told Shelafen that he was never a knight of the Grand Sia family. Immediately he said this he rushed to attack Shelafen. Shelafen was shocked to hear what Dolan said. Upon seeing that Dolan was a spy, Shelafen asked Ronan to do whatever he wants. Immediately said this Ronan blocked Dolan's attack. Dolan was shocked to see Ronan he did not understand how Ronan was still able to move. Ronan ignored Dolan he called Shelafen, a frustrating brat. He could not believe that Shelafen made him struggle all because he wanted to hear Dolan call himself a spy. He asked Shelafen if he is happy with the answer he got. Shelafen told Ronan that the situation was quite serious for him. You begged Ronan to understand the situation. Shelafen picked up his sword and attacked Dolan with a horrifying look in his eyes. Shelafen told Ronan that a bloodbath will happen in the grand scheme of family after he is done with Dolan. Shelafen closed the gap between himself and Dolan. Dolan was surprised to see this. He was certain that Shelafen was encroached in his aura. He did not understand how Shelafen was still able to move freely. He was more surprised to see that Shelafen was able to use his heavy sword by simply using mana. Shelafen covered his sword with mana and used it to attack Dolan. Dolan did not understand what was going on. He wondered if Shelafen has been hiding his skills just like him. This did not make sense to him because Shelafen had no reason to hide his skill. Dolan quickly realized that Shelafen adapted to his aura while they were fighting. He knew that Shelafen was a genius that appears once every century but he never expected Shelafen to be so talented. 
while Dolan was distracted by Shelafen. Ronan launched a surprise attack on him. He told Dolan to not be relaxed. He told Dolan to not be distracted in a fight. Dolan was surprised to see Ronan. He did not understand how Ronan was able to get close to him. Ronan began to attack Dolan aggressively. Dolan was able to block the attacks but he was slowly getting overwhelmed by Ronan. Dolan could not believe that Ronan was able to push him back. He realized that Ronan was another talented monster that is as strong as Shelafen. Ronan used his sword to create a large attack. Unfortunately for him, Dolan dodged the attack. Ronan was surprised to see this he never expected Dolan to be able to dodge such an attack. The moment Dolan dodged the attack, he used his leg to kick Ronan away from him. Dolan realized that their fight has caused a lot of noise. He knew that the professors will soon be coming to check Ronan's room. He realized that he needed to escape. He broke through Ronan's window and landed on the ground. The moment he landed on the ground, he began to run at full speed. Dolan could not believe that things would become so complicated all because he tried to kill Ronan. He realized that he was foolish for thinking that Ronan subdued Edwin and Cirillo with luck. He decided to hide and wait for an opportunity to catch Ronan. While Dolan was running, Shelafen appeared at his back with a sword in his hand. Dolan was terrified to feel Shelafen presents. Shelafen told Dolan that he cannot control his storm sword like his father. Dolan was shocked to see Shelafen in the air. Shelafen told Dolan that he is stupid for running away after knowing how powerful the storm sword is. A large amount of wind began to gather around Shelafen's sword. Shelafen told Dolan that no one will get swept up in his technique now. With a serious look on his face Shel Shelafen told Dolan that he will punish him for being a traitor to their family. Immediately Shelafen said this he activated the Grand T a secret sword art. The technique Shelafen activated is called the Storm Sword. This technique created a large tornado that moved towards Dolan. Dolan was horrified to see this technique. He tried to slash the tornado but he did not affect it. When the tornado got close to Dolan, he realized that he could not destroy such an overpowered technique. As the wind tore him apart, Dolan closed his eyes and prayed to the star. After finishing off Dolan, the tornado disappeared. Shelafen looked at Dolan's body and told him that no one in the Grand SIA family will remember him after today. A Shelafen walked away from Dolan's body. He told Dolan that he is not important because he was never Gracia. Ronan was surprised to see how Shelafen got rid of Dolan. He realized that Shelfin was quite angry to find out that Dolan was a spy. When Ronan looked at Dolan's disfigured body he told Shelfin that they cannot take Dolan to Rhode Island prison in such a horrible state. Shelafen asked Ronan to not worry about Dolan. He told Ronan that he only severed Dolan's tendons to stop Dolan from moving. He assured Ronan that Dolan will not die. Although Shelafen told Ronan that Dolan will not die he was not certain if he had damaged Dolan's body beyond repair. You told Ronan that Dolan might survive. Ronan was shocked to hear this he could not believe how stupid Shelafen was. He had expected Shelafen to hold back while attacking Dolan. Shelafen asked Ronan not to bother himself. He told Ronan that he needs to quickly report the situation to his family. With a serious look on his face, Shelafen told Ronan that his family must hunt down and get rid of all the traitors among them. Immediately said this, he began to run. He asked Ronan to handle Dolan's situation. Ronan was shocked to see how crazy Shelafen was. He never expected Shelafen to leave him alone. He was annoyed with the fact that Shelafen destroyed most of the things in the area and wanted him to take care of everything. While Ronan was yelling at Shelafen, a portal appeared at his back. A swordsman came out of the portal and asked Ronan about the situation. The person asked Ronan about the storm that shook the dormitory. The person asked Ronan if he was ambushed. When Ronan turned around, he was surprised to see a portal behind him. He was more surprised to see the swordsman that came out of the portal. The people that came out of the portal turned out to be Principal Crapo, who created the portal, and Instructor Navy Rose who came to his system. When Ronan looked at Navy Rose, the first thing he noticed was her odd but cute pajamas. Ronan was surprised to see this. He never expected Navy Rose to wear such a thing to sleep. He gave Navy Rose a thumbs up and told her that she has a nice taste in clothes. Navy Rose was annoyed to hear this she told Ronan to answer her questions. Crawford told Ronan to answer Navy Rose questions he told Ronan that Navy Rose pajamas are not important. Of course, he was also surprised to see Navy Rose in such clothing. Crapo was happy that Ronan was not hurt. He asked Ronan about the disfigured body behind him. Ronan was surprised to hear this question. He did not know how to start explaining to Prava he told Crawford that he will give him a good explanation. Before telling Cravat anything, Ronan asked Krawitz to repeat after him Crapo was surprised to hear Ronan's request. He asked Ronan to tell him what he wants to say. With a look of anger in his eyes, Ronan told Cravat to call EUT an insane bastard. Crapo was shocked to hear this he did not understand why Ronan would want him to say something so odd Navy Rose was not shocked to hear this. She quickly realized that the current situation is related to Nebula Kegir. Kra did not know what to do. He decided to repeat after Ronan. This made the entire situation awkward for him and Navy Rose. The scene shifts and we see Ronan and Navy Rose in Krawitz's office. Ronan had just finished explaining the situation to Prava. Prava was surprised to hear that there was a spy among the grantee, a family. He realized that Nebula Clavier is a much more deadly organization than he expected. Crapo was surprised to see that Ronan was able to take care of Dolan. He thanked Ronan for his efforts. He told Ronan that they were able to prevent a great catastrophe. Thanks to him, Ronan began to laugh. When he heard this he 
asked Crawford to stop flattering him, Ronan decided to not tell anyone that he could see the unique manner which Dolan was exuding. He did not want to tell anyone about it because he was not completely certain about the nature of the unique manner. Also, Ronan knew that he would be in danger of Nebula Clavier ever learned that he has such a unique ability. More importantly, the people around him would also be put in danger. Crapo told Ronan that a large-scale investigation on the Grand SIA family will be carried out soon. He asked Ronan to not worry about Dolan and Nebula Clade here. Crapo realized that the Empire has been indebted to Ronan for a while ever since the incident in the Grand Cappadoki. Crapo told Ronan that he wants to reward him appropriately as a principal. He asked Ronan if there's anything he wants. Ronan became excited when he heard this question. He believed that this was a perfect opportunity for him to achieve one of his goals. He told Kaba that he has something that he wants to do at the academy. He asked Krata if you will give him his approval. Crapo was surprised to hear that Ronan wanted to do something that required his approval. He became curious about what Ronan wanted to do. The scene shifts and we see Ronan standing next to a bulletin at the academy's plaza. Ronan placed a paper on the board and called the attention of his fellow students. He asked the students if they are tired of doing limited club activities which are confined within the school. The other students were shocked to hear this. Ronan touched the paper he put on the bulletin board and told his fellow students that he made the club for them with a smile on his face. Ronan told them that the name of the club is the Special Class Adventure Club. According to the recruitment paper, which Ronan put on the board, Ronan wanted to recruit members to his club. Anyone is allowed to apply to the club, but a brief interview will be conducted. A student asked Ronan about the activities of the club. Before the students could say more, Ronan used his hand to block the student's mouth, with a smile on his face. Ronan told the other students that the Special Class Adventure Club is an extremely constructive club that seeks to develop talented individuals who will contribute to the empire. Their focus is to improve students through practical and external activities. According to Ronan, the Special Class Adventure Club is the only club that has the principal's approval for outdoor activities. The other students were shocked to hear this. They could not believe that their principal would actually allow them to have outdoor activities outside the school. Ronan told the students who want to join his club to meet him at the first arena of the Galleon Hall for the interviews. While thanking the students for listening to him, a girl in a hood noticed something in Ronan. While Ronan was smiling, deviously and shaking his fellow students, the girl continued to stare at Ronan. The girl seemed to have noticed something unique about Ronan other than his creepy smile. A few days later, we see Ronan at the Galleon Hall. Ronan did not understand what was going on. He did not understand why the students were not coming for his interview. He had expected everyone to rush it and after they saw his performance at the plaza, he was quite surprised to see that no student was constant with the interviews, other than Maria and Asel. Maria was surprised to see that Ronan was confused about why the students were avoiding him. She asked Ronan to try to remember the interviews he had conducted in the last few days. She reminded Ronan that he randomly beat up people under the pretense of a sport to test their skills. Also, Ronan was asking the students some suspicious questions. He asked the students if they were prepared to risk their lives for their missions. The other students were shocked to hear this they did not understand why they would risk their lives for a mere club. A cell told Ronan that rumors about his behavior have spread throughout the academy. The students began to say that they need 10 lives to join Ronan's club. Ronan was disappointed that the other students were so weak. He believed that he tested them exactly how they test soldiers in the military. Of course, Ronan did not really care about having a lot of students in his club. All he wanted were promising students immediately Ronan said this. We see a student struggling to stand up. Ronan asked the student if he feels refreshed now, that he is up. Ronan did not understand why the student wanted to spar with him. He already told the student to join their club. Ronan did not see a need to test the boy skills. The student who was breathing heavily turned out to be Ronan S.R. Brown. Ronan told Brown that he passed the test with a smile on his face. Brown thanked Ronan for allowing him into the club. Ronan told Brown that the club will be quite difficult. He asked Brown to rethink his decision. With a bright smile on his face, Brown told Ronan that he's okay with the club as long as he gets stronger. Upon hearing Brown's response, Ronan told the members of his club to return back to their dorms. He asked them to rest before their club activities fully commences. A cell asked Ronan about what he wants to do with his time. Ronan told the cell that there is still time for interviews. He told his cell that he wants to wait for some time. He told his cell that a promising student might decide to join them. At night, Ronan realized that no student was coming to his club. Ronan could not believe that no single student even tried to apply. He decided to give up. He told Odia Sean to assist him in packing up. He thanked her for helping him with his interviews. He knew that Ada Sean was busy with her work as a teaching assistant. And yet she still found time to assist him on a Sean asked Ronan to not worry about it. While packing up the chairs on a Sean told Ronan that she would have applied to the club if she was not busy with her assistant work. Ronan was surprised to hear this. While Ronan liked to audit Sean, he never planned on allowing her to join the club if she applied. Ronan felt bad because he did not know how to tell her such a thing. He realized that he still needs to make a decision about what Adi Sean told him in the past. He did not know how to tell Adi Sean to give up on her dreams of becoming a general especially after seeing how she was working towards the school. Ronan realized that he had to give her more time before he could tell her such a thing. While thinking about what to do, the mysterious girl appeared in front of Ronan she was
was happy to meet Ronan at the arena. She had expected Ronan to finish the interviews. Ronan was surprised to see the girl you did not know when she entered the arena. He could not feel her presence at all. With a smile on his face, Ronan asked the girl if she came to have an interview for their club. The girl was surprised to hear this. She asked Ronan if she can do something once she joins his club. Ronan did not understand what the girl meant. He asked her to speak up because he could not hear her clearly. The girl pulled down her hood and we see her unique face with her blood red eyes. She asked Ronan if she can touch something on him when she joins the club. Ronan was shocked to hear what the girl said. He did not understand what she meant when she said she wanted to touch it. Ronan assumed that the girl wanted to touch his body. With an embarrassing look on his face, Ronan told the girl to not do anything shameful. The girl told him that she does not want to do anything to him. She told Ronan that she wants to touch Sita. Ronan was relieved to hear this. He did not understand why the girl could not tell him that she wanted to touch Sita. He told the girl that Sita is always with him. He told the girl that she will be able to touch Sita if she joins the club. The girl was very happy to hear this. Ronan did not understand why the girl was happy. He believed that she was a very strange person. He was more surprised by the fact that he could not sense her presence until she got very close to him. Ronan was certain that the girl in front of him was not an ordinary student. He knew that the girl was much stronger than the average student. The girl asked Ronan about the requirements she needed to join his club. Ronan pointed to a magically engineered doll and asked the girl to demonstrate her techniques on it. He asked the girl for her name and grade. The girl told Ronan that she is a junior from the magic department. She told Ronan that her name is Ophelia tonight. Immediately she said this. She activated her magic. A bright light came out of her eyes and a red and dark aura surrounded her. Ronan and Adi Sean was shocked to see this they could not believe that the girl was using dark attribute magic. This is because this attribute is not common. Adi Sean could not believe that Ophelia was able to perfectly control dark mana because it is very difficult to handle. While Adi Sean was mesmerized by Ophelia his magic Ronan noticed something that was very shocking about Ophelia as mana. While the energy was quite faint, Ronan could still see it. He could see the blood red energy that was exuding from the center of Ophelia as mana. Ronan was surprised to see the blood red energy he quickly realized that he had seen such an energy before this man is similar to the one Sita possesses. Ophelia gathered her energy to her fingertips and activated a spell called Shadow Claw. Immediately she activated the spell her mana took the shape of a claw and attacked the magically engineered doll. The moment her magic touched the doll, it blew it up. Ronan and Adishan was shocked to witness Ophelia his powers. Ronan told Ophelia that there is no need for them to have a duel. When the dust from the explosion cleared up, Ronan and Adishan saw how Ophelia had destroyed the magically engineered doll with her magic. Ronan and Onishan was shocked to see this. Ronan told Ophelia that she passed the test. After telling Ophelia that she passed the test, Ronan wanted to ask her about her unique manner. Before Ronan could ask his question, Ophelia already knew what he wanted to say. With the use of telepathic magic, Ophelia asked Ronan if he saw the red blood energy. Ronan was shocked to hear Ophelia his voice in his head. He could not believe that she could also use telepathy. Ophelia put on her hood and told Ronan to not mention anything about it. She told Ronan that she does not want Adi Sean and other people to hear about it. She believed that things would become stressful and annoying if others found out. She asked Ronan to follow her outside. She told him that she also has some questions for him too. After leaving the arena, Ronan told Ophelia the things that she wanted to know about Sita. Ophelia was surprised to find out that Sita is a dream bird. Ophelia found it interesting that Sita was born contending the man that is in the area. Ronan told Ophelia that she is also interesting to him. Ronan believed that people like Ophelia had left the empire a long time ago. He could not believe that a vampire was standing before him. Ophelia told Ronan that not all vampires left the empire. She told Ronan that there is still a small number of vampires in the empire. Because vampires don't like stressful things, they decided not to reveal themselves to the people. Ronan was surprised to hear this. He realized that the reason Ophelia approached their high-profile club, despite not wanting to reveal herself is because of CDA's mana. Ophelia told Ronan that she felt seed his energy the moment she saw him at the plaza. She could not believe that Sita possessed the energy of blood magic, which is the innate magic of vampires. Ronan was not surprised to hear this. He had always been curious about CD's unique magic. It made sense to him that Sita was able to use the abilities of a vampire. He told Ophelia is that the first thing Sita did after he was born was absorbed blood. Ophelia was shocked to hear this. She could not believe that Sita actually used vampire magic the moment he was born. Ronan did not understand why Ophelia was surprised. Ophelia shouted and asked Ronan about the year which Sita was born. She believed that Sita had to be three or five years old. Ronan and Sita were surprised to see Ophelia as behavior. Ronan told Ophelia that Sita has only been born for two months. Ophelia could not believe what she was hearing. She could not believe that Sita had only been born for two months, and yet he was already exuding blood man of such high density. With a perverted look on her face, Ophelia realized that she might be able to achieve something with Sita. She asked Ronan if he could do her a favor. Ronan was surprised to hear this. He never expected Ophelia to ask him for any favors since they just met. Ophelia told Ronan that she only came to see Sita today, but her goals have now changed. She told Ronan that she will work really hard if he completes her request. She told Ronan that she cannot work
work for the club for now because she needs to carry out her research. Ronan was surprised to hear this he asked her about what she wants to use for research. The next day, Ronan and his new club members went to a place called The Nest. This place is the academy's club room area. The team went to check out their new building in the club room area. Ronan was surprised to see that the academy dedicated an entire building to a student's club. He could not believe that the academy would be so generous to him. Ronan turned around to look at Asel and Maria he realized that there was something different about them. When he looked closely, he noticed that they were carrying the weapons made for them by the Grand Cappadoki. Ronan was surprised to see that Maria changed her sword from a dual blade to a great sword. Maria told Ronan that a blacksmith called the Great Commander made a sword that would suit her strength properly. Acel told Ronan that she received a magical bracelet. The bracelet was made from the approaches of the magic city called Delphinium. With a smile on her face, Acel told Ronan that the bracelet has helped improve her mana control and her speed and power have increased by twofold. Ronan was quite happy to see the quality of weapons his friends received. Maria asked Ronan about why he wanted them to come to the clubroom armed Ronan told her that he will tell her inside. With a serious look on his face, Ronan told his club members that they are here to have an important conversation. After settling down Rowan and told his members that he established the club for only one reason. He told them that he wants to improve their individual latent abilities as fast as possible through real life experiences. Of course, the real reason was to prepare his club members for the day which he UT and his friends would invade the empire. The first place which Ronan wanted their group to visit was one of the mountain ranges which the empire had not discovered yet. The name of this mountain range is Valian Mountain. Maria and Asal were shocked to hear that they were going to a mountain. Brown was very happy with Ronan's choice. VT and Mountain is known for being quite unusual. Ronan believed that the mountain would be a good experience for them. He told his club members that he also has some personal business which he wants to settle at the mountain. He placed his hand on his sword and told Maria and Asel that there is a problem which he needs to resolve with them. Maria and his cell were shocked to hear this they did not remember ever offending Ronan. Maria asked him to tell her the problem. Ronan told her not to worry about it. He told the members of the club to step outside. With a smile on his face, Ronan told the club members that he wants to fight with them. The scene shifts and we see Ronan Maria and Asel in the hallway. Asel asked Ronan to explain himself. Asel and Maria were shocked to find out that the problem Ronan wanted to solve was the early course completion. With a smile on his face, Ronan told Maria and Asel that the problem is very serious. He told them that their next mission will take at least a week he reminded his cell. And Maria that they still have classes which will not allow them to travel easily. Ronan knew that it will be difficult for Mario and his cell to juggle their classes and missions at the same time. He told them that Krata will not allow them to stay in the club if it interferes with their classes. Asel and Maria realize that Ronan is right. With a smile on his face, Ronan told Maria and his cell that the only solution for them is to complete their courses early just like him. This will give them the freedom they want. Ronan took Maria into cell to his sparring hall which was on the second floor of their club room. After the group had armed themselves Rohan and told Maria into cell that he wants to check out their skills before he starts giving them private lessons. He told the two girls to face him together. He told them not to be afraid. He assured them that he will not unsheathe his sword. With an irritating look on his face, Ronan advised Maria and Asel to take the spar seriously. He told them that the spar will be boring if they take it too easy. He told them to keep themselves in check. Maria and Asel were shocked to see the look on Ronan's face. They did not know how to respond to Ronan's request. They told him that they will do their best. With a smile on her face, Maria told the cell that they should show Ronan their new technique. She told his cell that it will be best for them to show Ronan how strong they have become. A cell became excited when she heard this. She activated her magic and told Maria that she will do her best. Maria covered her sword and Orion got in position. She picked up her sword and used it to smash the ground. This created a lot of dust in the air. Ronan was surprised to see what Maria did. He told Maria that she has a lot of power. Although Ronan complimented Maria he did not understand why she hit her sword on the ground. When the dust in the air cleared up, Ronan saw Acel controlling the broken rocks with her magic. Acel told Maria that she is ready to fight. Immediately, she said this she attacked Ronan with the broken rocks. Ronan was very impressed to see this. He could not believe that Acel was already able to use such high-level telekinesis within a short period of time. Of course, Ronan easily dodged the rocks. He used his sword sheath to destroy the rocks. He commended his cell on her efforts. The moment Ronan destroyed the rocks, he felt a powerful energy above him. When Ronan looked up, he sees Maria coming towards him with a smile on her face. Maria told Ronan to not try to block her attack. She advised Ronan to dodge her sword. The moment Maria's sword got close to him, Ronan carefully dodged the attack by jumping. Ronan was surprised to see the destruction caused by Marja's sword. He realized that he would have been torn to pieces if he had not dodged the attack. Immediately her sword landed on the ground. Mario picked it up and used it to attack Ronan. Ronan carefully dodged the attack while he was in the air. He was surprised to see how Mario was able to push him back. The moment his legs touched the ground, Ronan attacked Mario with a terrifying force. Mario was surprised to feel the weight of Ronan's attack. She could not believe that he was able to quickly recover his balance. Ronan was surprised to see that Mario was able to take on his attack, while Mario was holding Ronan down. Ronan looks up and sees a cell coming closer to them with a huge rock which happens to be a 
piece of the stage by her side. Ronan was surprised to see this. He realized that Maria and Isel had already surpassed his expectations. The moment she launched her attack, Isel told Ronan to leave Mario alone. Ronan was able to dodge the smaller pieces of rocks. With a creepy smile on his face, Ronan unsheathed his sword. Upon seeing that Ronan unsheathed his sword, Isel attacked Ronan with her huge rock. Ronan took a stance and cut the huge rock into pieces. Due to the amount of rocks thrown and cut, the entire stage was covered in dust. The moment the dust cleared up, Ronan noticed that Isel had surrounded him with more rocks. Ronan was surprised to see this. He told his cell that she has gotten much better. Ronan was happy to see that Maria and Dessel were not slacking off. He told the two girls that they did well. Ronan told his cell that she completely surprised him. He congratulated her on her upgrade. A cell thanked Ronan for his compliment. She asked Ronan if their test is over. With a smile on his face, Ronan told her that it is he told the girls that their special training should be completed within two weeks. Maria and Dessel were relieved to hear this. With a horrifying look on his face, Ronan told the girls that special training will begin immediately. Maria and Dessel were shocked to hear this. Maria told Ronan that they just finished sparring. Ronan told them that it does not matter. You picked up his sword and began to chase them with it. With a horrifying look on his face, Ronan used his sword to chase and attack the girls Maria into Sal prayed for. Someone to save them from that day on a cell and Maria devoted themselves to special training. Even at the cost of sleeping less. Two weeks later, we see Ronan and Krop his office run in place to paper which contained all his teammates courses on Krawitz table. Krapo was surprised to hear that all Ronan's teammates had completed all their courses. With a smile on his face, Ronan told Krata that his teammates completed most of their courses. While Ronan was smiling, we see a Sal and Mario looking drained from their training. Brown did not understand why the two girls looked so stressed. Ronan told Krama that his teammates have not completed all their courses. He told Krapo that they have completed enough courses which can grant them a permit to leave school grounds. Krapo was surprised to hear this. With a smile on his face Crawford told Ronan that he will give him an outing pass. He wished Ronan luck on his adventures. The next day, the team went to Valian Mountains for their first club activity. The moment they arrived at the entrance of the mountain, Maria filled the ley line containing mana. Maria was shocked to see this she could not believe that the mana is already so pure even though they are at the entrance of the mountain brown commons. Mario on being able to sense man even though they just arrived, he asked Ronan about their next step. Ronan told him that they are still far from the center of the mountain. He told Brown that he will tell them what they came to do once they arrive at the center. Ronan told his teammates that there is something he wants to find in the mountain. The scene shifts and we are taken to a temple in the mountains. At the center of the temple we see an elf standing with the use of his ears. The elf was able to sense the movements of Ronan and his group. The elf was surprised to hear humans moving in the mountains. He decided to greet Ronan and his friends by himself. After walking for a while, Ronan and his friends arrived at the edge of a cliff. With a smile on his face, Ronan told his teammates that he has found what he is looking for. When Ronan looks down the cliff, he sees a swarm of orcs. Ronan was surprised to see the large amount of orcs in the area. Brown was surprised to see the lifestyle of the orcs. He never expected orcs to live in a village like setting. He was very impressed with their lifestyle. Ronan told Brown that the orcs usually live in the outskirts because the Empire is not able to secure that area. He told Brown that the amount of orcs in the area are still quite small, but this will change over time. Thanks to the strong breeding power of the orcs, they will eventually increase in numbers and take over the entire mountain range. After taking over the mountain, the orcs will begin to terrorize and destroy private property. Ronan told Brown that they need to take care of the orcs before they can increase their numbers. Ronan turned around and looked at his cell and Maria. He told the two girls that this will be their first real battle. Ronan told the girls that the mission is easy. A cell was not very happy to hear about their mission. She began to tremble. A cell already knew that something was odd when Ronan told them that he was looking for orcs. She never expected Ronan to ask them to fight the orcs. While shaking in fear, a cell told Ronan that the orcs are large number. She asked Ronan if it is smart for them to fight the orcs on their own. Ronan told the cell that orcs are the perfect opponent for them. Although Ronan said this with confidence, he knew that there was an important variable that could disrupt their entire mission. This variable is an ogre. Ogres are the dominant species of the mountain range. Ronan knew that his teammates were strong students, but he was certain that they do not possess enough power to defeat an ogre. Ronan knew that his teammates would lose their lives if they ever came across the leader of the ogres which is called the Twin Head Ogre. Even in Ronan's past life, Ronan struggled to defeat the Twin Head Ogre. Although Ronan was worried about his teammates, he was certain that it will be a long time before the ogres appear in the area. After thinking about the situation, Ronan asked his teammates to begin the operation. Before Ronan and his teammates could do anything, a man appeared behind them and told them to not do anything. The man commended Ronan on having a pure intention. This man turns out to be the mysterious elf who was in the temple. The elf called Ronan and his teammates young adventurers and told them that it is not a good time to fight the orcs. Ronan was shocked to hear the elf voice. He did not understand what was going on. It did not make sense to Ronan that he could not sense the presence of the elf until the elf spoke to them. Ronan became curious about the elf's identity. With a smile on his face, the elf told Ronan and his teammates to not be wary of him. He told them that he's a priest staying on the mountain. Ronan was surprised to hear this. The elf 
told Ronan and his friends that he is a priest who worships an old god which possesses the divine name Senio. The elf told Ronan and his friends that it will be better for them to move somewhere else for a proper conversation. While the elf was talking Ronan placed his hand on his sword and took a stance. The elf told them that their current location is not safe. Before the elf could say anything else, Ronan pulls out his sword and pointed it at the elf. The elf was shocked to see this he did not understand what was going on. Asel and Maria were confused with Ronan's actions. Maria asked Ronan about what he is doing. Ronan apologized to the owl for his actions with a deadly look in his eyes. Ronan told the elf that he has met a lot of lunatics in the past few days. He asked the elf to repeat after him. The elf did not understand what was going on. He did not understand why Ronan was acting so weird. With a serious look on his face, Ronan asked the elf to call out he ut a bastard. Ronan told the elf to say this because he knew that no member of Nebula Clavier would ever insult Aki ut. Unfortunately for Ronan the elf did not understand what he was talking about. This made the situation awkward for Ronan. The elf had no choice but to repeat what Ronan said. After clearing the misunderstanding between themselves, the elf began to guide Ronan and his teammates to his temple on their way to the temple. The elf told Ronan that he is embarrassed for saying such a vile word. He told Ronan that he does not usually say such things because he is a priest. With an awkward look on his face, the elf told Ronan that this was the most embarrassing moment he has had in the last 200 years. Ronan told the elf that he needed to clarify something important. Immediately Ronan said this. He realized that the elf said that this was the most embarrassing moment he has had in the last 200 years. Ronan asked the owl for his age. The elf told Ronan that he does not remember his age. He told Ronan that he stopped counting a long time ago. He told Ronan that he is around 1,000 years old. Ronan and his friends were shocked to hear this. Ronan realized that the elf has been alive even before the empire was founded. Ronan had heard that elves had long lifespans, but he never expected it to be so long. Ronan did not understand what was going on. He had never heard something so bizarre. After calming down Rowan and asked the alphabet why he told them not to fight the orcs, the elf told Ronan that there is something strange about the behaviors of monsters that are around the mountain. He told Ronan that there is an abnormal phenomenon where orcs who are not nocturnal would wander through the mountains every night. Ogres that rarely leave their territory are being discovered on the outskirts of mountain ranges due to the fact that the root of this problem had not been discovered. The elf believed that it will be safer for Ronan and his friends to not fight the orcs. After sharing his intentions, the elf stretched his hand out and used manner to touch the air. The moment he did this, a barrier unveiled itself. He placed his hand on the barrier and it began to disappear. Ronan and his friends were surprised to see the large barrier disappearing. After the barrier got released, the elf welcomed Ronan and his friends to see Neil's temple. Brown was surprised to see such an elaborate structure in the middle of nowhere. Brown was surprised that the elf was able to use barrier magic that could cover an entire temple. A cell told Brown that barrier magic of this level is insane. She told Brown that the elf is much more powerful than the instructors of the academy. A cell asked Ronan if he knew about the existence of the temple Ronan and told her that. He is also as surprised as her Ronan was certain that no ordinary elf can be this powerful. He became more curious about the elf's identity. With a smile on his face, the Belfast Ronan and his friends to step into the temple. When Ronan and his teammates arrived at the center of the temple, they saw the god which the elf was worshipping. Ronan was surprised to see that Senio was an ugly rock. The elf told Ronan that the rock has its own meaning. He told the team that they will get tired when they hear about the story behind the rock. The elf told Ronan and his team to get an empty room in the temple. He asked them to put their luggages down and have some rest. He told them to talk to him if they need anything. Maria had an idea the moment she heard this. She tapped Ronan and told him to ask the elf about what he is looking for. Ronan told the elf that he is looking for the curse eyes habitat. The elf was surprised to hear this. He asked Ronan about why he is looking for the habitat of such a monster. He asked Ronan if he is looking for the curse eye because of the curse cast upon him. Ronan was horrified to hear this he did not know how the elf was able to find out about his secret. He asked the elf about how he was able to know his secret. The priest was able to confirm his suspicion about Ronan thanks to Ronan's behavior. He told Ronan that he has been curious about his curse because of the strange and dangerous echo around him. With a serious look on his face, the priest asked Ronan to give him some of his time. He told Ronan that he wants to have a conversation with him. The scene shifts and we see Ronan in the elephant a garden. While preparing some tea for Ronan the elf tells Ronan that he already knew that Ronan was not an ordinary student from the moment he met him. Ronan was surprised to hear this he did not know how to react. He could only smile awkwardly. Ronan did not understand what was going on. He did not know when he got swept in the flow of the priest. He quickly placed his hand on his sword in order to not forget his suspicion. Ronan did not know what to do about his situation. You wondered if he was being too sensitive about the priest. He was not completely convinced that the priest was not part of Nebula Clavier. He was certain that the priest was not exuding the same mana as Dolan and the priests did not have any reactions when he mentioned he ut. Upon seeing that Ronan was lost in his thoughts, the priest asked Ronan to drink the tea. He told Ronan that the tea will help him. Ronan carefully looked into the cup containing the tea. He was not certain if the priest had poisoned the tea. While thinking of what to do, Ronan gets a sense of the tea. Ronan had never smelled something so unique. He wanted to ask the priest about it. When he looked up, he saw something that shocked him. Ronan saw the priest
priest exuding a unique flow of mana. Ronan had never seen such a vivid flow of mana. He did not understand what was going on. With a smile on his face, the priest asked Ronan if he likes the sin of the tea. Ronan did not know how to respond to the priest question. He did not understand what was going on. He did not know what he was looking at. He could not believe that mana could be so vivid and clear. The priest told Ronan that the tea allows one to see mana with a brand new set of eyes. Ronan was shocked to hear this. He asked the priest about what he put in the tea with a smile on his face. The priest told Ronan that the tea is brewed from a medicinal herb that rarely grows in the mountains. The tea rejuvenates the senses by releasing the suppressed energy in one's body. The priest was surprised to see that the tea had taken its effect on Ronan. He told Ronan that most people do not feel the effect of the tea immediately. He told Ronan that the tea must have taken an effect because his energy was being blocked by his curse. Thanks to the reaction Ronan had, the priest realized that Ronan must be seeing a large amount of mana. The priest told Ronan that he will pack the ingredients of the tea for him. He asked Ronan to regularly drink the tea. He begged Ronan to not use the curse die to remove his curse. Ronan was shocked to hear this. He did not understand what the priest was talking about. With a serious look on his face, the priest told Ronan that the cursed eye removes curses and takes away some of the user's life force. Using the cursed eye once or twice is not a problem, but if one continues to use it repeatedly, their life will be at risk. Ronan was shocked to hear this. He realized that the cursed eye had also drained Edwin's life force while he was being tortured. He could not believe that the curse was so dangerous due to the look on Ronan's face. The priest asked Ronan if he did not know the effects of the curse eye. Ronan told the priests that he was not aware of the curse eye's side effects. He told the priests that he simply wanted to remove his curse. The priest was surprised to hear this but he understood the reason why Ronan was worried. He told Ronan that he needs to be extra careful. He told Ronan that the consequences for a wrong action can be quite severe. Ronan was surprised to hear this. He knew that the priest was right. He looked down at his cup of tea and remembered that someone else also warned him about his curse. This person was Professor Secret. Ronan remembered that Professor Secret told him that his curse is difficult for her to undo. She told Ronan that she needs to thoroughly prepare before she can undo his curse. Ronan did not understand why he was in such a rush to remove his curse, even though Professor Secret was helping him. After thinking about it, he realized that he became impatient because he met the overwhelming shadow of his father. Ronan let go of his sword. He realized that his life could come to an end any time if he is not careful. He realized that he could die before he gets a chance to fight IUD. After calming himself, Ronan became more curious about the priest's identity. While staring at the smiling priest Ronan tried to recollect the priest's face, he was certain that he had never met anyone like the priest in his past life. Although Ronan had never met the priest before he felt like he knew the priest, Ronan admitted to the priests that he wanted to remove his curse quickly. He told the priests that he wanted to remove his curse because of the crazy fanatics who are acting outrageous. The priest was surprised to hear this Ronan told him that the fanatics are very dark and nasty people. He told the priests that the fanatics are lying in wait for the arrival of the stars. The priest was shocked to hear this. He immediately knew that the fanatics that Ronan was referring to as Nebula Cladier he could not believe that Nebula Clavier was active again. At night, we see the priest standing next to the statue of Sunil. The priest pondered about the fanatics Ronan mentioned. He realized that Nebula Cladier was planning an evil scheme. This scheme will come in form of a huge disaster that will take the lives of many innocent people. The priests did not know what to do. He wondered if he was just going to watch again as such a thing happens to innocent people. He looked up at the statue of Sunil and asked it if Ronan is the answer Sunil chose. He asked the statue about what he needs to do. While the priest was trying to communicate with his god, someone steps into his temple. The person calls the priest's name, which was Zaranti and asked him about why he is up. When the priest turned around, he was surprised to see that it was Ronan that was speaking to him. Sorry. And he asked Ronan about what he is doing at the center of the temple at night. He asked Ronan if his bed was uncomfortable. Ronan told Sarani that he simply stepped out of his room to get some water. Ronan looked up and told Saranti that the statue of his god is interesting. He told Sandy that he never expected a rock to be a divine statue. He asked Sarani if the rock has a hidden meaning behind it. With a smile on his face, Sarani told Ronan that once every millennium, his church moves 1,000 rocks to a sacred land in Tukunjur, which is at the far corner of the imperial territory. Tukunjur is a place where strong typhoons always blow. Most of the rocks there last less than 200 years before withering away and disappearing. Although most rocks get destroyed, there are certain rocks that have withstood the trial for 1,000 years and proven that there will transcend time. The noble soul engraved in such rocks becomes the divine statue of Sunil, with a confident look on his face. Sarani told Ronan that he remembers the day which he and his brothers moved the divine right back into the temple. Ronan was surprised to hear this. He realized that Sarantai is very old. He did not know how to react. Ronan found out that there was a lot of priests in the temple. He asked Sarani about what happened to the other priest. Sarani told Ronan that most of them left because of individual circumstances. He told Ronan that it is not easy to worship a god. He told Ronan that his brothers could not dedicate their lives to a god who never answers no matter how long they wait. He told Ronan that he also wanted to give up on his faith a lot of times, and there were times when he wanted to be free. However, every single time he tries to leave, he gets a hunch, and that hunch made him continue his service as a priest. Sarani 
Tony told Ronan that he has a feeling that Seals will which is contained in the Divine Rock will become a catalyst that will one day save the world. Ronan was shocked to hear this, with a smile on his face. Sarani told Ronan that his duty feels like a destiny that he cannot pass on to anyone. The moment Sarani said this, Ronan saw an image of the older Adi Shan next to him. Ronan realized that only Adi Shan would say something like this. Sarani placed his hand on Ronan's shoulder and told him that the time which Senio will save the world is drawing closer. The next day, Ronan put Sarane's incomprehensible words out of his head. He and his teammates began to reorganize themselves. Sarani gave Ronan's teammates his specialty. The tea took its effect on them quickly. Maria and his cell were surprised to see the effects of the tea, with the high level of energy available in the mountain. Ronan's teammates enhanced their senses. While his teammates were practicing, Ronan moved around the mountain range with Sarantai in order to forage for some medicinal herbs. While they were moving around Ronan and tried to understand Sarani, it did not make sense to him that Saranti would help people he is just meeting for the first time and even show genuine concern for them. The more Ronan looked at Sarantai, the more he thought that he was a strange elf. After picking up some herbs Ronan and Sarantai returned to the temple. Ronan and his teammates spent two peaceful days in Surroundings Temple. Unfortunately, no matter how peaceful everywhere is, tragedy always creeps through the cracks, and leaving ineradicable pain on everyone. This pain will be irreversible. Back in the present, Ronan and his teammates are prepared to subjugate the orc village Sarani believed that it will be dangerous for them to go against the orc. He asked Ronan and his teammates if they will be all right. He reminded them that they have not discovered the cause of the monster's strange behaviors. With a worried look on his face, he told Ronan and his friends to stay in his temple and prepare carefully with a smile on his face. Ronan told Sandy to not worry about them. He told Sandy that he and his teammates are going to be fine. He told Sarantai that only the monster's behaviors changed. The monsters did not get stronger. Ronan told him that his teammates can take care of themselves. Maria and Brown told Sarani that they can. A cell was still scared of the orcs. Ronan told Sarani that they need to finish their mission because their time limit for going outside is coming to an end and they need to return to the academy. Upon hearing this Sarantai accepted Ronan's logic. Sarani activated his magic and told Ronan and his teammates that he will cast a spell that allows them to enter the barrier. He told them that they can return to the temple anytime they want. Ronan and his friends were surprised to hear this, with a serious look on his face. Sarantai told Ronan and his friends that they should return to the temple if they ever encounter anything dangerous. He advised them to never let their guards down under any circumstances. He told Ronan and his friends that the forest is a very dark and dangerous place. The scene shifts and we see the dead bodies of the orcs. This bodies have been brutally torn apart. An ELF woman who seems to have killed the orcs wonders why her target is so hard to find. This woman is dressed like Edwin and Cirilla. The woman realized that she could not dry out her target with the orcs. With a creepy smile on her face, the elf says that she will meet Sarantai by herself. Immediately the woman says this. We see the twin head ogre kneeling next to her. The scene shifts and we see Ronan and his teammates arrive at the orc camp. Ronan was surprised to see that the orcs were wearing human clothes. The orcs also had accessories and jewelries that belonged to humans. Ronan realized that the orcs had already robbed the nearest village to them. Ronan never expected the orcs to already raid a village. He turned around and asked his teammates if they were ready to fight. Maria Asel and Brown looked at Ronan with confidence in their eyes. With a serious look on his face, Ronan told his teammates that they will have to destroy all the orcs. At the orc camp, we see two orcs discussing in their language. The two orcs were admiring their stolen accessories. The orc wearing a jacket tells its fellow orc that his necklace looks good. The orc was happy to hear this. He told his friend that the necklace used to belong to a little kid that lived in the village which they raided. With a disgusting smile on his face, the orc told his friend that the child cried and struggled before it died. He told his friend that the child was very annoying. While the two orcs were talking, Acel used his telekinesis to safely drop Maria and Brown in the middle of the orcs. The orcs did not understand what was going on. They were surprised to see a human in their habitat. The moment Maria and Brown landed in New York habitat, they released a large amount of aura and began to attack the orcs, with their bodies brimming with strength. Maria and Brown easily tore apart the orcs that surrounded them. The other orcs were shocked to see this. They became enraged when they saw human killing their kind. They picked up their weapons and rushed to attack Maria and Brown. While the orcs were rushing to fight Maria and Brown, one of the orcs get his head crushed with a stone. The orc standing next to the crushed orc did not understand what was going on. It did not understand how its comrade was killed with a rock. He called out to its comrade but no one answered. While the orc was standing, it also gets its head crushed by a rock. This rocks were controlled by a cell with her telekinesis. Ronan commends a cell on having such an amazing accuracy and control of her powers. While holding Ronan and herself on the air, the cell also controlled several rocks. While they were in the air, Ronan asked a cell if she can fully control her ability. A cell told Ronan that she can. While Ronan was talking to Assel, the orc stood in fear due to the large amount of rocks that were floating in the sky. With a creepy look on his face, Ronan told a cell to wipe out the orcs with her rocks. A cell was not very happy with this idea. Although a cell was not very thrilled with the idea, she had no choice but to follow Ronan's order. She waved her hand and launched the rocks at the orcs. The orcs were horrified to see the rocks coming towards them. They began to
to run for their lives. After the fight ended, we see Ronan and his teammates walking around New York Village. As the dust in the area cleared up, a cell became frightened. A cell saw tons of dead orcs which she killed with her magic. She told Ronan that she will definitely be punished for what she has done. Ronan grabs a cell by the neck and tells her to not worry about it. He told her that she cannot get punished for something like this. He told her that he will join her in receiving the punishment if she is ever punished. Brown told the cell that he will also join her in taking the punishment. With a bright smile on his face, Brown told the cell that she will definitely receive the biggest punishment if they're ever punished. A cell was not happy to hear this. She began to cry. Maria could not believe that Brown actually said such a thing. She told Brown that he was not helpful at all. Brown did not understand what Mario was talking about. He thought his words would cheer yourself up. Ronan smiled when he saw how his teammates bickered. He was very happy to see that his teammates were able to show off their skills in actual combat. He believed that their trip to the mountains has been very helpful to his teammates. Ronan was certain that his teammates will be able to face more dangerous opponents the next time they come to the mountains. While Ronan was thinking, Sita placed his hand on his face. Ronan was surprised to see this he asked Sita about what was wrong. Ronan noticed that Sita was pointing him towards a particular direction. He asked Sita if there is anything there. When Ronan and Acel walked into the forest, they saw a person tied to a tree. When they carefully looked at the person, they noticed that the person was an elf. Ronan and Acel were surprised to see how wounded the elf was. Ronan and Acel quickly rushed to help the elf. Ronan wondered if the orcs tie the elf up as an emergency food. While removing the rope from the elf's body, Ronan asked Sita to use healing magic on the elf. When Sita activated his magic, the elf slowly began to regain consciousness. Acel told Ronan that the elf is waking up when Ronan heard this. He asked the elf if she could talk. The moment the elf fully regained consciousness, she was shocked to see Ronan and his friends. She immediately recognized the unique manner that surrounded Ronan and his friends. She wanted to ask Ronan and his friends about the mana. Unfortunately for her, her body was in a terrible state. She spat out some blood before she could say anything. Ronan was shocked to see this. He realized that Cedar's magic was not able to heal the elf. Ronan did not understand what was going on. Sita's magic had always worked on everyone. After regaining some of her strength, the elf asked Ronan if he and his friends are coming from the temple. Ronan was surprised to hear this question. He did not understand how the elf was able to know about their movement. The elf placed her hand on Ronan's shoulder, with fear in her eyes. She begs Ronan to take her to Eseranti. She tells him that some people are coming for Eseranti. She told Ronan that Surety's life will be in danger if they are too late. Immediately she said this. She lost consciousness. Ronan and his friends were shocked to hear what the elf said. They did not know what to do. The scene shifts and we see Eseranti at the center of the temple. Eseranti was cleaning the statue of his god. While Eseranti was cleaning someone steps into the temple. This person turns out to be Ronan while carrying the elf Ronan called out Eseranti. Eseranti was surprised to see Ronan in the temple. He asked Ronan about why he is back so soon. He asked Ronan if he had an accident. Ronan was happy to see Sarani in the temple. He asked Eseranti to take a look at the elf. He told Eseranti that the elf was a captive who was held in the orc village. He told Eseranti that he and his friends saved the elf after they destroyed the orc village. Ronan revealed to Eseranti that the elf wanted to meet him. Eseranti did not understand what Ronan was talking about. When he carefully looked at the elf, he immediately recognized her. Saranti was surprised to see the state which the elf was in Sarthi called the elf's name, which is Brigitta. Sarthi reached his hand out to Brigitta. He could not believe that Brigitta could be in such a terrible state. He wondered about what happened to her. The scene shifts and we see Maria and the other members of the team at the orc village. Maria told Brown that she and his cell have looked around the area and they did not see anyone. Brown told her that he has also checked around to he told her that he did not see anyone Moria. A cell and Brown looked around the village because Ronan ordered them to Brown was happy to see that Brigitta was the only captive in the village. Maria told Brown that it is better for them to head to the temple. Mario was about to ask a cell to follow them when she noticed that a cell was looking at the dead orcs. Mario walked up to a cell. She asked his cell about what she is so focused on. She asked a cell if something is wrong. A cell told Maria that the bodies of the orcs are a bit strange. She told Maria that something has appeared on the bodies of the orcs. Mario was surprised to see this. She did not recognize this thing. She asked a cell if she knows about the mark. A cell told her that she does not recognize the mark. She told Maria that she is just seeing it for the first time. She told Maria that the marks were hidden with double magic. A cell became curious about the nature of the magic circle which appeared on the heads of the orcs. She wanted to know what the circles were for. The scene shifts and we see Ronan and Saranti in a room. Saranti laid Bridgie on a bed. Saranti told Ronan that he is done with the first aid. He told Ronan to no longer worry about Briga. Ronan asked Saranti if he is feeling well. He told Saranti that healing magic did not work on Briglia. Ronan wondered if San might have accidentally got poisoned by a strange poison while he was treating Brigitta with a smile on his face. Sarani told Ronan to not worry about him. He told Ronan that he will be fine. He told Ronan that he already gave Brigitta the antidote to the poison. Saranti told Ronan that he is greatly indebted to him. He told Ronan that Brigitta is a precious sister of his. Ronan was surprised to hear this. Saranti told Ronan that Brigitta is one of the few believers of Senio who is still alive.
alive. Saranti revealed to Ronan that Brigitta was once a faithful believer whose faith was much deeper than others. Saranti told Ronan that he does not know how to repay his debt to him. He told Ronan that saving Brigitta is truly an amazing thing. Ronan became shy when he heard this. He told Saranti did not do anything grant. He told Saranti not worry about it. Upon realizing how dire the situation was, Ronan asked Saranti tell him about the people which Brigitta was talking about. Ronan knew that this people must be very dangerous for Brigitta to be so scared. He asked Saranti if his life is in danger. Saranti's face became grim when he heard this. The scene shifts and we see Ronan and Saranti at the center of the temple, with a serious look on his face. Sarani told Ronan that he does not know the goal of the people which Brigitte is talking about. He told Ronan that the mysterious people belong to a religious group that worships an unknown being as their god. This religious group has been committing evil acts without revealing their identity to the world. Saranti told Ronan that the religious group's name is the Church of Nebula Clavier. Ronan was shocked to hear this he could not believe that Saranti knew about Nebula Clavier. Ronan could not believe that Saranti was being targeted by Nebula Clavier due to Ronan's reaction. Saranti realized that Ronan had heard of Nebula Clavier. Saranti told Ronan that Nebula Clavier has sent different people to him over the years. With a smile on his face, Saranti told Ronan that he thought Nebula Clavier had given up on him. He told Ronan that they stopped sending people to him in the past 100 years due to the Saranti assumed that Nebula Clavier gave up on him. Saranti was surprised to hear that the organization wanted to get him again. Ronan was annoyed to hear this. He told Saranti that the issue was a life or death problem. He told Sari. Annie to take the problem seriously. He told Sari. Annie need to move to an institution with better security. Saranti immediately refused Ronan's idea. He told Ronan that he cannot abandon the temple. He told Ronan that the souls of his brothers and sisters are in the temple. Saranti told Ronan that he cannot move to another location because of the people who reside in the temple. He told Ronan that he does not want the resident to be in harm's way. Saranti placed his hands on Rohan in shoulder. He told Ronan to leave the forest with his teammates. With a smile on his face, Saranti told Ronan that he does not want his friends to get swept into unnecessary danger. He begged Ronan to be understanding. Ronan did not know what to do. He could tell that Saranti was being honest by the look in his eyes. The scene shifts and we see Ronan and Saranti at the entrance of the temple. Ronan told Saranti to wait for him. He told Saranti that he will bring the strongest woman that he knows. He warns Saranti to keep himself hidden. He asks Saranti to not do anything reckless until he returns. Saranti smiled. When he heard this, he told Ronan to not worry about him. He told Ronan that he will keep himself hidden. Saranti clenched his fist and placed something in Ronan's hand. He told Ronan to take this thing as payment for saving Briglia. Ronan was surprised to see the object that Saranti gave him. Ronan did not understand why Saranti gave him a ring. Saranti told Ronan that the ring is an item used as a pass in the Magic Tower. He told Ronan to show the ring to the librarian of the Magic Tower of Dawn. He told Ronan that the Magic Tower will be of great help to him. He told Ronan that he will find information about his curse in the tower. Saranti asked Ronan to be careful when he is going down the mountain. With a bright smile on his face, Saranti told Ronan that the time he spent with him and his friends was a gift to him. Ronan was shocked to hear this. He did not know what to say. With a nervous look on his face, Ronan told Sarani to not say such gloomy things. He told Saranti that they will still see each other later. He told Saranti to take care of himself. He told him that he will be back soon. Immediately, Ronan said this he left. After Ronan left, Sarani became relieved. He looked behind him and asked his older sister if she is glad to see him after a long time. Saranti turned around and called his older sister the assassin of Nebula Clavier. Immediately Saranti said this. We see Brigitte trans forming. Brigitte turns out to be the elf woman who was searching for Saranti. And she is also Serenity's sister. Brigitte asks her any about why he brought up the past relationship. With a dark smile on her face, Brigitte asks Saranti if he has been living a comfortable life. Saranti could not believe that Nebula. Clagis has sent his sister to kill him. He told Brigitte that her church is cruel. Brigitte believed that Saranti was an hypocrite for saying this. She reminded him that he used a paralyzing poison on her and called it an antidote. With a serious look on his face, Saranti told Brigitte that there is nothing he won't do to survive. He told Brigitte that he had a better method than her clumsy acting. He told Brigitte that no normal person would believe that Lemma Hyam's shadow was captured by Orc. Brigitte smiled when she heard this. She told Saranti she had no choice but to act helpless. She told Saranti that it was hard to find out his location. Brigitte revealed to Saranti she tried to get his attention with the monsters, but Saranti did not fall for the bait. While thinking of what to do, Brigitte saw a clue to finding Saranti. This clue was Ronan and his friends. Brigitte told Saranti that Ronan and his teammates were exuding so much of his energy. She told Saranti that she wanted to lure him out by cutting Ronan and his friends and scattering their remains across the forest. With a smile on her face, Brigitte told Saranti that she did not do anything to Ronan and his friends because of their past relationship as believers. She asked Saranti
Saranti if he is touched by her goodwill. With a serious look on his face, Saranti told Brigitta that he would have never let her do anything to Ronan and his friends. Brigitta laughed when she heard this. She told Sarani that she was simply joking. She told Saranti to stop being so serious. After seeing that Sari, it was not joking around Brigitta decided to stop playing. She told Saranti that she wants to deliver her church's command to him. Brigitta told Saranti that the church ordered her to persuade him. She placed her hand on her sword, and Sarani activated as magic. She told Sarani that she has to kill him if he refuses to join them. Immediately, she said this she and Saranti attacked each other. The moment Saranti and Brigitta began their fight, the trees in the forest began to shake. The scene shifts and we see Ronan in the forest. Ronan stopped moving when he heard the sound of Saranti and Brigitta fighting. Ronan did not know what caused the noise. Ronan had a terrible feeling that something was wrong. While Ronan was thinking Isel and the rest of the group run to him, Ronan was surprised to see his teammates. He told them that they met him at the perfect time. He asked them if they had thoroughly looked around the orc village. Maria told Ronan that they looked everywhere. She told Ronan that they did not find any captives. She told Ronan that Asel found something fishy. Ronan was surprised to hear this. Asel who was struggling to catch her breath told Ronan that she discovered something strange on the orcs shortly after he left. She told Ronan that she had never seen any magic circles like that before. Ronan did not understand what Asel was talking about. He asked his cell to explain more. Before Asel could say anything, a large explosion occurred behind Ronan. Ronan and his friends were shocked to see the explosion. Asel wondered if the explosion came from the temple. With a grim look on his face, Ronan realized that Saranti was in danger. Before Ronan and his friends could take a step, the ground began to shake. Ronan was horrified to see this. He realized that only one thing could cause such a vibration. When Ronan turned around, he was surprised to see the twin head ogre coming out of the forest. The twin head ogre easily tore apart the orcs that stood in its path. Ronan and his friends stood in fear when they saw the twin head ogre. The ogre screamed and terrified the group with its voice. 